This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Fiasco, written by Stanislav Lem, and narrated by Oliver Wyman. Chapter One, Burnham Wood. Nice landing. The man who said this was no longer looking at the pilot in the spacesuit with the helmet under his arm. In the circular control room, horseshoe console in the middle, he went to the wall of glass and looked out at the ship, a large, even though distant, cylinder charred around its jets. A blackish fluid still spilled from the jets onto the concrete. The second controller, big in the shoulders, a beret tied on his bald skull, put the tapes on rewind, and, like an unblinking bird, regarded the newcomer out of the corner of his eye. He wore headphones, and in front of him was a bank of flickering monitors. We managed, said the pilot. Pretending that he needed support to remove his heavy, double-buckled gloves, he leaned slightly against the jutting edge of the console. After that landing, he was wobbly in the knees. What was it? The smaller one, by the glass in a worn leather jacket with a mousy, unshaven face, clapped his pockets until he found his cigarettes. Deflection in the thrust, murmured the pilot, a little surprised by the coolness of the welcome. The man by the glass, a cigarette already in his mouth, inhaled and asked through the smoke, Why? You don't know? No, the pilot wanted to reply, but he remained silent, because it seemed to him that he ought to have known. The tape ended. It fluttered on the reel. The larger man got up, took off the headphones, only now nodded to him, and said hoarsely, I'm London, and that's Goss. Welcome to Titan. What would you like to drink? We have coffee and whiskey. The young pilot was flustered. He knew the names of these men, but had not met them before. He had assumed, for no reason, that the larger would be the chief, Goss, but it was the other way around. Getting this straight in his head, he chose coffee. What's the cargo? Carborundum bits? asked London when all three of them were seated at the little table that came out of the wall. The steaming coffee was in glasses that resembled laboratory beakers. Goss took a yellow pill with his coffee, sighed, coughed, and blew his nose until tears came to his eyes. And you brought radiators too, right? he asked the pilot. The pilot, again surprised, expecting greater interest in his feet, only nodded. It was not every day that an engine stalled in the middle of a landing. He was full of words not about freight, but about how, instead of attempting to blow out the jets or increase the main power, he had immediately cut the auto and went down on only the boosters, a trick that he had never tried outside the simulator. And that had been ages ago. So he had to collect his thoughts again. I brought radiators, too, he said finally, and was even pleased at how it sounded, the laconic type emerging from danger. But not to the right place, smiled the smaller man, Goss. The pilot didn't know whether or not this was a joke. What do you mean? You received me? You called me? He corrected himself. We had to. I don't understand. You were supposed to land at Grail. Then why did you pull me off course? He felt hot. The call had sounded imperative. True, while losing speed, he had caught a radio announcement from Grail about some accident, but couldn't make out much through all the static. He had been flying to Titan via Saturn, using the planet's gravity to decelerate and thus save fuel, so his ship had brushed the giant's magnetosphere until there was crackling on all the wavelengths. Immediately afterward, he received the call from this spaceport. A navigator had to do what flight control said, and here, before he was out of his suit, they were cross-examining him. 
Mentally, he was still at the helm, with the straps digging into his shoulders and chest as the rocket hit the concrete with its arms spread. The boosters, still firing and rumbling, made the whole hull shudder. Where was I supposed to put down? Your cargo belongs to Grail, explained the smaller man, wiping his red nose. He had a cold. But we intercepted you above orbit and called you here because we need Killian, your passenger. Killian? the young pilot said with surprise. He's not on board. Besides me, there's only Cinco, the co-pilot. The others were dumbfounded. Where is Killian? By now in Montreal. His wife is having a baby. He left before me on a shuttle, before I took off. From Mars? Of course, from where else? What's all this about? The mess that obtains in space equals that on Earth, remarked London. He stuffed tobacco in his pipe as if he wanted to break it. He was angry. The pilot, too. You should have asked. We were positive he was with you. That's what the last radiogram said. Goss blew his nose again and sighed. You can't take off now in any case, he said finally. And Marlin couldn't wait to get the radiators. Now he'll put all the blame on me. But they're there, the pilot indicated with his head. In the mist stood the dark, slender spindle of his ship. Six of them, I think, and two in gigajoules. They'll disperse any mist or cloud. I can't very well put them on my back and carry them to Marlin, returned Goss, in worse and worse humor. The carelessness, the irresponsibility of the subordinate spaceport, which, as its chief admitted, had intercepted him after three weeks of flight without verifying that he had the passenger they expected, shocked the pilot. He did not say to them that the cargo was their problem now. Until the damage was repaired, he could do nothing, even if he wanted to. He kept silent. You'll stay with us, of course. With these words, London finished his coffee and rose from the aluminum chair. He was huge, like a heavyweight wrestler. He went over to the glass wall. The Titan landscape, a lifeless fury of mountains of unearthly color in the rusty dimness, with clouds of bronze thick at their peaks, made a perfect background for his figure. The floor of the tower vibrated slightly. An old transformer, thought the pilot. He also got up to look at his ship. Like an ocean lighthouse, it stood vertically out of the low, rushing mist. A gust blew away the wisps, but the marks of overheating on the jets were no longer visible, perhaps because of the distance and the half-light, or else they had simply cooled. You have gamma defect scopes here? The ship mattered more to him than their trouble. They had brought the trouble on themselves. We do, but I won't permit anyone to approach the rocket in an ordinary suit, replied Goss. You think it's the pile? The pilot blurted. You don't? The small chief got up and walked over. From the floor registers along the convex glass came a pleasant warmth. The temperature did jump above normal during the descent, but the Geigers were quiet. It was probably only a jet. A ceramic might have been flushed from the combustion chamber. I had the feeling that I was losing something. A ceramic, fine, but there was a leak, Goss said firmly. Ceramics don't melt. That puddle? The pilot was surprised. They stood at the double glass. Indeed, beneath the bottom fins lay a black puddle. Mist, wind-driven, intermittently swept the hull of the ship. What do you have in the pile? Heavy water or sodium? asked London. He was a head taller than the pilot. Squeaking sounds came from the radio. Goss hurried over, put on a headset, and spoke quietly with someone. It can't be from the pile, the pilot said, at a loss. I have heavy water. The solution is pure, crystal clear. But that is black as tar. Well, then, the refrigerant and the jets bled out, agreed London, which cracked the ceramic. It was as if he were talking about fuses, 
He was not in the least bothered by the accident that had stuck the pilot and his ship in this hole. Yes, said the young man. The greatest pressure is in the funnels when breaking. If the ceramic cracks in one place, the main thrust will clean out the rest. Everything was flushed from the starboard jet. London said nothing. The pilot added hesitantly, I might have landed a little too close. Nonsense. It was good that you even landed straight. The pilot waited for more words bordering on praise, but London turned to him and looked him over, from the tousled fair hair to the white boots of the suit. Tomorrow I'll send a technician with a defect scope. Did you put the pile in neutral? He added suddenly. No, I shut the whole thing off, as if docking. Good. The pilot saw by now that no one was interested in the details of his struggle with the rocket right above the port. Coffee was fine, but shouldn't his hosts, who had imposed so much on him, provide a room and a bath? He longed for a hot shower. Goss kept whispering into the microphone. London stood leaning over him. The situation was unclear, but full of tension. The pilot was beginning to feel that these two had something on their minds more important than his adventure, something that involved the signals from Grail. In flight, he had caught fragments about machines that hadn't made it, about the search for them. Goss turned with his chair so that the taut line to his headset pulled the phones off his ears onto his neck. Where is this Cinco of yours? On board? I told him to check the reactor. London looked questioningly at the chief. The latter shook his head slightly and muttered, Nothing. And their copters? They returned. Visibility zero. You asked about the maximum load? There's nothing they can do. What does a gigajoule radiator weigh? He turned to the pilot who was listening. I don't know exactly. Under a hundred tons. What are they doing? insisted London. What are they waiting for? For Killian, replied Goss, and cursed. From a compartment in the wall, London took out a bottle of white horse, shook it as if debating whether it would be suitable for the situation, and placed it back on the shelf. The pilot stood, waiting. He no longer felt the heaviness of his suit. We lost two men, said Goss. They didn't reach Grail. Three, not two, London corrected him gloomily. A month ago, Goss went on, we received a shipment of new Diglas. Six for Grail. Grail couldn't accommodate the carrier. The spaceport was still being reconcreted, and when the first freighter set down there, the Achilles, 99,000 tons, the whole reinforced slab, guaranteed by the government, cracked. We were lucky the ship didn't fall over. It was pulled out of its hole and kept in dock for two days. They did some quick first aid on the concrete, put down a fireproof cover, and opened the port again. But the Diglas stayed with us. The experts decided that hauling them by rocket wouldn't pay. Besides, the captain of the Achilles was Terleone. He wasn't about to take a 99,000-ton craft a measly 180 miles from Grail to here for such peanuts. Marlin sent two of his best operators. Last week, they took two machines to Grail. The machines are working there now. The day before yesterday, the same two men returned by copter to take two more. They set out at dawn, and by noon it passed the promontory. When they began to descend, we lost contact with them. A lot of time was lost because beyond the promontory, Grail itself does the guiding. We thought they weren't answering because they were in our radio shadow. Goss spoke in a calm monotone. London stood at the glass, his back to them. The pilot listened. In the same copter with the operators came Pierx. He had landed his cuvier at Grail and wanted to see me. We'd known each other for years. The copter was supposed to take him back in the evening. It didn't arrive because Marlin had sent out everything available in the search. Pierce didn't want to wait, or he couldn't. He was supposed to take off the next day and wanted to be on hand for the clearance of the ship. 
Well, he pressed me to let him return to Grail using one of the Diglas. I made him give me his word that he would take the southern trail, which was longer, but avoided the depression. He gave me his word and broke it. I saw him on the Patsat descending into the depression. The Patsat? asked the pilot. He was pale. Sweat beaded on his brow, but he waited for the explanation. Our patrol satellite. It passes overhead every eight hours. It gave me a clear picture. Pierks went down and disappeared. Commander Pierks? asked the pilot, his face changing. Yes. You know him? Know him? cried the pilot. I served under him as an intern. He signed my diploma. Pierks? For so many years he managed to extricate himself from the worst. He stopped. There was a pounding in his ears. He lifted the helmet with both hands, as if to hurl it at Goss. So you let him go alone in the Digla? How could you? The man's a commander of a fleet, not a truck driver. He knew these machines when you were still in diapers, replied Goss. It was obvious that he was trying to defend himself. London, stony-faced, went to the monitors, where Goss sat with the earphones around his neck. In front of Goss's nose, he knocked the ashes from his pipe into an empty aluminum drum. London examined the pipe, as if not knowing what it was, then took it in both hands. The pipe snapped. He threw away the pieces, returned to the window, and stood motionless, clenched fists held together behind his back. I couldn't refuse him. Goss turned to London, who, as if not listening, looked through the glass at the shifting skeins of red mist. Now only the prow of the rocket occasionally emerged from them. Goss, said the pilot suddenly, give me a machine. No. I have a license to operate thousand-ton striders. There was a brief glitter in Goss's eyes, but he repeated, No, you never operated one on Titan. Saying nothing, the pilot began to take off his suit. He unscrewed the wide metal collar, unfastened the shoulder clasps, the zipper underneath, then reached deep inside and brought out a folder bent from being carried so long under the heavy padding of the suit. Its flaps opened as if ripped. He went to Goss and placed papers before him one by one. That's from Mercury. I had a big int there. A Japanese model, 1,800 tons. And here's my license. I drilled a glacier in Antarctica with a Swedish ice strider, a cryopter. Here's a photocopy of my second place in the Greenland competition. And this is from Venus. He slapped down the photographs as if playing trumps. I was there with Holly's expedition. That's my thermoped and that's my colleague's. He was my alternate. Both models were prototypes, not bad, except that the air conditioning leaked. Goss looked up at him. But aren't you a pilot? I transferred, got my qualification with Commander Pierks. I served on his cuvier. My first command was a tug. How old are you? Twenty-nine. You were able to switch like that? If you want to, it's possible. Besides, an operator of planetary machines can master any new type in an hour. It's like going from a moped to a motorcycle. He broke off. He had another packet of pictures, but didn't produce them. He gathered the ones tossed on the console, put them in the worn leather folder, and returned them to his inside pocket. In the open suit, a little red in the face, he stood near Goss. Across the monitors ran the same streaks of light, indicating nothing. London, sitting on the handrail by the glass, watched this scene in silence. Suppose I were to give you a digla. Let us suppose. What would you do? The pilot smiled. Drops of sweat glistened on his forehead. The fair hair bore the mark of the helmet's pads on top. I would take a radiator with me a gigajoule from the ship's bay. The helicopters at Grail could never lift that, but for the Digla, even a hundred tons is nothing. I would go and have a look around. Marlin's wasting his time searching from the air. I know there's a lot of hematite there and mist. From the copters, you can't see a thing. And you'll take the machine straight to the bottom. 
The pilot's smile widened, showing his white teeth. Goss noticed that this kid, because it was practically a kid, only the size of the suit had added a few years, had the same eyes as Pierks, a little lighter perhaps, but with the exact same wrinkles at the corners of the eyes. When he squinted, he had the look of a large cat in the sun, both innocent and crafty. He wants to enter the Depression and have a look around. Goss said to London, half as a question, half ridiculing the audacity of the volunteer. London didn't blink. Goss stood, removed the earphones, went to the cartograph, and pulled down, like a blind, a large map of the northern hemisphere of Titan. He pointed to two thick lines that curved on a yellow-purple field cut with contour lines. We are here. As the crow flies, it's 110 miles to Grail. By this route, the black, it's 146. We lost four people on it when the concrete was being poured for Grail, and ours was the only landing field. At that time, pedipulators on diesels were used, powered by hypergalls. For local conditions, the weather was perfect. Two teams of machines reached Grail without a hitch, and then... In a single day, four striders disappeared in the Depression, in this circle, without a trace. I know, said the pilot. I learned that in school. I know the names of those people. Goss put a finger on the place where, along the black trail north, a red circle had been drawn. The road was lengthened, but no one knew how far the treacherous terrain extended, Geologists were called in. It would have made just as much sense to call in dentists. They're experts on holes, too. No planet has traveling geysers, but we have them here. The blue in the north is the Mare Heinecum. We and Grail are deep inland. Except that this is not land. It's a sponge. The Mare Heinecum does not flood the depression between us and Grail because the entire coastline is plateau. The geologists said that this so-called continent resembled the Baltic plate of Finno-Scandinavia. They were wrong, the pilot put in. This was beginning to sound like a lecture. He set his helmet down in a corner, sat back in the chair, and folded his hands like an attentive student. He did not know whether Goss intended to acquaint him with the route or scare him away from it, but the whole situation was to his liking. Of course, beneath the rocks lies a slush of frozen hydrocarbons, an abomination discovered by the drills, a permanent ice, treacherous, made of polymers. The stuff doesn't meld even at zero Celsius, and the temperature here never gets higher than ninety below. Inside the depression, there are hundreds of old calderas and extinct geysers. The experts said that these were the remnants of volcanic activity. When the geysers came back to life, we received visitors with higher degrees. Seismoacoustics discovered, far beneath the rocks, a network of caves that branched to an extent never before seen. There was speleological research. People perished and the insurance companies paid. Finally, the consortium, too, opened its pocketbook. Then the astronomers said, when Saturn's other moons are between Titan and the Sun, and the gravitational pull reaches its maximum, the continental plate crumples, and the fire beneath the mantle expels magma. Titan still has a hot core. The magma cools before it rises from the depths in vents, but... Cooling, it heats all of Orlandia. The Mare Heinecum is like water, and the bedrock of Orlandia is like a sponge. The plugged subterranean channels soften and open, hence the geysers. The pressure reaches a thousand atmospheres. One never knows where the damned thing will erupt next. But you have your heart set on going there? I do, replied the pilot in a studied manner. He would have liked to cross his legs, but could not in the suit. He remembered how a colleague of his once tried that and fell over, taking the stool with him. You mean 
Burnham Wood? he added. Am I supposed to flee now, or can we talk seriously? Goss, ignoring this, continued. The new trail cost a fortune. One had to nibble away with successive charges at that ridge of lava, the main flow from the Gorgon. Even the Mons Olympus of Mars can't compare with the Gorgon. Dynamite proved too weak. There was a guy with us, Hornstein, you may have heard of him, who proposed that instead of breaking through the ridge, they should cut steps in it, make stairs, because that would be cheaper. In the UN convention, there ought to be a rule barring idiots from going into astronautics. The Typhon Ridge, anyway, they breached with special thermonuclear bombs after digging a tunnel. Gorgon, Typhon, we're lucky the Greeks have so many monsters in their mythology for us to borrow. The new trail was opened a year ago. It intersects only the southernmost extension of the Depression. The experts pronounced it safe. Meanwhile, the migration of underground caverns is everywhere, beneath all of Orlandia. Three quarters of Africa. When Titan cooled, its orbit was highly elliptical. It approached the Roach Zone, into which a multitude of smaller moons had fallen. Saturn ground them up to make its rings. So Titan cooled while boiling. Great bubbles were created in the Parasaturnium of the orbit, and they froze in the Apositurnium. Then came sedimentation, glaciations, and this bubble-ridden, sponge-like, amorphous rock was covered and pushed underneath. It's not true that the Mare Heinecum flows in only during the ascension of all the moons of Saturn. The invasions and eruptions of geysers cannot be predicted. Everyone who works here knows this, and the carriers, too, including pilots like yourself. The trail cost billions, but it ought to be closed to heavy machines. All of us keep to the sky. We're in heaven here. Look at the name of the mine, Grail, except that heaven has turned out to be damned expensive. The whole thing could have been set up better. The bookkeeping is a nightmare. Payments for those who die are hefty, but less money than it would take to reduce the danger. That's about all I have to say. It's possible for the men to crawl out, even if they're submerged. The tide is receding, and the armor on a digla can take a hundred atmospheres per square inch. They have oxygen for three hundred hours. Marlin sent out robot hovercraft and is having two super heavies repaired. No matter what you can accomplish, it's not worth it. It's not worth risking your neck. The Digla is one of the heaviest— You said you were finished, interrupted the pilot. I have only one question, all right? What about Killian? Goss opened his mouth, coughed, and sat down. It was for this, wasn't it, that I was supposed to bring him, added the pilot. Goss tugged on the bottom edge of the map, which made it roll up with a flutter, then took a cigarette and said over the flame of his lighter, That's his specialty. He knew the terrain. Also, he had a contract. I can't forbid operators to do business with Grail. I can hand in my resignation, and I will. Meanwhile, I can send any hero packing. You'll give me the machine the pilot said quietly. I can talk with Grail right now. Marlin will jump at the offer, give me the job, and that'll be that. He'll get an official pat on the back. Marlin doesn't care whether it's Killian or me, and the instructions I've memorized. We're wasting time, Mr. Goss. Give me something to eat, please. I'll wash up, and then we can go over the details. Goss looked to London for support, but found none in that quarter. He'll go, said the assistant. I heard about him from that speleologist who was at Grail last summer. This one's cut from the same cloth as your peaks. Still waters. Go and wash, hero. The showers are below. Come right back up or the soup will get cold. The pilot left, giving London a grin of gratitude. 
On his way out, he lifted his white helmet with such energy that his tube slapped the sides of his suit. As soon as the door was closed, London began clattering pots and pans by the hot plate. What good will this do? Goss threw the question angrily at his back. You're a big help. And you're spineless. Why did you give Pirks the machine? I had to. I gave my word. London turned to him, a pot in his hand. Your word. You're the kind of friend that if you give your word that you'll jump in after me, you keep it. And if you swear that you'll stand there and watch me drown, you jump in anyway. Am I right? Who knows what's right, Goss said, defending himself half-heartedly. How will he be able to help them? Maybe he'll find tracks. He'll be taking a radiator. Stop! Let me listen to Grail. There might be some news. Dusk was still far off, although the clouds settling around the illuminated mushroom tower made everything dark. London set the table, while Goss, smoking cigarette after cigarette, his earphones on, picked up the small talk between the base at Grail and the tractors that had been sent out after the copters returned. At the same time, he thought about the pilot. Hadn't the pilot changed course too readily, without questions, to land here? A twenty-nine-year-old captain of a ship licensed to operate long-range spacecraft had to be tough, hot-blooded. Otherwise, he would not have risen so quickly. Danger was a lure to plucky youth. If he, Goss, was to blame, it was for an oversight. Had he asked about Killian, he would have sent the ship on to Grail. Chief Goss, after twenty hours without sleep, was unaware that in his thoughts he had already laid the newcomer to rest. And what was the kid's name? He'd forgotten it, and took this as a sign of advancing age. He touched the left monitor. In green rows, the letters went, Ship Helios General Cargo 2 Class. Home Port, Sirtis Major. Pilot, Angus Parvis. Co-pilot, Roman Cinco. Freight, item list, question mark, question mark, question mark. He turned off the screen. They came in wearing sweatsuits. Cinco, thin, curly-haired, greeted them with embarrassment, because the pile turned out to have a leak after all. They sat down to canned soup. The thought occurred to Goss that this daredevil who would be taking the machine out had a jumbled name. He should have been not Parvis, but Parsifal, which went with Grail. Not in the mood for jokes, however, Goss kept the anagram to himself. After a short discussion on the subject of whether they were eating lunch or supper, unresolvable because of the difference in times, the ship's time... Earth time, Titan time, Cinco went down to talk with the technician about the defect scope, which was being set up for the end of the week, when the pile would be cool and the cracks in the housing could be temporarily sealed. The pilot, London, and Goss, meanwhile, viewed a diorama of Titan in an empty part of the hall. The image, created by holographic projectors, three-dimensional, in color, with the roots drawn in, went from the northern pole to the tropic parallel of latitude. It could be reduced or enlarged. Parvis studied the region that separated them from Grail. The room that he was given was small but cozy, with a bunk bed, a little desk that slanted, an armchair, a cabinet, and a shower so narrow that when he soaped himself he kept banging his elbows into the walls. He stretched out on the blanket, and opened the thick handbook of titanography he had borrowed from London. First he looked in the index for Burnham Wood, then Wood Burnham. It was not there. Science had not taken cognizance of the name. He leafed through until he came to the geysers. The author's account of them was not exactly what Goss had said. Titan, solidifying more rapidly than Earth and the other inner planets, locked in its depths enormous masses of compressed gases. 
These gases, at the folds in Titan's crust, pressed against the bases of old volcanoes and against the subterranean veins of magma that formed a network of roots for hundreds of kilometers. At certain configurations of synclines or anticlines, they could break into the atmosphere in fountains of high-pressure, volatile compounds. The mixture, chemically complex, contained carbon dioxide, which froze immediately into snow. Carried by strong winds, the snow covered the plains and mountain slopes with a thick layer. Parvis grew annoyed with the dry tone of the text. He turned out the light, got into bed, was surprised that both the blanket and the pillow stayed in place, accustomed as he was after nearly a month to weightlessness, and fell asleep in an instant. Some internal impulse brought him out of unconsciousness so suddenly that he was sitting when he opened his eyes, ready to jump out of bed. Blankly, he looked around, rubbing his jaw. The jaw reminded him of his dream. Boxing. He had been in the ring against a professional, knew the blow was coming, and fell like a ton of bricks, KO'd. When he opened his eyes wide, the whole room reeled like a cockpit in a sharp turn. He woke completely. In a flash, everything returned to him. Yesterday's landing, the malfunction, the argument with Goss, and the council of war around the diorama. The room was as cramped as a cabin in a freighter, which brought to mind Goss's parting words, that in his youth he had served on board a whaler. Shaving, Parvis reviewed his decision. If it hadn't been for the name Pierks, he would have thought twice before insisting on this excursion. Under the rush of hot, then ice-cold water, he tried singing, but it lacked conviction. He was not himself. He felt that the thing he had asked for was not merely risky, but bordered on stupidity. With the stream in his raised face, blinded, he considered for a moment the idea of backing out, but he knew that that was out of the question. Only a kid would do such a thing. He toweled himself vigorously, made the bed, dressed, and went to look for Goss. Now he was beginning to hurry. He still had to acquaint himself with an unknown model, practice a little, recall the right movements. Goss was nowhere. At the base of the control tower there were two buildings, one in either direction, connected to the tower by tunnels. The location of the spaceport was the result of an oversight, or an outright mistake. According to unmanned soundings, mineral deposits were supposed to lie beneath this once volcanic valley, while actually it was an old crater whose basin had been pushed up by the seismic contractions of Titan. So straight away, machines and people were thrown in, and they began to assemble the barrel-like conduit of living quarters for the mining crews, when the news came that a few hundred miles further on was an incredibly rich and easily accessible load of uranium. The project administration at that point underwent a split. One group wanted to abandon this spaceport and start all over again to the northeast. The other group insisted on remaining, arguing that, yes, beyond the depression there were surface deposits, but they were shallow and therefore would yield little. Those in favor of dismantling the first bridgehead were called, by someone, Seekers of the Holy Grail, and the name of Grail stuck to that area of open-cast mining. The first spaceport was not abandoned, but neither was it expanded. A weak compromise was struck, necessitated by the lack of capital. Thus, although the economists calculated X times that in the long run it would pay to close the landing field in the old crater and concentrate all the activity in a single place, Grail, the ad hoc logic of meeting the demands of the moment prevailed. Grail was unable to receive the larger ships for a long time. But then the Romden Crater, named after the geologist who discovered it, did not have its own repair docks, loading derricks, up-to-date equipment. And there was the constant debate over who served whom and who got what out of the arrangement. 
Some of the top brass still seemed to believe that there was uranium under the crater. Some drilling was done. But the drilling went slowly, because as soon as a few people and a little power were allocated here, Grail immediately expropriated them, intervening at headquarters, and once again construction halted and the machines stood idle by the darkening walls of the Romden. Parvis, like the other transporters, did not participate in these frictions and conflicts, though he had to have passing knowledge of them. That was required by the delicate position of everyone in transport. Grail still wanted, by dent of the de facto situation, to dismantle the spaceport, particularly after the expansion of its own landing field, but Romden thwarted Grail. Or, whether it thwarted Grail or not, it demonstrated its usefulness when the excellent concrete at Grail began to sink. Personally, Parvis was of the opinion that at the root of this chronic schism lay psychology and not money, that two local and therefore mutually antagonistic patriotisms of the Romden Crater and of Grail had arisen, and everything else was a rationalization favoring one side or the other. But this was best left unsaid to anyone working on Titan. The passageways beneath the control tower brought to mind an abandoned subterranean city, and it was painful to see how many supplies were piled up untouched. He had landed at Romden once before, as assistant navigator, but they were in such a hurry at the time that he did not even leave the ship during the unloading to supervise it. Now he looked upon the unpacked, still sealed even, containers with disgust, especially since he recognized among them the ones that he had brought then. Annoyed by the silence, he began yelling as in a forest, but only an echo boomed dully down the corridors of this storage section. He took an elevator up. He found London in the flight control room, but London had no idea where Goss was either. No new communiques had come in from Grail. The monitors flickered. The smell of bacon filled the air. London was making scrambled eggs in bacon fat. The shells he threw in the sink. You have... Eggs here? The pilot was amazed. Oh, plenty. London now spoke to him as one of the crew. There was an electronics guy with ulcers. He brought a whole chicken coop with him, watching his diet. Well, there were protests at first. People complained that he was stinking up the place, and what would he feed the chickens with, etc. But he left a couple of hens and a rooster, and now we love them. Fresh eggs are a delicacy in these parts. Have a seat. Goss will turn up. Parvis felt hungry, stuffing his mouth with unesthetically large pieces of scrambled egg. He justified this to himself. In the face of what awaited him, he ought to stock up on calories. The telephone buzzed. Goss wanted to talk to him. Parvis thanked London for the feast bolted the rest of his coffee, and took the elevator down a floor. The chief was in the corridor, already in coveralls. The hour had struck. Parvis ran to the supply room for his spacesuit. He got into it efficiently, connected the oxygen tank to the hose, but did not open the valve or put on the helmet, not sure that they would be leaving immediately. They took a different elevator, for freight, to the basement. There was storage there, too, piles of containers resembling artillery caissons, with oxygen cylinders jutting from them, five apiece, like heavy-caliber shells. The storeroom was large, but packed. One walked between walls of boxes pasted with labels in different languages. Here was cargo from manufacturers on every continent on Earth. The pilot waited quite a while for Goss, who went to put on his suit, and then did not recognize him at first. The suit was the heavy kind that a mechanic wore, smeared with grease and having a night visor drawn over the glass of the helmet. They went outside through a pressure chamber. The underside of the building hung above them, the hole resembling a giant mushroom with a glass cap. At the top, London was already busy at his station, his silhouette against the green glow of the monitors. 
They went around the base of the tower, circular, windowless, like a lighthouse raised against the sea, and Goss opened wide the gate of a garage made of corrugated metal. Fluorescent lights fluttered. The garage was empty except for a lift truck by the back wall and a jeep similar to the old lunar vehicles of the Americans. An open chassis, seats with footrests, nothing but a frame, tires, a steering wheel, and a storage battery in the rear. Goss drove it out onto the uneven rubble that covered the ground near the tower and stopped so that the pilot could get on. They moved through red-brown mist toward an indistinct, low structure, block-like, with a flat roof. In the distance, behind a mountain ridge, were dull columns of illumination, like anti-aircraft searchlights. They had nothing in common, however, with such antiquated nonsense. Titan's sun, on cloudy days, provided little light, Therefore, giant mirrors were put into stationary orbit over Grail during the working of the uranium ore. Called selectors, they concentrated the sun's rays on the mining area. Their usefulness proved problematic. Saturn and its moons constituted a region of the interaction of many masses, setting up perturbations impossible to calculate. Thus, despite the efforts of the astrophysicists, the columns of light underwent deviations, often wandering as far afield as the Romden crater. The solitary souls of Romden took pleasure, a pleasure not merely sardonic, in these solar visitations, since, especially at night, the whole basin of the crater emerged suddenly from darkness and showed its grim, fascinating beauty. Goss, taking the jeep around obstacles, cylindrical blocks that resembled misshapen vats, plugs from small volcanic fumaroles, also noticed the brightness, cold as northern light, and muttered, half to himself, heading our way. Good. In a minute or two we'll be able to see everything like on a stage. And he added, with obvious malice, nice of Marlin to share with us. Parvis understood the joke, because the illumination of Romden meant that it would be pitch black at Grail, and therefore Marlin and his dispatcher were now getting the selector maintenance crew out of bed to man the engines that would put the space mirrors back where they belonged. But the two columns of light came closer, and under one of them flashed an ice-covered peak on the eastern ridge. An additional benefit for the Romdenites was the remarkable clarity of the atmosphere, considering Titan, in their crater. It allowed them for weeks at a time to admire, against the starry firmament, the yellow, flat-ringed disk of Saturn. Though it was at a distance five times greater than the moon was from the Earth, the ascending planet's size always shocked novices, with the naked eye, one could see the many-colored stripes on the surface as well as the black dots that were shadows cast by Saturn's nearer moons. Such views were made possible by the northern wind that drove through the gorges and chasms with such force that it produced a feign effect. Nowhere else on Titan was it as warm as at Romden. Whether the maintenance crew had not yet managed to regain control of their selectors, or whether because of the emergency there was no one around to do this, the beam of sunlight was already moving across the bottom of the basin. The basin became as bright as day. The jeep didn't even need its headlights. The pilot saw the stained gray concrete around his helios. And beyond that, in the place where they were heading, there stood, like petrified stumps of unbelievable trees, volcanic plugs that had been ejected from seismic blowholes millions of years ago and congealed. In foreshortened perspective, these looked like the colonnade of a ruined temple. Their moving shadows were pointers on a row of sundials that indicated an alien, galloping time. The jeep passed this irregular palisade, it rolled, lurching, its electric motor whined. The flat building still lay in darkness, but they could now see two black silhouettes looming behind it, 
like Gothic cathedrals. The pilot appreciated their true size when he and Goss got off and approached them on foot. Such giants he had never seen before, and had never operated a Digla either, which he hadn't admitted. Put one of these machines in a fur suit, and you had King Kong. The proportions were more anthropoid than human. The legs, made of bridge truss work, descended vertically to feet as mighty as tanks, embedded in the rubble and motionless. The tower-like thighs rose to a pelvic girdle, in which, like a flat-bottomed boat, rested the iron trunk. The hands of the upper limbs could be seen only by throwing one's head back. They hung alongside the torso like useless lower derrick cranes with fists of steel. Both colossi were headless. What, at a distance, he had taken for turrets turned out to be, against the sky, antennas atop the shoulders of each. Behind the first digla, practically touching its armor plate with an arm bent at the elbow joint, as if intending to poke the thing in the side it had frozen in place, stood a second, identical. Because it was a little farther off, one could see in its chest the gleam of a glass window, the driver's cabin. This is Castor, and this is Pollux, Goss made the introduction. He played a handheld floodlight on the giants. The beam brought out from the semi-darkness the plate metal of the shin guards, the shields protecting the knees, and the trunk that was as smooth and black as the carcass of a whale. Hearts, that blockhead, couldn't even put them in the hangar, said Goss. He groped on his chest for a knob. His breath was fogging the glass of the helmet. He barely braked in time before that slope. The pilot understood why Hearts had packed both colossi into this gap in the rock and why he had chosen to leave them there. It was the inertia. Just like a seagoing vessel, a walking machine responded more sluggishly to the helmsman the greater its mass. He was about to ask how much a digla weighed, but, not wanting to show his ignorance, instead took the light from Goss and proceeded along the foot of the giant. Running the light over the steel, he found, as he expected, a nameplate riveted at eye level. Maximum operating power, 14,000 kilowatts. Overload limit, 19,000 kilowatts. Rest mass, 1,680 tons. Reactor multi-shielded tokamak with Foucault converter. Hydraulic drive, main transmission and gears by Rolls-Royce. Chassis, made in Sweden. He directed the cone of light upward along the beams and girders of the leg, but couldn't take in the entire frame at once. The light barely showed the contours of the black, headless shoulders. When he returned, Goss was gone, probably to switch on the heating system of the landing field. Indeed, the pipes that ran along the ground were beginning to dispel the thin, low-flowing mist. The wandering column of sunlight moved across the basin like a slow drunkard, tearing the darkness from the blocks that were storehouses or from the mushroom of the control tower with the green band of its own light, or it made flashes that faded instantly, touching the ice patches on more distant cliffs as if trying to waken the dead landscape by giving it motion. Suddenly the column swerved, rushed across the wide concrete, jumped the mushroom tower, the palisade of magma stumps, the hangar, and hit the pilot, who raised a protecting glove and quickly craned his neck as much as possible in his helmet, taking this opportunity to see the whole digla at once. Coated with a black, anti-corrosive enamel, it gleamed above him like a two-legged battleship rearing, holding a pose for a flash camera. The tempered breastplates, the circular undercarriage of the hips, the beams and drive shafts of the thighs, the shielding on the knee joints, the ribwork of the shins, everything shone, spotless, indicating that the giant had as yet done no work. Parvis experienced both joy and butterflies in the stomach. He swallowed with difficulty.
As the light moved off, he walked around behind the digla. Its foot, as he approached it, bore less and less of a resemblance to a human foot of steel. It became a caricature, and then, near the soul sunken in the dust, bore no resemblance at all. Parvis stood as if at the base of a dock derrick that nothing could budge. The armored heel could have served as the support of a hydraulic press. The ankle had cotter pins like screw propellers, and the knee, bulging halfway up the leg, at a height of at least two stories, was like the drum of a steamroller. The hands of the giant, larger than power shovel dippers, hung motionless, frozen at attention. Though Goss had gone off somewhere, the pilot did not intend to wait. He saw the steps that jutted from the back edge of the heel and the grip bars, so he began to ascend. The ankle was encircled by a small platform from which rose, now inside the truss work of the calf, a vertical ladder. It was not difficult, so much as strange, to climb its rungs. The ladder led him to a hatch that was situated not too conveniently above the right thigh, for the reason that the original, most logical place, for the builders, had become the butt of endless jokes. The designers of the first striders ignored this low humor, of course, but later they had to take it into account. It came to light that operators were reluctant to sign up for these atlases, teased by their colleagues about how one got inside them. Unbolting the hatch activated a garland of tiny lights. He took a spiral staircase to the cabin. The cabin was like a great glass barrel or section of pipe transfixing the chest of the digla, not in the center, but on the left, as if the engineers had wanted to put a man in the place the heart would be if the giant were living. He cast his eyes around the interior, now also lit, and with considerable relief saw that the control systems were familiar. He felt at home. Quickly removing his helmet and getting out of his suit, he turned up the heat. All he was wearing was a jersey and tights, and to move the giant he would need to strip completely. Warm air filled the cabin. At the convex front pane, he gazed into the distance. It was daybreak, and gloomy as usual. On Titan, a storm always seemed to be brewing. In the dim light, he observed the scattered rocks of a region far beyond the landing field. He was eight stories up, and it was like looking from the window of an office building. He could even look down on the mushroom of the control tower. Except for the mountain peaks at the horizon, only the prow of the Helios stood above him. Through the side walls of glass, also curved, he could see into the dark shafts, poorly illuminated, full of machinery that slowly, steadily sighed, as if awakened from a trance or sleep. The cabin contained no control consoles, no steering wheels, no view screens. There was nothing but a piece of clothing— crumpled on the floor like an empty, metallically glittering skin, and two mosaics of black cubes fastened to the front glass. The cubes were like blocks in a child's playpen, because their surfaces held silhouettes of tiny arms and legs, the right on the right mosaic, the left on the left. When the Colossus walked and everything in it functioned smoothly, each little picture glowed a peaceful willow green. In the event of a disturbance, the color changed to brown, if the problem was minor, and purple for emergencies. This was a segmented image of the entire machine projected onto the black mosaic. The young man, in a current of heated air, removed the rest of his clothes, he tossed the jersey in a corner and began pulling on the operator's suit. The elastic material, yielding, clung to his bare feet, his thighs, belly, shoulders. A glitter to his neck in the electronic snakeskin, he eased his hands carefully, finger by finger, inside the gloves. Then, when he pulled the zipper up past his chest in a single movement, the black mosaic burst into colored lights. 
A glance verified that this system was the same as in the ordinary ice striders that he had handled in Antarctica, though those didn't compare with the digla in mass. He reached to the ceiling for a strap, a kind of harness, and put it around him, buckled it tight across his chest. When the buckle clicked shut, the harness lifted him gently, resiliently, so that, supported from under the arms, as in a well-padded corset, he was suspended and could move either leg freely. Checking that the arms were just as free, he felt for the main switch at the neck, found the lever, and threw it all the way. The lights on the cubes doubled in intensity, and at the same time he heard, deep beneath him, the engines of all the limbs. They idled in neutral, making soft sucking noises because there was excess grease on the connecting rods from the rotary bearings, which had been packed at the earth shipyard to protect against corrosion. Looking down with care so as not to hit the side of the storage building, he made his first tentative small step. In the lining of his suit were thousands of electrodes, sewn in supple spirals, Pressed against the naked body, they gathered the impulses from the nerves and muscles and transmitted them to the Goliath. Just as to each of the skeletal joints of the man there corresponded, in the machine, a magnified, hermetically sealed joint of metal, so for each group of muscles that flexed or straightened a limb there were cannon-like cylinders in which pistons moved, pushed by pumped oil. But the operator did not need to think or even know about all this. He merely moved as if walking, as if treading the ground with his feet, or as if bending his torso to pick up, with outstretched hand, a desired object. There were only two significant differences. First, that of size, since a single human footfall equaled a twelve-meter step by the machine. It was the same with every movement— Thanks to the extraordinary precision of the relays, the machine was able, if the operator wished to demonstrate his skill, to lift a full liqueur glass from a table and raise it to a height of twelve stories without spilling a drop or crushing the crystal stem in the great tongs of its grip. But the Colossus was made to lift not little glasses or pebbles, but multi-ton pipes, beams, and boulders. With the appropriate tools put in its hands, it became a drilling rig, a bulldozer, a crane, but always a mighty union of virtually inexhaustible force with human dexterity. The giant striders were an extension of the concept of the exoskeleton, which, as an external amplifier of the human body, had been applied in many twentieth-century prototypes. The invention languished because on earth no immediate practical use was found for it. What revived the idea was the exploitation of the solar system. Planetary machines arose, adapted to the globes on which they were to work, to the local tasks and conditions. In weight, the machines varied, but in inertial mass they were the same everywhere, and therein lay the second important difference between them and people. Both strength of construction material and engine power had their limits. The limits were imposed, even at a distance from all gravitational bodies, by the machine's inertial mass. One could not make sudden movements in a strider, just as one could not stop an ocean liner on a dime or spin the arm of a crane like a propeller. Trying that in a digla would break its girdered limbs. To protect against any such self-destructive maneuver, therefore, the engineers had installed safety cutoffs in each of the branching drive units. The operator, however, could override any or all of these neutralizers if he found himself in dire straits. He might be able, at the cost of ruining the machine, to save his own neck, to emerge from a cave-in, for example. And if that did not save him, he had one last resort, an ultimate refuge, the vitrifax. The man was protected by the outer armor of the strider and by the inner shields of its cabin, but inside 
above the operator, in the shape of a bell, was the open mouth of the vitrifax. The device could freeze a man in the blink of an eye. Granted, medicine still lacked the means to restore the frozen one to life. Victims of catastrophes, preserved in cylinders of liquid nitrogen, lay waiting unchanged for the advent of a resurrection technology in the next century. This medical passing of the buck to an indefinite future seemed, to many people, a gruesome desertion of duty, a promise of rescue with no guarantee of its fulfillment. There was, however, more than one precedent in medicine of such extreme terminal measures. The first transplants of ape hearts in dying patients evoked similar reactions of indignation and horror. Still, polling the operators themselves revealed how little hope they placed in the vitrifax apparatus. Their profession may have been brand new, but the death that lurked in it was as old as any human enterprise. Therefore, Angus Parvis, treading the ground of Titan with heavy steps, gave no thought to the black shaft above his head or to the push-button glowing like a ruby within its transparent little bubble case. With exaggerated caution, he moved out onto the concrete slab of the spaceport to test-walk the digla. Instantly the old feeling came back to him, that he was both incredibly light and incredibly heavy, free and constrained, swift and slow. The closest analogy might have been the sensation of a diver whose weight was lessened by the buoyancy of the water, but who found greater resistance in the medium the faster he tried to go. The first prototypes of the planetary machines, after a few hours of operation, ended up on the scrap heap, lacking motion neutralizers. The novice who took a few steps in an early strider got the impression that there was nothing to it, and thus, when he went to execute a simple task, say, setting a row of crossbeams on the walls of a house under construction, he would demolish the wall and bend the pipes before he knew what was happening. But a machine with neutralizers could also be treacherous for an unskilled operator. Reading numbers of maximum loads was as easy as reading a book on skiing, but no one ever mastered the slalom from a book. Parvis, well acquainted with thousand-ton craft, judged from the small acceleration of the steps at first that the giant under his control had almost double that mass. Suspended in his glass cabin like a spider in a strange net, he immediately moderated the movements of his legs and even stopped in order to begin, very slowly, exercises in place. He shifted from foot to foot, bending the trunk to either side, and only then walked several times around his ship. His heart was beating more heavily than usual, but everything went without a hitch. He saw the barren basin, dark gray in the low mist, the distant rows of lights that marked the borders of the landing field, and, at the base of the control tower, the tiny form of Goss, a veritable ant. Parvis was surrounded by a pleasant, not insistent sound. His ears, able more and more to distinguish the different noises, recognized the background bass of the main engines, which sometimes built up to a muffled singing and sometimes grumbled a mild reproach when the hundred-ton legs, thrusting forward, were halted too abruptly. He was now able to pick out the choral call of the hydraulics, whose oil coursed through thousands of ducts and cylinders, setting up a steady beat of pistons that bent and extended each limb as the tank-clad feet walked the concrete. He could even hear the delicate whine of the gyroscopes that autonomously assisted him in maintaining balance. When he tried a sharper turn, the massive structure that he occupied proved to be not so maneuverable. The massive structure that he occupied proved to be not so maneuverable, and although the engines obediently roared full force, the giant began to sway, but did not go out of control, because Parvis instantly eased up, increasing the radius of the curve. 
Then he began to play with lifting the multi-ton boulders that lay beyond the edge of the concrete field. Sparks flew, and there was a shrill grating sound when the pincers grasped and bit into the stone. Before an hour went by, he felt sure of his digla. He had achieved again the familiar state that veterans called fusion of man and strider. The boundary between himself and the machine had disappeared. Its movements were now his movements. To complete his preparation, he climbed quite high up a debris-covered slope and had become so proficient that he could tell from the rumble of the rocks as they began to slip from under his crushing feet exactly how much he could demand of his colossus. Already he was fond of it. It was only when he went back down to the hazily lit lines of the landing field that his satisfaction with himself got punctured by the needle reminder of the excursion before him, and the knowledge that Pirks and two other people, encased in the very same giants, had become trapped in the depression of Titan. Whether it was for additional practice, or to say goodbye, he could not say, but he circled the ship in which he had landed, then held a brief conversation with Goss. The chief was now standing beside London, behind the glass of the tower. Parvis saw them, heard from them that there was still no news about the missing men. Leaving, he lifted high an iron hand. Someone might have thought the gesture melodramatic or even clownish, but he preferred it to any words. He did a steady about-face, put a holographic of the terrain to be crossed on the single ceiling-high monitor, switched on the azimuth finder and the projection of the path to Grail, and set out a twelve-meter step at a time. There were two kinds of landscape characteristic of the inner planets of the sun, the purposeful and the desolate. Purpose informed every scene on Earth— the planet that produced life, because every detail there had its benefit, its teleology. True, it did not always, but billions of years of organic labor had accomplished much. Thus, flowers possessed color for the purpose of attracting insects, and clouds existed for the purpose of dropping rain on pastures and forests. Every form and thing was explained by some benefit— whereas what was clearly devoid of any benefit, like the icebergs of Antarctica or the mountain chains, constituted an enclave of desolation, an exception to the rule, a wild though possibly attractive waste. But even this was not certain, because man, undertaking the deflection of the course of rivers to irrigate areas of drought or warming the polar regions, paid for the improvement of some territories with the abandonment of others, thereby upsetting the climatic equilibrium of the biosphere, which had been adjusted so painstakingly, though with seeming indifference, by the efforts of natural evolution. It was not that the ocean depth served the creatures there with darkness to protect them from attack, a darkness they could light as they needed with luminescence, but vice versa. The darkness gave rise precisely to those that were pressure-resistant and could illuminate themselves. On planets overgrown with life, it was only in the depths, in caves and grottoes, that the creative power of nature could timidly express itself, a power that, not harnessed to any adaptational requirement, or hemmed in, in the struggle for survival, by the competition of its own results, could create over billions of years, with infinite patience, in droplets of hardening salt solutions, phantasmagoric forests of stalactites and stalagmites. But on such globes this was a deviation from the planetary labors, a deviation locked away in vaults of rock, and therefore unable to reveal its vigor. Hence the impression that such places were not usual in nature, but rather spawning grounds for monstrosities only on the fringe of things, infrequent exceptions to the statistical rule of chaos. In turn, 
on globes parched like Mars or like Mercury, immersed in a violent solar wind, the surfaces, due to that rarefied but incessant exhalation from the mother star, were lifeless waste, since all raised forms were eroded by the fiery heat and reduced to dust that filled the crater basins. It was only in places where eternal, still death reigned, where neither the sieves nor the mills of natural selection were at work, shaping every creature to fit the rigors of survival, that an amazing realm opened up, of compositions of matter that did not imitate anything, that were not controlled by anything, and that went beyond the framework of the human imagination. For this reason, the fantastic landscapes of Titan were a shock to the first explorers. People equated order with life, and chaos with a dreary inanimateness. One had to stand on the outer planets, on Titan, the greatest of their moons, to appreciate the full error of this dichotomy dogma. The strange formations of Titan, whether relatively safe or treacherous, were ordinary rubble heaps of chaos when viewed from a distance and a height. But they did not appear so when one set foot on the soil of this moon. The intense cold of this whole sector of space, in which the sun shone but gave no heat, proved to be not a throttle but a spur to the creativity of matter. The cold indeed slowed the creativity, but in that very slowing gave it an opportunity to display its talent, providing a dimension that was indispensable to a nature untouched by life and unwarmed by sun. Time. Time on a scale where one million centuries or two million was of no significance. The raw materials here were the same chemical elements as on Earth. But on Earth, they had entered the servitude, so to speak, of biological evolution, and only in that context amazed man with subtlety, the subtlety of the complex bondings that combine to form organisms and the interdependent hierarchies of species. It was therefore thought that high complexity was a property not of all matter, but only of living matter and that chaos in the inorganic state produced nothing more than haphazard volcanic spasms, lava flows, rains of sulfurous ash. The Romden crater had cracked once at the northeast on its large circle. Then a glacier of frozen gas crept through the gap. In the following millennia, the glacier retreated, leaving on that furrowed terrain mineral deposits, the delight and vexation of the crystallographers and other no less dumbfounded scientists. It was indeed a sight to see. The pilot, now operator of a strider, faced a sloping plain ringed by distant mountains and strewn with... with what, exactly? It was as if the gates of unearthly museums had been flung open and the remains of decrepit monsters had been dumped in a cascade of bones. Or were these the aborted, insane blueprints for monsters, each one more fantastic than the last? The shattered fragments of creatures that only some accident had kept from participating in the cycles of life. He saw enormous ribs or they could have been the skeletons of spiders whose tibii eagerly gripped blood-speckled, bulbous eggs, mandibles that clung to each other with crystal fangs, the plate-like vertebrae of spinal columns, as if spilled out in coin rolls from the bodies of prehistoric reptiles after their decay. This eerie scene was best viewed, in all its wealth, from the height of the digla, the area near Romden was called, by the people there, the cemetery, and in fact the landscape seemed a battlefield of ancient struggles, a burial ground that was an exuberant tangle of rotting skeletons. Parvis saw the smooth surfaces of joints that could have emerged from the carcass of some mountainous monstrosity. One could even make out on them the reddish, blood-clotted places where the tendons had been attached. 
Nearby were draped skin coverings with bits of hair that the wind gently combed and lay in changing waves. Through the mist loomed more many-storied arthropods, gnawing through one another even in death. From faceted, mirror-like blocks thrusted antlers, also gleaming among a spill of femurs and skulls of a dirty white color. He saw this, realizing that the images that arose in his brain, the macabre associations, were only an illusion, a trick of the eyes shocked by the strangeness. If he dug methodically in his memory, he would probably remember which compounds yielded, in a billion-year chemistry, precisely these forms that, stained with hematites, impersonated bloody bones, or that went beyond the modest accomplishments of terrestrial asbestos to create an iridescent fluff as of the most delicate fleece. But such sober analysis would have no effect on what the eyes saw. For the very reason that here nothing served a purpose, not ever, not to anyone, and that here no guillotine of evolution was in play, amputating from every genotype whatever did not contribute to survival, nature, constrained neither by the life she bore nor by the death she inflicted, could achieve liberation, displaying a prodigality characteristic of herself, a limitless wastefulness, a brute magnificence that was useless, an eternal power of creation without a goal, without a need, without a meaning. This truth gradually penetrating the observer, was more unsettling than the impression that he was witness to a cosmic mimicry of death, or that these were in fact the mortal remains of unknown beings that lay beneath the stormy horizon. So one had to turn upside down one's natural way of thinking, which was capable of going only in one direction— these shapes were similar to bones, ribs, skulls, and fangs, not because they had once served life, they never had, but only because the skeletons of terrestrial vertebrates, and their fur, and the chitinous armor of the insects, and the shells of the mollusks, all possessed the same architectonics, the same symmetry and grace, since nature could produce this just as well where neither life nor life's purposefulness had ever existed, or ever would. Fallen into such philosophical reverie, the young pilot gave a start, remembering how he had come here, and his vehicle, and his mission. Obediently, the iron strider magnified that waver and jerk a thousandfold, bringing him back to reality with the howl of its drive transmission and the trembling of its entire mass. The pilot blushed. Collecting himself, he moved on. At first he was reluctant to set his feet, which landed like steam hammers on the pseudo-skeletons, but sidestepping them proved as futile as it was troublesome. Therefore he hesitated only on occasion, when his way was blocked by a particularly remarkable structure, and even then he walked around it only if plowing through the high heap and crushing it presented any difficulty to his servant giant. Also, from up close, the impression that he was tramping through endless bones, smashing craniums, branched phalanges of wings, zygomatic arches that had separated from the frontals, plus various horns, dwindled to nothing. Sometimes it was as if he were walking on the remains of organic machines, hybrid beings, half-animal, arisen from the union of the living and the non-living, of reason and unreason, and sometimes it was as if he were bringing his iridium boots down on weirdly spreading gems, precious and impure, partially clouded due to interpenetrations and metamorphoses. Because from this height he had to watch constantly where and at what angle he was placing the tower-like legs, and because this march of the first stage was taking more than an hour, it was necessary to go slow, he laughed at the mighty efforts made by the artists of earth to reach beyond the boundary of human imagination, which must visualize everything, 
at how the poor devils beat against the walls in their minds, and at how little, really, they departed from platitude, though straining to the utmost to depart, while here, in a single acre, there was more proud originality than in a hundred of their anxious, anguished art shows. There being no stimulus to which a man did not soon become accustomed, before long he was marching through the cemeteries of calcocytes, spinels, amethysts, plagioclases, or rather their distant non-terrestrial relatives, as if this were ordinary rock debris underfoot. In an instant he shattered a branch that had taken millions of years to crystallize into unique, unrepeatable forkings, not wanting to, but forced to reduce it to powdered glass. Although from time to time he regretted the loss of the more splendid of these works of eons, they crowded each other so much, eclipsed each other in such extreme profusion, that finally only one thing impressed him. Namely, the extent to which this region seemed to him, and not to him alone, a dream, a kingdom of phantoms and of a beauty afflicted by madness. This was a realm, he said to himself, almost aloud, where nature slept, incarnating her magnificent grimness, her unfettered nightmares, directly, somehow, without the mediation of any psyche, into the solid hardness of material forms. Just as in a dream, whatever he saw was both totally alien and extremely familiar reminding him continually of something that in the next minute would always elude him, and he would remain with a senselessness that concealed some subtle deceit. Because here things seemed definite defined only in their ancient origins. They could never complete themselves, never achieve full realization, never decide on a conclusion, on a destiny. Thus, he mused, dazed by both the surroundings and his own reflections, since he was not in the habit of philosophizing. He had the risen sun behind him now, so his shadow preceded him, and it was strange to see, in the movements of that long, sharp-cornered, forward-rushing silhouette, its machine nature and his own human nature combined. The shape was that of a headless robot swaying, as it went, like a boat, but it had at the same time movements peculiar only to him, displaying them as if with a perverse ostentation since they were magnified, exaggerated. True, he had noticed this before, but the nearly two-hour march in this enchanted place somehow charged or sharpened the imagination and it did not bother him when, turning more to the west from Romden, he lost radio contact with the Romdenites. He would be emerging from the radio shadow at mile thirty, not that far ahead, but for now he wanted to be by himself, free of the stock questions and the reports in reply. On the horizon there were dark shapes, he could not tell whether of clouds or mountains, Angus Parvis, on his way to Grail, not once in the whole rambling sequence of his ruminations connected his name with Parsifal. It was always difficult for a man to step out of his mental identity. It was like jumping out of one's skin, let alone into mythology. His attention wandered from the immediate surroundings of his route, particularly as the scenery of counterfeit death, the anatomical theater of planetary minerals, was thinning out. He passed places that gleamed with such deception, as if arranged mysteriously for his eyes alone. He passed them now with true indifference. From the moment he made his decision, he refused to think about what had prompted that decision. This was not a problem for him. As an astronaut, alone for long periods, he had learned how not to argue with himself. He marched on in the swaying digla. The Colossus had to tilt from side to side, but he was well acquainted with that. The tachometer indicated about thirty miles an hour. The grisly reptilian amphibian dances of death 
gave way to gentle folds of rock covered with a volcanic tuff finer and lighter than sand. Though he could accelerate, he knew that the sensations experienced at full speed were hard to take for long, and he had a march of several hours ahead of him in much more difficult terrain before he reached the depression. The flat, toothed contours on the horizon no longer looked like clouds. As he walked toward them, his shadow swept before him, misshapen. Because of the strider's great mass, the legs were only a third the length of the trunk. Pressed to increase its speed, it had to lengthen its steps, throwing each limb forward in turn with the hip. The hip could move because the circular mounting of the legs, more precisely their undercarriage, was an enormous bearing plate into which the trunk fitted. The problem was that to the lateral tilting was then added the up-and-down motion of the giant, making the landscape reel before the operator like a drunkard. Such heavy machines were not built for running. Even a jump from a height of two meters was unwise on Titan. On lesser spheres, and on the Earth's moon, there was more freedom of movement. But the constructors had not concerned themselves about the speed of these machines, whose walking was not to serve as a means of transportation, but rather to perform heavy tasks. The ability to cover a distance was a plus, making the industrious colossi more self-sufficient. For an hour or more, it seemed to Parvis, alternately, that, one, any second he would become stuck in a chaos of rock, and that, two, the azimuth line had been drawn by a genius, because each time Parvis approached a pile of rubble, slabs of stone balanced so precariously that it looked as if the least breeze would start a thundering avalanche, at the last moment there would always be a convenient way through, so he never needed to circle around or backtrack out of cul-de-sacs. Before long, he concluded that on Titan, the best operator would be cross-eyed, since one had to watch the terrain in front of the machine from a height, and at the same time the glowing directional indicator, which quivered like the needle of an ordinary compass on a semi-transparent map. Somehow he managed, doing not badly at all, relying on his eyes and on the needle. Cut off from the world by the roar of the power units and the overall rumble of resonance in the frame, he still could see Titan through the non-reflecting glass of his compartment. No matter where he turned his head, and he did so whenever more level terrain permitted, he saw, above a sea of mist, mountain ridges split by volcanoes that had been dead for centuries. Proceeding along the ragged ice, he noticed, sunken deep within it, the shadows of volcanic bombs and darker, unidentifiable shapes, as of starfish or octopuses set like insects in amber. Then the land changed. It was still forbidding, but in a different way. The planet had gone through a period of bombardments and eruptions, sending blind bursts of lava and basalt skyward to freeze in wild, alien immobility. He entered these volcanic defiles. The overhangs farther on were unbelievable. The non-living dynamism of these seismic congealings, inexpressible in the language of beings raised on a tamer planet, was accentuated by a gravitation no greater than that of Mars. To a man lost in this labyrinth, his striding vehicle ceased to seem a giant. It dwindled, insignificant among the crags of lava, which once, in kilometer-long cascades of fire, had been transfixed by the cosmic cold. The cold cut short their flow, and before they froze, falling in the precipices, it drew them out into gigantic vertical icicles, monstrous colonnades, a sight that was one of a kind. It made of the digla a microscopic bug that inched past towering pillars, pillars of a building abandoned after construction as careless as it was mighty by the true giants of the planet. Or... 
a thick syrup flowing from the lip of some vessel and hardening into stalactites, as witnessed by an ant from its crack in the floor. The scale, however, was more awesome than that. It was in this wilderness, in this order, disorder, so foreign to the human eye, bearing no similarity to any mountains on earth, that the cruel beauty of the place showed itself, of a waste vomited from the planet's depths and turned, beneath a remote sun, from fire to stone. Remote, because the sun here was no flaming disk as on the moon or earth, it was a coldly glowing nail hammered into a dun sky, giving little light and even less heat. Outside, it was ninety below, the temperature of an exceptionally mild summer for this year. At the mouth of the gorge, Parvis observed a glow in the sky. The glow rose higher and higher until it took up a quarter of the firmament. He did not realize at first that this was neither dawn nor the illumination of a selector, but the mother and ruler of Titan, great-ringed, yellow as honey, Saturn. A sharp lurch, the reeling of the cabin, the sudden bellow of the engines, countered more swiftly by the reflex of the gyroscopes than by his maneuver, reminded him that now was not the time for astronomical or philosophical contemplation. Humbly he returned his eyes to the ground. Curiously, it was only then that he became aware of the ludicrousness of his movements. Hanging in the harness, he trod the air like a child playing on a swing, yet felt each thunderous step. The gorge grew steep. Although he shortened his stride, the engine room filled with the howl of the turbines. He found himself in deep shadow before he had time to switch on the headlights, and in the next second was walking into a bulge of rock larger than the digla. The tendency of his pendular, driven mass, obeying Newton's first law, to continue its straight trajectory, when he forced it to turn, threw the engines into overload. All the dials, until now a peaceful green, flared purple. The turbines bellowed with despair, giving everything they had. The RPM indicator for the main gyroscope began to flash, which meant that the fuse was overheating. The cabin dipped as if the digla would fall any moment. Parvis broke into a cold sweat. To destroy, in such an insanely stupid way, the machine entrusted to him. But only the left elbow scraped the rock, with a grating sound as of a ship pushed up onto a reef. Smoke, dust, a shaft of spark sprayed from under the steel, and the giant, shaking, regained its balance. The pilot pulled himself together. He was glad that in the gorge he had lost radio contact with Goss. The automatic transmitter would have put this little incident on the monitor. Emerging from the shadow, he doubled his vigilance. He still felt shame, because it was an elementary thing, as old as the world. Any engineer knew from long experience, without thinking, that to start a locomotive by itself and to start it when it pulled a string of cars were two entirely different matters. So he advanced as if on inspection, and the Colossus was again wonderfully obedient. Through the glass he saw how a small motion of his hand instantly became the sweep of a mighty tongs-shaped paw, and when he extended a leg, a tower moved forward, its knee shield gleaming. He was now fifty-eight miles from the spaceport. Going by the map, by the satellite photographs that he had studied the previous evening, and by the diorama, which had a scale of one to eight hundred, he knew that the way to Grail basically was divided into three parts— the first comprised the so-called cemetery and the volcanic gorge he had just left. The second he could now see. A gap in the massif of frozen lava made with a series of detonated thermonuclear charges. 
This massif, the greatest of the flows from the Orlandian volcano, could not have been dealt with in any other way on account of the bulwark steepness of its slopes. The nuclear blasts had chewed through the formation that blocked passage, had cut it in two as a heated knife bisects a lump of butter. The pass, on the cabin's diagram of Titan, was circled with exclamation points, a reminder that here, under no circumstance, should one leave one's vehicle. The residual radiation from the thermonuclears was still unsafe for a man outside the armor of his strider. Between the exit and entrance to the defile lay a mile-long plain, black as if blanketed with soot. On it, he could hear Goss again. Parvis said nothing about his collision with the rock. Goss told him that after the defile, at the promontory, the halfway point, Grail would take over on the radio to guide him. There, also, would begin the third, final stretch of the trail through the depression. The black powder filling the plain between the two bulges of the formation covered the legs of the digla above its knees. Parvis walked through the low puffs quickly and easily, toward the nearly perpendicular walls of the corridor. He reached a wall, stepping on rubble that was vitreous, smooth surfaces fractured by the solar heat of the explosions. These pieces, hard as diamonds, made sounds like gunfire when ground beneath the iridium heels of the digla. But the bottom of the defile was as flat as a table. He walked between the blackened walls in the rumbling echo of steps, steps that were his own. He had joined with the machine. It was his magnified body. Then he found himself in darkness so sudden, so thick, that he had to turn on the headlights. Their mercury glare contended, in the swirl of shadows between the pillar jaws of rock, with the cold, reddish, unfriendly light of the sky framed by the far gate of the defile, which became larger the closer he drew to it. Toward the end, the defile narrowed, as if it would not let his giant pass, as if he would be wedging the square shoulders in a chimney-like cleft. But this was an illusion. On either side there was clearance of several meters. Nevertheless, he slowed, because Pollock swayed more from side to side the faster it went. There was no help for this. The dock waddle when hurrying arose from the laws of dynamics, from angular momentum, and the engineers were unable to overcome it completely. For the last three hundred meters he again ascended, more and more steeply, planting the feet with care, leaning forward a little from his high, suspended place to see what he was stepping on. This close examination took so much of his attention that it was only when the light surrounding him on all sides filled the cabin that he lifted his head and saw the next, altogether different, unearthly landscape. The promontory stood above a white and ruddy ocean of fleecy clouds, solitary, black, Slender, it was the only thing in the sky from horizon to horizon. Parvis understood why some called it God's finger. Slowly he came to a halt, and, with the magnificent scene spread out before him, tried, over the soft singing of the turbines, to catch the voice of Grail. But he heard nothing. He tried to raise Goss, but Goss did not respond either. Parvis was still in radio shadow. Then a curious thing happened. Before, radio contact with the spaceport was somehow irritating to him, unpleasant, perhaps because he felt, not in Goss's words so much as in the man's voice, a concealed anxiety, a disbelief almost that Parvis would make it, and in that anxiety there was an element of pity, which Parvis couldn't stand. But now that he was truly alone, with neither a human voice nor the automatic pulse of the radio beacon from Grail to guide him in this 
endless white waste, he felt not relief at being free, but the uneasiness of a man who, in a palace full of marvels, though he has not the least desire to leave, sees the main door before, open and inviting, now close behind him. He scolded himself for this unproductive frame of mind, akin to fear, and began to walk down to the surface of the sea of cloud, along a gradual incline, icy in places, directly toward the promontory. Black, reaching the sky, it was bent, like a finger beckoning. Once, twice, the sole plate of the strider slipped with a dull grinding sound, sending great numbers of stones rolling down, knocked from their ice settings, but these slips did not threaten a fall. Parvis merely changed his gait so as to fix each step into the frozen snow crust, using the spikes of his heels, which made him proceed more slowly than before. He descended a bulging slope between two gullies, stamping with stubborn exaggeration, until arcing sprays of ice rattled on his shin guards and knee shields. He strained his eyes to see into the valley, whose bottom now appeared through gaps in the mist, and the lower he went, the more the black finger of the promontory towered over him, rising above the distant, milky clouds. In this way, he reached the level of the fluffy fog that floated evenly and slowly as over unseen water. It flowed around his thighs, his hips. One puff of cloud enwrapped him and the cabin, but vanished as if blown away. For a few moments yet, the black finger loomed above the feathery whiteness, like a club of rock jutting out of an arctic sea, unmoved amid the foam and flows. But then it disappeared, as from the view of a diver submerging. He stopped, listened. He thought that he could hear an intermittent thin, high tone. Turning the digla now to the left, now to the right, he waited for the plaintive note, quite clear, to sound in both ears equally. This was not Grail itself, but the directional radio beacon of the promontory. He was supposed to head straight for it, and if he deviated from that path, the intermittent signal would split in two, depending on the deviation. Going too far to the right, in the perilous direction of the depression, he would hear in his right ear a warning squeal, and if he strayed the opposite way, toward the impassable sheer walls, the signal would sound in a less urgent but nevertheless error-indicating bass in the left ear. The odometer read a hundred miles. The greater, mechanically more difficult part of the trail was behind him. The more treacherous part lay before him, wrapped in depths of mist. Massive clouds now darkened overhead. The visibility was to several hundred meters, the aneroid barometer verified that the syncline trough of the depression began here, or, more precisely, its mercifully solid rim. He walked, using his eyes as well as his ears, since the region was brightened by snow, frozen carbon dioxide, of course, and the anhydrides of other solidified gases. Sometimes an erratic boulder protruded from their whiteness, the mark of a glacier that had once come from the north, packed itself into the rift of this volcanic massif, deepened it southward with its creeping body like a plow, and put into the ground ice great hunks of rock. Later, retreating or melting from the magma heat that came from deep within Titan, the glacier spat out and left behind a moraine scattered in a disorderly retreat. The landscape reversed itself, as if laying out a wintry day at the bottom and then covering it with a night of impenetrable clouds. Parvis did not even have his own shadow now for a companion. He stepped steadily, sinking into the snow his steel boots covered with the dust of tiny crystals, 
and in his wide-angle rear-view mirrors he could see his own tracks, tracks worthy of a tyrannosaur, that greatest of the biped predators of the Mesozoic. Glancing back, he checked that his trail was staying straight. For an indeterminate time, however, he had an odd feeling, an impression that grew in strength but which he dismissed as impossible, that he was not alone in the cabin, that behind his back there was another man. The presence of the man was given away by his breathing. Finally, the illusion made him so nervous he did not doubt that it was an illusion, caused, perhaps, by the fatigue of listening to the same monotonous radio signal, that he held his breath. The other gave a long, unmistakable sigh. This could not be an illusion. In his astonishment, Parvis tripped, making the Colossus stagger. He righted it in a blaze of indicators and a howl of turbines, and brought it gradually to a halt. The other stopped breathing. Was it, then, after all, an echo from the machine wells of the Digla? Standing still, he cast his eye around and noticed, on the endless beds of snow, a black mark, an exclamation point drawn in India ink on the white horizon. Though the illumination did not show whether the horizon was a bank of wind-blown drifts or a bank of clouds, even though he had never seen a strider from a mile away in such a winter setting, the conviction seized him that this was Pierce. He headed for him, not caring about the increasing division of the signal in his earphones. He hurried. The black mark, moving along the same wall of white, was a figure now, and it, too, swayed in walking quickly. After about fifteen minutes, its true proportions became evident. A half a mile separated them, perhaps a little more. Why didn't Parvis speak, call him on the transmitter? He didn't know why, but somehow didn't dare. Looking hard, he observed in the small glass window, the heart of the Colossus, an extremely tiny man who, suspended, moved like a puppet on strings. Parvis kept after him, and both left long plumes of powder behind them, like ships in a channel pulling foaming furrows after themselves. Parvis rushed to overtake him, at the same time noting what was happening ahead of them. And something was indeed happening, because in the distance a thick white blizzard fluttered and rippled. Its curving arc shone brighter than the snow. This was the region of the cold geysers. Parvis then called out once, twice, three times, but the one he chased, instead of answering, increased the pace, as if to flee his rescuer. So Parvis did the same, rushing with more and more swinging of the trunk and waving of the powerful arms toward the nearing peril. The speedometer pointed, quivering, at the red limit, forty-eight miles an hour. Parvis yelled, his voice hoarse, but the yell died on his lips, because suddenly the black figure widened, swelled, lengthened, and its contours lost their sharpness. It was not a man in a digla that he saw now, but a large shadow diffusing into an amorphous blotch, and then it was gone. He was alone. He had been chasing himself. Not a common phenomenon, but known even on Earth. The Brocken Spectre in the Alps, for example, one's own reflection enlarged against bright clouds. Not he. It was his body, shocked by the discovery, full of bitter disappointment, its muscles tight, breathless in a rush of rage and despair. It was his body that wanted to stop immediately that instant. And then, in the roar that burst from the bowels of the Colossus, he was pitched forward. The dials flared like severed veins spurting blood. 
The digla shook like a vessel striking its hull against an underwater barrier. The trunk tilted with the momentum, and if Parvis had not supported it, had not pulled it out of its forward plunge with a series of gradually breaking steps, it definitely would have crashed to the ground. The choral protest from the abruptly overburdened units quieted, feeling tears of disappointment and anger running down his flushed face. He stood on spread legs, panting, as if he had run the last kilometers himself. He calmed down. With the soft inner lining of his glove, he dabbed the sweat that hung on his eyebrows, and saw the giant paw of the strider, magnifying this involuntary gesture, lift, block the window of the cabin with the whole width of the forearm, and with a thud hit the radiator that was secured atop the headless shoulders. He had forgotten to disconnect the right hand from the amplifier circuit. This additional stupidity sobered him completely. He turned to retrace his steps, because the tones of the directional signals were now totally out of key. He would have to return to the trail, then stay on it as long as possible, and in the event of zero visibility due to a blizzard from the geyser region, he remembered its appearance during the chase, make use of the radiator. He came to the place where the Fata Morgana, with its trick mirror of clouds and gases, had disoriented him completely. Or possibly he had gone soft in the head sooner, when he suffered not the optical but the acoustical illusion and stopped comparing the route indicated by the beacon with the terrain map in his cabin. In the place to which his own phantom had led him, not that far from the designated path, nine miles in all, according to the odometer, there were no geysers shown on the map, their border ran farther north, judging by the last survey made. On the basis of flight reports and the radar pictures taken via the Patsat, Marlin had ordered that the route from Romden to Grail be changed to a roundabout southern course, so that it would run, inconveniently but safely, through a shallow of the depression which had never yet been inundated, though it was covered with snow from the geysers. The bed of this shallow might at worst become obstructed with drifts of dioxide snow, but a digla had sufficient power to wade through drifts five meters deep, and if it got stuck, it could radio and Grail would send unmanned bulldozers redirected from the mines. The problem was that no one knew exactly where the three striders vanished. On the old trail, Abandoned after previous disasters, the depression had permitted uninterrupted radio contact, but shortwave signals didn't reach the southern syncline directly, and one couldn't use reflection, since Titan possessed no ionosphere. It was necessary to employ relay satellites, but for a week now Saturn had interfered, drowning out with the tail of its stormy magnetosphere all emissions except lasers. Grail's lasers indeed could penetrate the cloud layers and thus reach the Patsats. The Patsats, however, not equipped with wave transformers over such a wide range, were unable to convert light impulses into radio. True, they could collimate the received flashes and send them into the depression, but that would be futile. In order to penetrate the geyser storms, it would be necessary to beam with an energy that would melt the satellite mirrors. Put into orbit when Grail was still in the setting-up stage, the mirrors had undergone slow corrosion. Clouding, they absorbed too much radiant energy, not reflecting it with 99% efficiency. Into this concatenation of oversight, poorly conceived economizing measures, haste, shipping delays, and ordinary foul-ups, typical of people everywhere, and therefore in space as well, went one unfortunate strider after the other. The solid ground of the southern shallow was supposed to have been a last resort. How solid it actually was, Parvis would soon find out. 
He had counted on coming across the trail of his predecessors, but quickly gave up that hope. He followed the azimuth, trusting it, because the terrain rose and led him away from the blizzard. To the left he saw slopes of old magma topped with clouds and swept clear of snow. He traversed these with caution. He walked through a quarry, across ice-filled gullies, but the ice contained bubbles of unfrozen gas. When once or twice the iron foot broke through the ice crust and sank into an empty space, the noise of the engines ceased, and his ears were filled with a rattling and snapping so loud it was like being aboard an icebreaker battering its way through polar ridges. Carefully, each time, he inspected the foot pulled from the hole before moving on. He labored in this way until the radio dialogue, keeping the same tone and pitch, began to stammer. The right gave a strangled whistle, and the left dropped to a bass. Parvis turned until the notes were equal. Then, before him, opened a wide passageway between high stacks of ice slabs, except that it wasn't ice, he knew, but congealed hydrocarbons. Down dry, coarse-grained scree he stepped, breaking as much as possible to contain the pull of the seventeen-hundred-ton strider on the incline. Volcanic walls among clouds opened into a view of a valley, where instead of firm ground he saw... Burnham Wood. Thousands of chasms at least spewed from narrow outlets, throwing into the poisonous atmosphere streams of ammonium salts. Ammonium radicals, kept in their free state by the tremendous pressure of the rocks, shot up into the dark sky, boiling, and turned it into churning chaos. He knew that this was not supposed to extend here, the experts said that it couldn't happen, but he was not thinking about the experts. He either had to return to Romden at once, or stay with the guiding song. An innocent song, though as false now as the sirens of Ulysses. Dirty yellow clouds moved slowly and heavily over the whole depression, to fall in strange, sticky, ropey snow that stiffened to form Burnham Wood. The name had been given it, because it traveled. It was not a wood, of course, and only from a great distance did it resemble a forest buried in snow. The furious play of chemical radicals, continually fed with new material because the different groups of geysers erupted, each with its own incessant rhythm, created a crusty porcelain jungle that attained heights of a quarter of a mile, the weak gravitation assisted its growth, so that there were tree-like formations and thickets of glassy white laid upon each other in successive layers, until finally the bottom could no longer support the endlessly climbing mass of lacy branchings, and collapsed with a slow, grating clatter, like a planetary china shop leveled in an earthquake. Someone, in fact, had casually dubbed these cave-ins of Burnham Wood China Quakes, a stunning spectacle, harmless only when viewed from the safety of a helicopter. From close up, this forest of Titan looked like a transitory construction, a thing of lace and white foam, and it seemed, therefore, that not only a strider, but even a man in a spacesuit could push his way through its frozen embroidery. But it was not that easy to penetrate the hardened froth lighter than pumice, a stuff between a snowy grease inflated as it froze and a lace spun from the thinnest china fibers. One could make slow progress, however, because the enormous bulk was actually a solidified cloud formed of spiderweb capillaries in every shade of white, from pearly opalescent to dazzling milky. It was possible to walk into the forest, yet one never knew when the section one was in would reach the limit of its strength and crumble— burying the traveler beneath a several-hundred-meter layer of pulverized enamel, 
which was light as fluff, only in a small spray. Even before, when he had got off the track, the forest, hidden then by the dark spur of the mountainside, had indicated its presence by the white glow from that direction, as if the sun were about to rise there. The glow was exactly like the spreading brightness in the clouds of the northern seas on earth, when a ship, sailing clear water, approached a field of ice. Parvis headed for the forest. The impression that he was standing on a ship, or that he himself was the ship, was strengthened by the rhythmic rocking of the giant that bore him. As he descended the steep slope, he ran his eye along the horizon, a bright line in the distance. The forest, seen from above, seemed a cloud flattened on the ground, a cloud whose entire surface unaccountably swelled and crawled. He walked, swaying, and the cloud before him grew like the headland of a continental glacier. Now he could make out long, twisted spits emerging from it, avalanches of snow moving in weird slow motion. When no more than a few hundred feet separated him from the snowy billows, he began to make out openings in them like the mouths of caves, with some smaller, like burrow holes. They gaped dark in the gleaming tangle of fluffy limbs and antler branches made of semi-opaque, off-white glass. Then a sharp, brittle rubble began to crunch underneath his iron boots. The doubled radio sound continued to assure him that he was going in the right direction. So he went, hearing over the heightened drum of the engines, which increased their RPM to overcome the growing resistance, the harsh screech of the thicket broken by his knees and torso. His initial nervousness now gone, he felt not a trace of fear. He felt despair, understanding only too well that it would take a miracle for him to hit upon any one of those lost. He would sooner find a needle, not in a haystack, in a mountain of hay. There could not be any footprints in this thicket, the continually shooting geysers replenished the cloud, so that every breach and break in it grew over quickly like a healing wound. He cursed the beauty surrounding him, possibly unique in all the world. Whoever had named it, from Macbeth, must have been an aesthetic soul, but Parvis in his digla was not interested in such associations now. The Burnham Wood of Titan for a combination of reasons known and unknown, alternately retreated and advanced within the depression across thousands, tens of thousands of its hectares. The geysers themselves were not too dangerous, since one became aware of their presence at a distance before actually seeing the skyward-spouting, vibrating columns of gases that were thickened from subterranean pressure. Their roar alone the terrifying thunder and whistling, as if the planet itself, in labor, were howling out of pain or rage, set the foundations in motion, and with the might of a cyclone, leveled all the trembling, cracking, tinkling glass thicket in the vicinity. It would take extraordinary bad luck to tumble into the vent of a geyser that was momentarily dead between eruptions but it was easy to keep a safe distance from those that announced their activity with a constant whistle, rumble, and the quivering of the surrounding underbrush, a white quivering that signaled doom. Unexpected explosions, however, explosions not even that close, were what most often caused the gigantic cave-ins. Parvis practically pressed his face to the reinforced window and looked, as he slowly, slowly placed footstep after footstep. He saw milk-white trunks of thick streams frozen vertically, and how higher up they branched into a flickering swirl, being dense and massive only at the bottom. And above the icy jungle of the ground level, there grew, in successive, increasingly airy stories, skeletal, web-like structures, cocoons, Nests, club moss, 
euglenas, gills, pulled from the bodies of fish but still pulsing, because everything, in a constant drizzle, crept and coiled. From clumps of snow there issued thin needle shoots, which joined into ganglia, sank, flowed, and again were covered over with a freezing, glutinous milk that dripped misted from unknown heights. No word in any terrestrial language could do justice to that artistry in the white, shadowless silence, the stillness beyond which one could hear a very distant, barely awakening mutter, evidence of the underground surge forced into the vents of the geysers. Stopping to listen, to tell the direction of this voice of disaster, he noticed that Burnham Wood had begun to absorb him into itself. It did not approach him like the forest in Macbeth, but came as if out of nowhere. From the air, which was completely still here, appeared microscopic flakes of snow. The snow did not fall. It formed on the dark plates of the armor, on the welds of the shoulder shields. Already his entire upper trunk was dusted with this snow, which lost its similarity to snow because it did not descend compliantly on the metal surfaces of the hull, did not collect loosely in its hollows, but adhered like a white syrup, sprouted, sent out milky threads, and before Parvis realized it, he had grown snowy fur all over. Thousands of fibers extending and catching the light covered him and changed the hull of the digla into an enormous white doll, an eccentric snowman. Then he made a small movement, a jerk, and frozen molds of his iron limbs, of his shin guards, fell away in huge pieces. But when they hit, they became piles of delicate slivers. Light from the shaky maze brought out phantasmagoric shapes and dazzled the eye, but it did not illuminate the ground. Only now did Parvis appreciate the advantage given him by the radiator. Its invisible heat melted a tunnel in the thicket, which he entered, hearing, now on the right, now on the left, echoes of streams of gas coming from the locked bed of the cloud like cannon blasts. At one point he passed the plume of a geyser, not far off, jerked by furious spurts that whipped its perimeter. Suddenly the snow forest thinned out, making a kind of clearing beneath an inflated bubble dome of branches. In the center lay a black giant, showing the bottoms of two iron feet together, and a torso turned on its side, resembling, in perspective, a ship beached. The left arm, on top, went between white trunks, its hand hidden in the undergrowth. The right was pinned to the ground beneath the body. The iron colossus lay twisted but not altogether conquered, because, except for the rime on its limbs, it was free of snow. The air wavered slightly over the bulge of the torso, heated by the warmth still inside. Parvis, transfixed before the twin strider, could not believe his eyes that the miracle had taken place, after all, of meeting. He was about to speak when two things simultaneously came to his attention. Under the fallen digla was a spreading puddle of yellowish oil, from broken hydraulic lines, which meant at least a partial paralysis. Moreover, the front window of the cabin, now so similar to the porthole of a ship, gaped, broken, and only strips of insulation hung from the frame. The opening, completely dark, gave off vapor, as though the giant, in its throes, had not quite parted with its last breath. The pilot's triumph, joy, thankful amazement, turned to horror. He knew, even before he bent carefully, slowly, over the wreck, that it was empty. His searchlight played across the interior, the wires hanging helter-skelter, the metallic skin draped over them. Unable to bend more, he peered with difficulty into the corners of the abandoned cabin. 
in the hope that the one shipwrecked, departing in his spacesuit, had left some message, some sign. But all Parvis found was an overturned toolbox and wrenches that had spilled from it. For a while, he tried to guess what had happened. The Digla could have been knocked down by a cave-in, and the operator, when his efforts to lift the machine out of the crushing rubble failed, could have disconnected the system of cutoffs limiting the power allowable. The lines might then have burst from the excessive oil pressure. The cabin window he had not broken himself. He could have got out by the thigh exit or through the escape hatch on the back. The glass had probably shattered in the cave-in when the strider fell. Originally lying flat, the strider had turned on its side in its struggle against the mass that bore down on it. The poisonous atmosphere entering the cabin would have killed the man more quickly than the cold. So the cave-in had not caught him unprepared. When the vaulted thicket began to press on the machine from above, the operator, seeing that it would not stop, managed to get into his spacesuit. Thus he gave up control of the digla, first having to remove the electronic skin. His digla possessed no high-temperature radiator, so he did the only thing that made sense, which spoke well for him. He took tools, crawled into the engine room, and, discovering that he would not be able to fix the hydraulics since too many of the pipes were cracked and the leakage also was too great, disconnected the whole transmission from the reactor and turned the reactor up all the way. The strider, he knew, was lost, but the heat from the nuclear pile, although it would burn through the power plant, or rather precisely for that reason, would be emitted through the red-hot hull and thereby melt the mountain of debris, which created this domed cavern, the glassy walls bearing witness to the temperature produced by the wreck. Parvis tested his reconstruction of events, holding a Geiger close to the back of the hulk. Immediately the Geiger chattered. The pile had melted under its own heat and cooled, but the outer hull remained hot and radioactive. The operator left his vehicle then through the broken window, dropped the useless tools, and went into the forest on foot. Parvis looked for prints in the spilled oil. Finding none, he circled the metal corpse, looking for openings in the wall of the gleaming cave large enough to let a man pass. There were none. Parvis could not calculate in his head how much time might have elapsed since the disaster. Two people disappeared in the forest three days ago, and Pierks twenty to thirty hours later. The difference in time was too small to provide any basis for determining whether the wreck belonged to one of the operators from Grail or to Pierks. He stood, alive in iron over the lifeless iron, and coldly deliberated what to do next. In some recess of this melted bubble, there had to be a passage used by the operator, but it had sealed over after he left. The porcelain seam should be very thin. From the digla, Parvis would not see it. He turned off the digla, changed as quickly as he could into his spacesuit, ran clanking down the stairs to the thigh hatch, slid down the ladder onto the foot, and jumped to the glassy ground. The melted-out cave immediately seemed much larger to him, or, rather, it was as if he had suddenly shrunk. He walked, or, rather, it was as if he had suddenly shrunk. He walked around it, almost six hundred steps. He brought his helmet near the more transparent places and tapped. Unfortunately, there were many of them. Using a hammer taken from the control room, he tapped on a hollow between two truly oak-like columns. It shattered like glass, and at the same time pieces of the dome began to rain on him. The rubble trickled. Then there was a cracking and a real burst of hail. Small chunks, bits of glass, came down on him. He realized then that this was pointless. He would not find any trail of the man, and was in something of a tight spot himself. 
The breach through which he had entered this melted cave had already been closed with white icicles, icicles already like stout pillars of salt, but not earthly salt, because it grew in interwoven strands, each thicker than an arm. Nothing could be done. Nor was there time to think carefully, because the dome was sinking, was now almost touching the radiator on the shoulders of his strider, as if the strider were an atlas bearing the entire weight of the upward congealed jets of the geysers. He did not remember how he got back in the cabin, which tilted slightly now, as the trunk was pushed millimeter by millimeter, or how he pulled on the electronic suit. For a moment he considered whether or not to turn on the radiator. Every action here contained unforeseeable risk. The remelted ceiling could just as easily collapse as yield. He found a little space, several steps around the black wreck, which he could use to build momentum, and with full force rammed the frozen-over breach, not in shameful retreat, but to get out of this tomb of glass. And then he would see. The engine room resounded with the turbines. The drip formed, swollen white of the wall, cracked, struck by two steel hands. The dark crack spread star-like upward and to the sides, and simultaneously thunder roared from every direction. What happened happened too quickly for him to follow it. He felt a blow from above, so tremendous that the giant encompassing him gave a single bass groan, reeled, went flying through the broken breach as through a sheet of paper, and crashed under an avalanche of chunks, shards, and dust with such violence into the ground that in spite of all the suspension shock absorbers, Parvis felt his innards driven straight into his throat. At the same time, the final stage of the collapse was uncannily slow. The debris, filling up the way that he had come, drew nearer, visible in the window, as if he had not fallen at all, but the snowy, smooth surface, bombarded by a hail of rubble, had reared up vertically before him. From the many storied heights the hail struck the whiteness that was wrapped in clouds of swirling dust, and then through all the girders of the hull, the howling engines, their mountings, the plates of armor, there sounded, claiming him, a final thunderclap. He lay sightless. The window had not been broken, but was buried in a heap of debris, whose real mass he felt on himself, on the back of the digla. The turbines howled not under him now, but behind him, idling because at the height of the strain they had thrown themselves into neutral. Against the coal-black window, all the indicators glowed. The ones on the right slowly paled, grayed, went to willow-green, but those on the left winked out, one after another, like cooling embers. He lay in a wreck that was paralyzed on the left side. To movements of his left arm and leg, there was no response. Only the outline of the right half of the strider shone. Inhaling spasmodically, he smelled hot oil in the air. It had happened. Could he at least crawl with the half-paralyzed Digla? He tried. At first the turbines obediently sang in unison, but then the warnings again flared in purple. The cave-in had thrown him not completely forward, but port side first, and when he fell, that side took the brunt of the impact. Breathing deeply, with deliberate slowness, he turned on the interior light and checked the strider's damage interoceptor to learn the position of the limbs and trunk, disregarding the drive units. In cold outline, the picture showed immediately. The steel legs were caught together. They were crossed. The left knee joint was snapped. The left foot lay behind the right, but he could not move the right either. 
Projecting structures must have caught each other, and the force of the cave-in did the rest. The smell of hot hydraulic fluid, obtrusive now, irritated his nostrils, burned them. One more time he struggled, switching the whole system of oil lines to a much weaker backup circuit. In vain, something warm and slippery was flowing softly across his feet, shins, thighs. In the white light of the fluorescent lamp above his head, as he lay on the window, he saw the oil leaking into the cabin. There was no alternative. He opened the zipper, slipped out of the electronic tights, kneeled naked to open the locker in the wall that was now the ceiling, and grunted when the spacesuit fell on him. The oxygen cylinders struck him in the chest, and the helmet, like a white sphere, rolled into a pool of oil. His clothes were soaked with the hydraulic fluid. Without hesitation, naked, in the calm, artificial light, he climbed into the suit, wiped the base of the helmet because it, too, had oil on it, put it on, closed the fasteners, and on all fours crawled down the well, now horizontal like a tunnel, to the thigh hatch. Neither the regular door nor the emergency door could be opened. It is not known how long he sat afterward in the cabin before he removed his helmet and, lying down on the oil-smeared window, raised a hand to the tiny red light to break the plastic bubble case and push with all his strength into the unknown future, pressing the recessed button of the vitrifax. Nor can it be known what he thought and what he felt, preparing himself for an icy death. Chapter 2 The Council Dr. Gerbert sat at a wide-open window. Stretched out comfortably, with a fluffy blanket tucked around his legs, he was looking through a folio-bound packet of tissue culture photographs. Though it was bright outside, the room was dim. The smoke-black ceiling, with crossed, thick, resin-saturated beams, contributed to the dimness. The floor was parqueted with squares of wood, and the walls were made of rough-hewn logs. Through the windows, one could see the forested slopes of the Cloud Hunter. Farther on, the massif that was Krakatalk and the sheer cliff of the highest of all the peaks, which resembled a buffalo with a broken horn, the formation that the Indians had called, for centuries, the Heaven Stone. Above the valley, which was gray with boulders, rose vast mountainsides, gleaming with ice in the shadows. Through the northern pass showed the azure of the plains. In that tremendous distance the sky contained a thin wisp of smoke, the sign of an active volcano. Dr. Gerbert compared the different plates and on some of them made marks with a ballpoint pen. Not the slightest sound reached him. The candle flames stood motionless in the cold air. Their light grotesquely lengthened the contours of the furniture that was carved in the ancient Indian fashion. The large armchair in the shape of a human jaw threw its macabre shadow across the ceiling, toothed arms ending in curved canines. Over the fireplace grinned eyeless masks made of wood, and the little table near Dr. Gerbert stood upon a coiled snake whose head rested upon the carpet, eye sockets glittering. Semi-precious stones shone red in them there was the sound of a distant bell. Dr. Gerbert put aside the films that he was studying and got up. The room changed in the blink of an eye. It became a large dining room. The table in the center was not covered by a cloth. The silver and the jasper green of the dishes gleamed on black planks. Through the open door rolled a wheelchair. In it, sat a corpulent man with a fleshy face and a nose so small it was practically lost between his cheeks. He wore a leather tunic. 
He nodded amiably at Dr. Gerbert, who took a seat at the table. At the same time, a woman entered, thin as a rail. She had black hair with a strip of gray down the middle. Opposite Dr. Gerbert appeared a heavy, short gentleman with an apoplectic face. When the servant, in cherry-red livery, had served the first course, a gray man with a cleft chin entered like someone late. Stopping at the massive stone fireplace between the sideboards, he warmed his hands over the fire before taking a seat in the place indicated by the host in the wheelchair. Your brother isn't back yet from his trip? asked the gaunt woman. No doubt he's sitting on the tooth of Mazumik and looking in our direction, replied the host, who had moved into the gap left for him between the chairs. He ate quickly, with appetite. Aside from this exchange, the dinner passed in silence. When the servant had filled the last mugs of coffee, whose aroma mingled with the sweetish smoke of the cigars, the gaunt woman again spoke. Mr. Vantaneda, you must continue for us today the story about the Eye of Mazumak. Yes, yes, everyone urged. Mondian Vantaneda complacently folded his fingers on his large belly. Then he shot a look around the table, as if closing the circle of his listeners. A dying log crackled in the fireplace. Someone put down his fork. A spoon clattered, and everything was still. But where did I leave off? Don Esteban and Don Guillermo, learning of the legend of Cratapulc, departed for the mountains to reach the valley of the Seven Red Lakes. All throughout their journey, Mr. Vantaneda began, making himself comfortable in his wheelchair, the two Spaniards met no man or beast. Only now and then they heard the cries of coasting eagles and occasionally a vulture flew overhead. After much exertion, they gained the ridge of the dead hand. They saw then, before them, a high arete, like the back of a rearing horse, the misshapen head hanging into space. The crest, sharp like a horse's neck, was covered with mist. Then, Don Esteban remembered the peculiar words of the old Indian from the lowlands. Beware the mane of the black stallion. The two debated whether or not to push on. Don Guillermo, as you recall, had a sketch of the mountain chain tattooed on his forearm. Their supplies had run out, though they had traveled only six days. So they ate what remained of the salted, dried rope meat and quenched their thirst at the spring that bubbled beneath the severed head. But they could not get their bearings in this region. The tattooed map was incomplete. Toward sunset the mist began to rise like a swelling sea. They proceeded up, ascending the back of the horse, but although they hurried until the blood rang in their ears and they were fighting for breath like expiring animals, the mist moved more quickly and caught them on the very neck of the horse. In the place where its white shroud enveloped them, the ridge had narrowed to no wider than the handle of a machete. Thus, unable to walk, they sat astride the ridge exactly as one sits upon a horse. Surrounded on all sides by the impenetrable, damp white, they continued forward until darkness fell. When they had no more strength, the ridge came to an end. They did not know whether this was the sheer drop of a precipice or the way down to the valley of the seven red lakes of which the old Indian had told them. So they sat the entire night, supporting each other by leaning back to back, warming themselves with their own body heat, and resisting the night wind that whistled across the ridge like a knife 
wetted on a stone. If they dozed off, they might fall into the abyss, so they did not close their eyes for seven hours. Then the sun rose and dispersed the vapors. They saw that the rock beneath their feet fell away, as perpendicular as if they had been sitting atop a wall. Before them gaped an eight-foot breach. The mist tore into shreds against the neck of the horse. They recognized then, in the distance, the dark head of Mazumak, and saw columns of red smoke mingled with white clouds rushing upward. Bloodying their hands, they scrambled down a narrow ravine and reached the topmost pothole of the Valley of the Seven Red Lakes. Here, however, Don Guillermo's strength completely failed him. Don Esteban went first onto the ledge that hung over the abyss and led his comrade by the hand. They proceeded until they came upon a pile of stones where they could rest. The sun was high, and the head of Mazumak began to spit bits of rock at them, chips from the overhangs. So they fled down. When the horse's head above them had grown as small as a child's fist, they saw the first red spring in a cloud of ruddy foam. Then Don Esteban took from his breast pocket a bundle of thongs tanned the color of acanthus wood, the fringes of which, painted red, were twisted into numerous knots. He ran his fingers over these, reading the Indian writing, until, finally, he guessed the correct way. Before them opened the Valley of Silence. They crossed it on enormous boulders. The crevices between the boulders were bottomless. Are we near? asked Don Guillermo in a whisper, for his throat was parched. Don Esteban made a sign for silence. At one point Don Guillermo stumbled and kicked a small stone, which set others in motion. In response to this sound, the vertical walls of the Valley of Silence began to smoke. A silver cloud covered them, and a thousand clubs of limestone hurtled down. Don Esteban, who just then was passing beneath an arched structure, pulled his friend into that shelter as the crushing avalanche reached them and rushed past like a storm. In a minute, all was silent again. Don Guillermo's head was bleeding from a flying chip of rock. His comrade took off his shirt, tore it into strips, and bound the wound. At last, when the valley became so narrow that the sky above them was no wider than a river, they saw a stream that flowed over rocks without the least sound. Its water, bright as a polished diamond, fell into an underground channel. Now they had to wade knee-deep into the swift, icy current, it undercut their legs with cruel force. Soon, however, the water turned to the side, and they stood on dry yellow sand in front of a cavern with many windows. Don Guillermo bent over, weak, and noticed how curiously the sand gleamed. The handful that he raised to his eyes was uncommonly heavy. He brought it to his mouth and chewed the stuff that filled his palm. He realized that it was gold. Don Esteban remembered the words of the Indian and looked about the grotto. In one corner blazed an upright, frozen, completely motionless flame. This was a block of crystal polished by the water, and above it was an opening in the rock. 
the sky shone through. He approached the translucent block and looked into its depths. In shape, it resembled a huge coffin driven into the ground. At first he saw within it only millions of glimmering lights, a bewildering whirl of silver. Then it seemed that everything around him grew dark, and he beheld great sheets of birch bark parting. When these vanished, he saw that at the very center of the block of ice, someone was watching him. It was a copper face, full of sharp wrinkles, the eyes narrow like blades. The more it watched, the more evil grew its smile. Cursing, he struck the rock with his dagger, but the point glanced off harmlessly. At the same time, the copper face and its twisted smile disappeared. Because Don Guillermo seemed feverish, his comrade kept the secret of the vision to himself. They moved on. The grotto spread into a network of corridors. They took the widest after lighting the torches they had brought. At one point, a side corridor opened like a black well in the gallery floor. Air, hot as fire, blew from it. They had to jump across. Farther on, the passageway constricted its throat. For a while they went on all fours, then came to a place so narrow that they had to crawl. Then, suddenly, the passage widened. They could kneel. When the last torch burned low, the ground began to grate underfoot. By the torch's small remaining light, they saw that they knelt on gravel made of pure gold. Still, they were not satisfied. Having found the mouth of Mazumik and its eye, they wished to see also its gut. Suddenly, Don Esteban whispered to his comrade that he saw something. Don Guillermo peered over Don Esteban's shoulder in vain. What do you see? he asked. The end of the smoldering brand was already burning Don Esteban's fingers. He stood. The walls were gone. There was only a great darkness in which the torchlight made a reddish grotto. Don Guillermo saw his friend step forward, and the flame wavered, casting enormous shadows. Then, from the darkness, came a giant spectral face suspended in the air, its eyes directed downward. Don Esteban cried out. It was a terrible cry. But Don Guillermo understood the words. His comrade invoked Jesus and his mother. A man like Don Esteban used such words only when face to face with death. As the scream resounded, Don Guillermo covered his face with his hands. Then there was thunder. Fire engulfed him and he lost consciousness. Mondi and Vantaneda leaned back and gazed silently at his guests. He was dark against the background of the window. The sky, cut by the sawtooth silhouette of the mountains, turned purple in the gathering dusk. In the Arakirita, upstream... Indians hunting stags fished out a white man who had around his shoulders an air-filled buffalo skin. The back was cut open and the ribs broken and spread out like wings. The Indians, fearing the troops of Cortés, tried to burn the body, but the cavalry of Ponteron, called the One-Eyed, chanced to stop at their settlement. The corpse was taken to the camp, 
and Don Guillermo was recognized. Don Esteban never returned. But then how is this whole story known? The voice was discordant, jarring. The servant entered with a candelabrum. The light of its flickering flames revealed the face of the questioner, lemon-colored, with bloodless lips. Mr. Vantaneda smiled politely. I gave you at the beginning the tale of the old Indian. He said that Mazumak saw everything with his eye. The Indian expressed himself somewhat mythologically, perhaps, but in essence he was right. This was the beginning of the sixteenth century, and few Europeans knew about the possibility of amplifying the power of sight through lenses. Two giant mountain crystals, whether created by the forces of nature or fashioned by the hand of man, it is not known, were situated in the head of Mazumak and in the grotto of the gut in such a way that, looking into one of them, one saw everything near the other. An unusual periscope, made by two shining prisms, separated by a distance of thirty kilometers. The Indian, who stood at the summit of the head, saw both trespassers sacrilegiously enter the gut of Mazumak, and possibly he not only saw, but was able to affect their destruction. Mr. Vantaneda made a quick movement with his hand. On the table, into the circle of orange light, fell a bundle of thongs tied into a thick knot at one end. The faded hide was marked with deep incisions. The thing rustled as it fell. It was so old and dry. So there was someone, concluded Mr. Vantaneda, who observed the expedition and left an account of it. Then you know the way to the Cave of Gold? Mr. Vantaneda's smile grew more and more wooden, as if, along with the vanishing peaks in the window, it was receding into the silent, icy mountain night. This house stands at the very entrance to the mouth of Mazumak. When a word was spoken in the mouth, the valley of silence repeated it with mighty thunder. It was a natural stone loudspeaker, a thousand times more powerful than an electric one. How? Ages ago, lightning struck a flat, smooth slab and melted it into a mass of quartz. The Valley of Silence is the same valley that our windows overlook. Don Esteban and Don Guillermo came from the direction of the Gate of Winds, but the red springs have long since dried up, and a voice will not bring down stones. Apparently the valley was a resonator, and certain frequencies of sound loosened the limestone pinnacles. The cave was closed by an earth tremor. There was a hanging rock there, which, like a wedge, held apart two walls of stone. The tremor knocked it from its place, and the walls closed forever. As to what occurred afterward, when the Spaniards attempted to force their way through the pass, and who set off the avalanche of stones on the column of Cortez's foot soldiers, we do not know, and I do not think that we ever will. But, my dear Mr. Vantaneda, walls of rock can be blown up, penetrated with machines, and water can be pumped out of caves, no? said the squat gentleman at the end of the table. He lit a thin cigar with a straw. You think so? Mr. Vantaneda did not hide his irony. There is no force that can open the mouth of Mazumak if he does not wish it, he said, 
pushing himself suddenly away from the table. A gust extinguished two candles. The others burned with a blue flame, and flakes of ash fluttered above them like small moths. He thrust his hairy hand before their faces, grabbed the bundle of thongs from the table, and spun his wheelchair around with such force that the rubber of the tires squealed. The guests rose and began to leave. Dr. Gerbert sat bemused, staring at the dancing flame of a candle. From the open window came an ice-cold current of air. He shuddered, chilled, and turned to look at the servant, who was carrying in and setting down an armful of heavy logs in front of the burnt blue grate of the fireplace. Skillfully the servant scattered the embers and was building over them an ingenious roof of firewood when someone opened another door and touched the wall. The whole interior again was transformed in an instant. The fireplace of rough stones, the servant at the hearth, the chairs with sculptured armrests, the candlesticks, candles, windows, and the mountain night beyond them all vanished in an even, diffused light. The wide table with the place settings also vanished, and in a white, small room, under an oval, concave, smooth ceiling, only Dr. Gerbert remained, in a single chair, before a square surface that held his plate and a half-eaten joint of meat. This was all that survived of the table. "'Amusing yourself? Now? With old cock-and-bull stories?' asked the newcomer, who, switching off the scene with some difficulty, removed the inflated, transparent wrap that covered his fluffy jumpsuit buttoned to the neck. Finally, he tore the wrap, with difficulty pulled it down off his boots that shone like metal, threw it away, crumpled, and ran a thumb down his chest, at which the suit opened wide. He was younger than Gerbert, shorter, his bare neck muscular above the collarless shirt. It's only one. We agreed to meet at two, and the histology I know by heart. Dr. Gerbert lifted the packet as if a little embarrassed. The other man unfastened the thick tops of his boots, shuffled over to the metal molding strip that ran along the wall, and rapidly, as if dealing cards, summoned up in sequence the holographic images of the dinner party, running backward. Of a plain with a group of steep limestone pinnacles white in the moonlight, like the ghastly skeleton of a bat, of a sunny jungle with the colorful fluttering of butterflies among lianas, and finally of a sandy waste with high termite mounds. Each scene appeared on all sides at once, surrounded them, and disappeared, shifting into the next. Gerbert waited patiently for his colleague to tire of this inspection. Amid the flickering play of light and color, with the folder of tissue culture photographs in his hand, he was now far in his thoughts from the show, which he had used, perhaps, to take his mind off what troubled him. Has any change taken place? he asked at last. His younger colleague returned the room to its original austerity, and, growing serious, muttered, not that distinctly, No, nothing's different. It's just that Arago asked me if we would drop in on him before the council. Gerbert winced, as at an unpleasant surprise. And what did you say? That we'd come. Why are you making a face? You don't like paying him a visit? I'm not thrilled. You couldn't refuse, that's clear. But even without adding theology to this, we have a hell of a problem on our hands. What does he want from us? Did he say anything? Nothing. The man's decent, and wise, too, and discreet. Discreetly, he'll tell us that we're cannibals. Nonsense. It's not as if we're on trial. We took them on board to revive them. He knows that. And about the blood, too? I have no idea. What's so awful about the blood? They've been doing transfusions for hundreds of years. In his eyes, it won't be a transfusion, but a profanation of mortal remains. At the very least... Body snatching. Bodies that nothing can help now. Transplanting, too, is as old as the hills. The religions... I'm no expert on the subject, but in any case, his church hasn't opposed it. Why these sudden pangs of conscience before a priest, a monk? The commander agrees, and the majority, if not everyone. Arago doesn't even have a vote. 
He's with us as some kind of Vatican observer or apostolic delegate, a passenger spectator. Fine, Victor, but the slides were a nasty surprise. We shouldn't have taken the bodies on board the Eurydice. I was against it. Why weren't they shipped to Earth? You know why. It worked out that way. Besides, as I pointed out, if anyone had a right to our voyage, they did. A lot of good it will do them, since at best we can restore only one, at the cost of the others. Victor Davis regarded Gerbert with large eyes. What's eating you? Is this our fault? The conditions on Titan wouldn't allow diagnoses. True or false? Well, speak. I'd like to know just who I'm going to that Dominican with. Have you returned to the faith of your forefathers? In the thing we have to do, what we have to request, you see something evil? A sin? Dr. Gerbert, calm until now, fought down a burst of anger. You know perfectly well that I will request the same thing as you and the head physician. You know my views. Resurrection is no evil. The evil lies in the fact that out of two men fit for reanimation, we can bring only one back to life, and that no one will make the choice for us. But we're wasting time. Let's go. I want to get this over with. I have to change. Will you wait? No, I'll go myself. Come when you're ready. Which deck? The third, in the middle section. I'll be there in five minutes. They left together but got into different elevators. Gerbert touched the appropriate numbers and sped off in an oval, silver interior. When the egg-shaped vehicle came to a gentle stop, the curved wall opened in a spiral, like a camera iris. Facing him, in light that had no source, ran rows of concave doors with high thresholds, as on an old-fashioned ship. He found the door with the number 84 and a small nameplate, R.P. Arago, D.A. While he was wondering, stupidly, what the D.A. stood for, Dr. Angelicus, District Attorney, the door parted. He entered a spacious cabin lined on all sides with glass-covered shelves of books. On two opposite walls were paintings in bright frames, reaching from ceiling to floor. On the right was Cranach's Tree of Knowledge, with Adam, the Snake, and Eve. On the left, The Temptation of St. Anthony by Bosch. Before he got a good look at the monsters floating in the sky of the temptation, the Cranach was sucked in behind a bookcase, leaving an opening in which Arago appeared in a white frock. Before the painting returned to its place as a door behind the Dominican, the physician got a glimpse of a black cross on a field of white. They greeted each other with a handshake and sat down at a low table piled chaotically with papers, graphs, and a multitude of open volumes that had colored ribbon bookmarks. Arago's face was lean, dusky, with gray, piercing eyes beneath brows that were almost white. The frock seemed too big for him. With the sinewy hands of a pianist, he held an ordinary wooden yardstick. Gerbert found himself running his eyes over the backs of the old books. He did not want to be the first to speak. The questions that he expected did not come. Dr. Gerbert, I am not your equal in knowledge. I can, however, converse with you in the language of Aesculapius. I was a psychiatrist before I chose this garb. The head physician made accessible to me the data concerning the... procedure... It speaks for itself. Due to the incompatibility of the blood groups of the tissues, two people are at stake, but only one can be awakened. Not awakened, Gerbert said, almost against his will, because the monk had avoided the more direct words, resurrected from the dead. The Dominican caught this at once. Distinctions important to me, of course, you cannot take into account. Any dispute on eschatology would be pointless. Someone like me, in my position, would say that true death means disintegration when irreversible changes have taken place in the body, and that we have seven such on the ship. I know that their remains must be disturbed and understand the necessity, though I am not permitted to sanction it. 
From you, Doctor, and from your friend, who will be here any moment, I would like an answer to one question only. You can refuse, of course. Go ahead, said Gerbert, feeling a shiver. You must have guessed. It concerns the criteria for the selection. Davis will say the same thing. We possess no objective criteria, and you too, having seen the data, know this, Father Arago. I do. The calculation of the chances is beyond human ability. The medicoms, performing their X billion operations, give two out of the nine men a ninety-nine percent chance, with a deviation within the bounds of theoretical error. For either alternative, there are no objective criteria, and for that very reason I take the liberty of asking you what yours will be. There are two matters before us, replied Gerbert with a kind of relief. As physicians, along with the head physician, we will be asking the commander for certain navigational changes. May we assume, father, that in this you will be on our side? I cannot participate in the voting. True, but a position taken by you may have influence on what the council decides, but it is already decided. I cannot imagine that there would be any opposition. The majority has declared itself pro. The commander has the resolution in hand, and I would be surprised if the doctors did not know what it was. We are asking for more changes than were first agreed upon. Ninety-nine percent is not enough for us. Even the tenth decimal place is important. The energy cost, along with the delay in the expedition, will be enormous. This is news to me. And the second matter? The selection of the corpse. We are at a complete loss as to identity, since gross negligence, to which the radio technicians have given the more elegant designation of communication channel overload, has made it impossible for us to determine the names, functions, or histories of these people. In reality, something more than negligence was going on. When we took these containers on board, we were not aware that the memory not only of the old units of that mine, Grail, but of the digital machines at Romden, too, had suffered considerable destruction in the course of the dismantling operations. The persons responsible for the fate of those that our commander, with our consent, took on board, said that the facts could be obtained from Earth, but it is not known who gave the orders for information storage, or when, or to whom. It's evident that everyone, so to speak, washed his hands. That happens whenever the jurisdictions of people overlap, which is no justification. The monk stopped, looked Gerbert in the eye, and said softly, You were opposed to having the victims on the ship? Gerbert nodded reluctantly. In the excitement before takeoff, no single voice, let alone that of a doctor, not an expert astronaut, could carry any weight. If I was opposed and entertained certain fears, I am not any easier in my mind now. But then, what do you intend to go by? A flip of a coin? Gerbert stiffened. The choice will not depend on anyone but us. After the Council, if our requests are met in the purely technological area of navigation, we will conduct a new autopsy and go through the entire contents of the vitrifaxes down to the last hair. What influence on your choice of the one to be reanimated could his identification have? Probably none. It would not be, in any case, a quality, a factor of any significance in the domain of medicine. These people... The monk weighed his words carefully, speaking slowly, as if venturing out on thinner and thinner ice, perished in tragic circumstances, some while performing their ordinary duties as employees of the mines there or of the companies, others when attempting to rescue the former. Would you accept such a distinction, if it could be discovered, as a criterion? No. The answer was immediate and categorical. The wall of books facing them parted, and Davis entered with an apology for being late. The monk rose. So did Gerbert. I have learned everything that it was possible to learn, said Arago. He stood taller than both physicians. Behind his back, 
Eve turned to Adam, and the serpent crawled up the tree of Eden. I thank you, gentlemen. I have confirmed what I should have known anyway. Our fields touch. We do not pass judgment on a man according to his virtues and vices, just as you do not consider these when you save his life. I won't detain you. It's time now. See you at the council. They left. In a few words, Gerbert gave to Davis the gist of his conversation with the apostolic observer. At a perfectly circular intersection of corridors, they got into an egg-shaped, dull silver vehicle. The appropriate well opened up and swallowed the wheelless car with a long sigh. In the circular windows, lights from the passing decks flashed by. Sitting opposite each other, they said nothing. Both, without knowing why, were offended by the statement with which the monk had summed up their meeting. The feeling, however, was too undefined to merit examination in the face of what awaited them. The conference hall was located in the fifth section of the Eurydice. The ship, seen in flight from a distance, resembled a long white grub with spherically bulging segments, and it was a winged grub, since flat fins protruded from its sides, ending in the hulls of the hydro turbines. The head of the Eurydice, flattened out, was encircled by a multitude of antenna spines like feelers or stingers. The spherical sections, joined by short cylinders having a diameter of thirty meters, were also locked together and reinforced by a double inner keel whenever the cosmic vessel accelerated, went full speed, or braked. The engines, called hydroturbines, were actually thermonuclear reactors of the flow stream type, and hydrogen in high vacuum served as their fuel. This drive proved even better than the photon drive. The performance of nuclear fuels at near light speeds fell because the lion's share of the kinetic energy was expended in the propelling flame that beat uselessly into space, and only a small fraction of the liberated power was transmitted to the rocket. A photon drive, also, required the ship to be loaded with millions of tons of matter and antimatter as its annihilative fuel. The flow stream engines, on the other hand, used interstellar hydrogen. Hydrogen atoms, though ubiquitous, were so dispersed in galactic space that the engines of this type began to work effectively only at speeds above 30,000 kilometers a second and reached full capacity only when approaching the speed of light. A ship with such a drive could therefore neither take off from a planet itself, being too massive, nor by itself achieve the velocity at which the atoms falling into the intakes of the reactors condensed sufficiently for ignition. The gaping intake funnels then hurtled forward so that even the greatest cosmic vacuum, thus rammed, packed enough hydrogen into their throats to kindle artificial spouts of sun in the firing chambers. The efficiency factor increased, and the ship, not laden with its own supply of fuel, could maintain a constant acceleration. After less than a year of an acceleration corresponding to Earth's gravity, the ship attained nearly 99% of the speed of light, and while minutes went by on board, decades passed on Earth. The Eurydice had been built in orbit around Titan, for Titan was to serve as her starting platform. Many trillions of tons of the mass of that moon were converted by conventional thermonuclear piles into energy for the transformers, and they, in turn, as laser throwers, sent columns of coherent light into the gigantic stern of the Eurydice, like packing gunpowder into the bottom of a cannon beneath an artillery shell. The moon first had to be stripped by astroengineering of its thick atmosphere. Radiochemical plants and hydronuclear power stations were built on the plateau of the equatorial continent after all the mountains were melted down by combined heat blasts from disposable satellites. Their salvos turned the great formations into lava, and cryoballistic bombs hastened the freezing to make the red-hot flowing sea a hard, smooth plain, the artificial Mare Herculaneum. On the 12,000 square miles of that plain grew a forest of laser throwers, 
the true Hercules of the expedition. At the critical hour it fired to push the Eurydice from her stationary orbit. The long column of coherent light drove the ship, hitting the mirrors at her stern, beyond the solar system. As the driving beam weakened, the ship increasingly resorted to her own boosters, jettisoning their burnt-out casings beyond Pluto. It was only then that the wide-gaping hydros came into play. Because they would be running throughout the journey, the ship accelerated steadily, maintaining on board a pull equal to Earth's gravitation. The pull acted only along the ship's longitudinal axis. For this reason, each spherical section of the Eurydice was a separate unit. Her decks went transversely in the hull, from side to side. Up meant toward the bow, and down was astern. When the whole vessel braked or changed course, the vector of the force diverged from the axes of the individual sections. Therefore, to avoid having ceilings turn into walls and decks become upended, each segment of the hull contained within itself a sphere capable of rotating inside the armored shell, much like a ball and socket joint. The gyrostats saw to it that on the decks of each sphere of the hull, there were eight in all for living quarters, the force of the thrust would always come vertically. Although during maneuvers of this type the decks of the separate spheres diverged from the main axis of the ship's keel, one could still pass from section to section. There was a tunnel system of additional locks called worms. It was only in these flexible tunnels that one experienced a change or lack of gravity, since the elevator ran through the cylinders between the sections. At the time of this general council, the first after takeoff, the Eurydice had almost a year of continuous acceleration before her, thus there was nothing to interfere with her steady thrust. The fifth section, called the Parliament, served for the meetings of the entire crew. Beneath a curved ceiling lay an amphitheater, not too high, a room surrounded by four tiers of seats that were divided at regular intervals by ramps. By the only flat wall was a long table, actually a line of connected consoles with screens. Behind this, facing the assembly, sat the navigators and their subordinate specialists. The uniqueness of the expedition called for the unusual makeup of the command. Tur Harab was in charge of flight. The coordinator Yusupov, power. The radio physicist DeWitt, communications. And at the head of the Corps of Scientists, both of those needed in the journey itself and those who would be going into action only at its destination, stood the polystorian Jenkins. When Gerbert and Davis entered the upper gallery, the deliberations had already begun. Tur Harab was reading aloud the requests of the physicians. No one turned to look at the latecomers. Only the head physician, Varadian, seated between the commander and the coordinator, indicated his reproof with a knitted brow. But they had not missed much. In the silence, the impassive voice of Tur Harab came from all sides. They are asking for a reduction in thrust to one-tenth. They consider this necessary for the reanimation of the remains that are in cold storage. It means throttling the drive down to the lower limit. I can do this. But then the whole flight program, with all its prepared computations, will be cancelled. It is possible to make a new program. The old one was the product of five independent groups in the project on Earth, to rule out the possibility of errors. Five is beyond our means. We can make a new program with two teams, but it will not be as dependable as the first. The risk is small, but real. So I ask you, shall we vote now on the physician's request without further discussion, or instead put questions to them? The majority were in favor of discussion. Varadian did not take the floor himself, but called on Gerbert. Behind the words of our commander lies a criticism, said Gerbert, not rising from his place in the highest row of chairs. The criticism is directed at those who handed over to us, with no concern for their condition, the bodies found on Titan. 
One could conduct an investigation into this matter to learn who the culprits were. Whether or not they are among us, however, does not change the situation. The task facing us is the complete resurrection of a man preserved little better than the mummies of the pharaohs. Here I must go into the history of medicine. Attempts at vitrefaction date back to the twentieth century. Doddering old millionaires had themselves interred in liquid nitrogen in the hope that some day they would be restored to life. Complete nonsense. Heating a frozen corpse only serves to make it rot. Then scientists learned how to freeze alive minute bits of tissue, egg cells, sperm, and microorganisms. The larger the body, the more difficult its vitrefaction. Vitrefaction involves the instantaneous congealing of all the organism's fluids into ice, skipping the phase of crystallization since crystal formation causes irreversible damage to the subtle structure of the cell. The body and brain must be turned to glass in a split second. It is easy to heat an object to a high temperature in a split second. To chill it that rapidly to nearly zero Kelvin is incomparably more difficult. The bell vitrefaxes of the victims on Titan were primitive and worked brutally. When we accepted the containers on board, we were unaware of their make. That is why the condition of the bodies was such a surprise. For whom and why? Asked someone in the first row. For me, as a psychonicist, for Davis, who was a somaticist, and of course for our superior. Why? We received containers having no specifications or diagrams of the old vitrefaxes. We did not know that the bells with their frozen occupants had been partly crushed by the glacier. Or that at the site they were placed into thermos cylinders with liquid helium and immediately transported by shuttle to our ship. For the four hundred hours after takeoff, while Hercules pushed us, we were under two G's. We could not proceed with the examination of the containers until afterward. That was three months ago, John," said the same voice. "Yes." During that time, we determined that we could not possibly bring them all back to life. Three were ruled out at once; their brains had been crushed. Of the rest, we can reanimate only one. Although in principle, two of the corpses are candidates for reanimation. The point is that all these people had blood in their circulatory systems. Real blood? Asked someone from another place in the hall. Yes, erythrocytes, plasma, and so on. We have the data on the blood in our holophiles. We can't do transfusions without additional blood, however. So erythroblasts were taken from the marrow and multiplied. There is blood, but then we have the incompatibility of the tissues. Two brains are candidates for reanimation, but there are only enough vital organs for one person. Only one person can be put together of these two. Abominable, but true. A brain can be resurrected without a body," said someone. "We have no intention of doing that," replied Gerbert. "We are not here to run hideous experiments. At the present level of medicine, they would have to be hideous. But the issue is not merely medical." We intrude here on navigational matters as doctors, not as astronauts. No layman can tell us how to proceed. Therefore, I will not go into the details of the operation. It is necessary to decalcify and metalize the skeleton, to remove excess nitrogen from the tissues with helium, to cannibalize bodies for one body. That's our area. I will explain to you only the basis for our request. We must have as little gravitation as possible during the reanimation of the brain. Complete weightlessness would be best of all. We realize, however, that that is impossible without shutting off the engines, which would totally ruin the flight program. Get to the point, John. The head physician did not hide his impatience. The commander and the people here want to know the reason behind your request. He did not say. Our request, but your request, Gerbert, pretending not to notice this slip of the tongue, but convinced that it was not innocent, said calmly, 
The neurons in the human brain normally do not divide. They do not divide because they constitute the material of personal identity, such as memory and other qualities that are commonly called character, soul, and so on. In the brains of those vitrefacted in the primitive fashion that we saw on Titan, losses occur. We are now able to cause the neighboring neurons to divide so that they fill the gaps, but in so doing we destroy the individuality of those neurons. To preserve personal identity, one must limit the number of divided neurons as much as possible, because the daughter cells are like the neurons of an infant, empty, new. Even at zero gravity, there is no certainty whether and to what extent the one resurrected will suffer amnesia. A portion of the memory is irreversibly lost in vitrefaction, even in the best cryostats, because the delicate contacts of the synapses sustain damage on the molecular level. Therefore, we cannot claim that the one resurrected will be exactly the man he was some hundred years ago. We can only say that the weaker the gravitation during the reanimation of the brain, the greater the chance will be to save the personality. I'm finished. Tur Horab glanced, as if casually, at the head physician, who seemed absorbed in the papers before him. There's no need for a vote, Tur Horab said. By the power vested in me as commander, I order the drive throttled at the time appointed by the doctors and for the duration they require. Meeting adjourned. A subdued murmur went through the auditorium. Tur Horab rose and touched Yusupov's shoulder, both headed for the lower exit. Gerbert and Davis practically ran from the gallery before anyone could approach them. In the corridor, they met the Dominican. He did not speak, only nodded and continued on his way. I didn't expect that of Viradian, Davis exclaimed, getting into the aft elevator with Gerbert. The commander, on the other hand, now there's a man in the right place. I could feel our colleagues from the humanities, especially our psychonauts, ready to jump us. He nipped that in the bud. The elevator slowed. The passing lights flickered less frequently. The radian doesn't matter, muttered Gerbert. If you must know, Arago spoke with Terhorab right before the council. Who told you that? Yusupov. Arago was at uh, Horab's before we met with him. You think he... I don't think I know. The priest helped us. But as a theologian, I'm no authority on that. But he knows both medicine and theology. How he reconciles the one with the other is his affair. Come, let's change. We have to get everything ready, and to set the hour... Before the surgery, Dr. Gerbert read the record from the holophile one more time. In the course of their work, the massive planetary machines had halted because their sensors detected metal and, enclosed in the metal, organic material. One by one, seven old striders were pulled from the Burnham heap, and from those striders, six bodies. Two of the diglas lay no more than a few hundred meters apart. One was empty. The other contained a man in a bell vitrifax. Compared to the eighth-generation excavators gnawing through the glacier, the digla was a dwarf. The command center stopped the robot giants and sent out walking drill towers with highly sensitive bio-readers in search of other victims, because the Burnham Depression had claimed nine men. Of the man who left his digla, no trace was found. The armor of the striders had been crushed beneath accumulating piles of ice, but the vitrifaxes held up amazingly well. The supervisors wanted to ship these immediately to Earth for reanimation, but that meant subjecting the frozen bodies to above-gravity force three times, at the takeoff of the small shuttle from Titan, at the acceleration of the transport rocket on the Titan-Earth line, and during the descent to Earth. X-rays of the containers revealed serious injuries in all the bodies, including fractured skulls, so that such an involved move was considered too risky. Someone then hit on the idea of conveying the vitrifaxes to the Eurydice, 
which had the latest reanimation equipment. Also, the acceleration, when it departed, would have to be inconsequential, considering the ship's tremendous rest mass. There remained the question of the identification of the bodies, which could not be done until the vitrifaxes were opened. Varadian, the head physician of the Eurydice, made an agreement with SETI headquarters that specific data and the names of those taken from the ice of Titan would be transmitted to the ship by radio from Earth, because all disks of computer memory, for computers long since dismantled, lay in the archives of the Swiss center of SETI. Up until the moment of takeoff, the communication channels were overcrowded. Someone, or something, man or computer, assigned the incoming data a low degree of importance, and the Eurydice left the circumlunar orbit before the doctors became aware of the lack of this information. Gerbert went to the commander, but nothing could be done. The ship was on its way, picking up speed, pushed by the Herculean lasers like a missile. In this initial phase, Titan took the full brunt of the recoil, and some planetologists believed that it might split apart. Their fears did not materialize, but the acceleration did not proceed as smoothly as the planners expected. Hercules pressed the moon's crust deep into the lithosphere. Violent seismic waves set in motion the mountings of the laser throwers, and although they withstood these earthquakes— Titan quakes, rather, the solar column wavered and shook. It was necessary to lower the power, wait out the diminishing tremors, and re-aim the collimated lasers at the mirror stern of the ship. This created interference. Unsent messages piled up. What was worse, Titan, pushed two years earlier from the vicinity of Saturn and stopped in its rotation so that Hercules, while relatively stationary, could drive the Eurydice outward with its light, began to undergo liberation. Many hundreds of thousands of old thermonuclear warheads embedded as an emergency reserve in the heavy moon finally extinguished this movement as well. It was not easy. As a result, the physicians could not commence with the reanimation. The Eurydice, hit and missed over a series of weeks, received each return of the solar column to her stern as a blow that spread throughout the ship. The difficulties with the collimation of the beam, the seismic shocks of Titan, the few boosters that failed to fire, all postponed the operation. To many on board, the postponement was justified also by the fact that the odds of returning the victims to life did not seem good. With each day of now steady acceleration, communication with Earth worsened, and on top of that, priority was given to radiograms that concerned the success of the expedition. At last the ship got from Earth the names of the six frozen castaways, and their photographs and bios— but that was insufficient to determine identity. With vitrifaction, which took place explosively, the facial parts of the skull were crushed. Secondary implosions inside the cryocontainers tore off the clothing worn under the spacesuits, and its shreds were forced by the oxygen from the bursting suits into the nitrogen coffins, where they turned to ash. Into the nitrogen coffins, where they turned to ash. There was talk, then, of acquiring fingerprints from Earth and dental records. But when these arrived, they only added to the confusion. Because of the ancient rivalry between Grail and Romden, the computer logs there were in disorder, and no one knew whether a portion of the memory disks had been destroyed or had ended up perhaps in some archive outside Switzerland. The man who would be revived on the Eurydice bore one of six names— Ansel, Nawada, Pierks, Kohler, Parvis, Ilmensi. All that the doctors could hope for was that the survivor, recovering from post-reanimation amnesia, would recognize his own name on the list, if he was unable to remember it himself. Varadian and Davis counted on that, but Gerbert, the psychonicist, had doubts. After setting the time of the operation, therefore, he went to the commander to explain the problem. 
Terhorab, always clear-headed and practical, agreed that it would be worth re-examining the contents of the vitrifaxes that had been emptied of their bodies. What you need are criminologists, forensic experts, he said. Since I don't have any on board, I can give you, he hesitated, Field and Lobianco. Physicists, he added with a grin, are also sleuths, in a way. So a blackened, as if charred, cryo-container resembling a curved sarcophagus was brought to the level of the main laboratory. Held by massive pincers while wrenches were applied to the outer catches, it opened slowly, lengthwise, with an awful grating sound. A black interior showed beneath the half-open coffin lid. The spacesuit in the center was sunken, unoccupied. Its owner was floating in liquid helium, for a week now, along with the nitrogen block in which he had originally been frozen. Field and Lobianco took out the spacesuit and carried it to a low metal table. It had been examined before, at the time the body was removed, but nothing was found then except frozen scraps of fabric and some air conditioning lines interwoven in a cable. Now they cut open the frost-covered suit from the ring onto which the helmet fastened and down the torso and pneumatic legs to the large boot. They unhooked winding, spiraling tubes from the scarecrow figure, along with the broken oxygen hoses, and did a meticulous dissection. Every shred went under the microscope. Finally, Lobianco crawled into the cylindrical cryo-container with a handheld light. To make his job easier, he had the manipulator slice through the metal plate and spread the halves wide. He searched here because the spacesuit had burst at the welds joining the arm sleeves to the trunk, either when the digla was subjected to the growing weight of the collapsed Burnham Glacier, or else from the internal pressure during the explosive vitrifaction. If the man had had with him any personal belongings, they could have been blown out through the rent in the suit and fallen, with the streams of solidifying nitrogen and human blood, into the container. At the instant its open mouth was clamped shut by the helmet shot from above, a hood of special steel that cut off the corpse in the spacesuit from the outside world. To pull the hood from the container, hydraulic grippers had to be employed, since the pincers of the manipulator proved too weak. The two physicists and the doctor stepped back several paces from the platform, because the operation was quite violent. Before the hood, looking like the head of a giant artillery shell, jerked and began to move from the upper part of the container, large splinters of metal went flying from under the vanadium teeth. They waited. It was only when the coal-black fragments stopped dribbling and the bell, torn from the cryo-container, opened emptily toward them that Field lifted it high with the four-levered manipulator and Lobianco again began to examine the cylinder. Then everyone stopped. Coming apart completely along the seams, the metal plates trembled and fell slowly to the platform, as if in reenactment of an ancient death agony. The robot jaws carried the heavy hood through the air to the other end of the room and set it down like half of an empty bomb, with such care that the thing came to rest on the aluminum table without a sound. Lobianco approached the split container. In the center were the dark remnants of inside padding, shriveled layers like burned dead leaves. Field looked over Lobianco's shoulder. He was acquainted with the history of vitrifaction. In the days of Grail and Romden, explosive charges had been used to drive the headpiece onto the container with the man, in order that the freezing process take place as rapidly as possible. The man first had to remove his helmet, though remaining in his suit. To keep the blow from crushing his skull, the hood was padded with pneumatically inflated cushions. Expanding, these shielded him. An injection cone was rammed into his mouth. It forced in liquid nitrogen, usually breaking the teeth and even the bones of the jaw. 
The idea was to congeal the brain from all sides at once, and therefore from the base as well, located just above the palate. The technology of the time was unable to avoid such injuries. Bit by bit, the physicists pulled away layers of the crumbling shielding and placed one beside the other until the instruments bared the metal bottom of the cryo container. Among the crushed ashes, they found an object also crushed, but preserving the form of a small booklet. The corners burned as in a fire. The half-carbonized thing was so fragile that it fell into dust wherever touched, so they placed it under a glass cover. Even a breath could damage it. Looks like a small carrying case, possibly leather, portfolio. People kept them on their person. But the documents, as a rule, were cellulose, paper. All made of plastic polymers, Gerbert added to what Lobianco said, not encouraging, replied the physicist. Under such conditions, cellulose holds up no better than the old plastics. How did it find its way into the hood? That's not hard to guess, Field crossed his arms. When he closed the circuits, the lower bell thrust up over the legs to the chest, and the upper half shot out at the same time clapped onto the lower. The charges were implosive, but obviously not the kind that would crush a man. Nitrogen filled the spacesuit so that it split under the arms, and the air, forced out, stripped him naked. The blast of a shell has more than once torn the clothes off a soldier near the target. What do we do with this? Gerbert watched the physicists fill the space onto the glass with a liquid stiffener. Then they took the resultant mold, in which the dark, flat, tattered object was embedded like a bug in amber, and set about analyzing it. They found chemicals that used to be employed to print paper currency, and organic compounds common in animal skins, tanned and dyed, and small traces of silver. These were undoubtedly remnants of photographs, because silver salts were used to make photographs. Adjusting the scan beam, the physicists fixed the scrap taken from the mold, and finally acquired a kind of palimpsest a scramble of letters and small circles, possibly from an official document seal. Chromatography separated the colors from the ink of the print, because, fortunately, it possessed a mineral ingredient. The rest was done by the filters of a microtomograph. The result was modest. If, in fact, they had discovered a proof of identity, which seemed likely, the first name was illegible and of the last name they could be certain only of the first letter, P. The word had from four to seven letters. By coincidence, the names of the two people who were revivable began with P. They put on the screen the resograms of those at rest in the liquid helium. This layered imaging technique, far more precise than old-fashioned X-raying, allowed one to determine the age of the victim to the decade, judging by the hardening in the articular cartilage and in the blood vessels, since medicine, at the time these people lived, had not yet learned how to halt the changes termed sclerosis. The two candidates for reanimation were of similar build. They had the same blood type. The calcification of the ribs, and minutely, in the aorta, indicated that they were both from thirty to forty years of age. According to their biographies, which included medical histories, neither had had an operation that left a scar on the body. The doctors knew this, but wanted to see what the physicists could tell them from the nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. The physicists shook their heads. The nuclei of the stable elements in the organism were as good as eternal. But it was another story if there were isotopes in these people's bodies, which was in fact the case, producing another dead end. Both men had at one time been irradiated with a dose on the order of one to two hundred rems, probably in the final hours of their lives. To examine the internal organs of a man in various planes and sections was an anonymous, abstract activity. The sight of naked corpses encased in nitrogen ice under helium, however, especially with their faces crushed, 
was such that Gerbert preferred to spare the physicists the experience. The eyeballs of both bodies were intact, a secret grief for the doctors, this, because unquestionably the blindness of one would have made the decision for them, namely, to revive the man whose vision was unimpaired. When the physicists left, Davis sat down on the platform with the split-open cryo-container and said nothing. Finally, Gerbert could stand the tension no longer. Well, then, he asked, which one? We could get Faradian's opinion, Davis muttered uncertainly. Why? Tres faciunt collegium? Davis got up, stabbed the keyboard, and the screen obediently displayed, side by side, two rows of green numbers and one number in red, on the right, which blinked in warning. He switched off the unit, unable to endure it, but again reached out to press a key. Gerbert put his arms around him, restraining him. Stop! That's useless! They looked at each other. We might consult, Davis began, but did not finish. No, no one can help us. Varadian, I wasn't thinking of Varadian. I know. I was going to say that officially Varadian will make the decision if we turn to him. He has to, as the head physician, but that's a cowardly way out. Anyway, look how the man has made himself scarce. Let's not prolong this. In an hour, in less than an hour now, Yusupov will throttle the drive. He released Davis and threw the switches on the console to prepare the reanimating room, saying, The dead do not exist. It is as if they had never been born. We are not killing anyone. We are recreating a single life. Look at it that way. Fine, replied Davis, his eyes glittering. You're right. It's a good deed, and you can have the honor of performing it. You choose. The two white snakes that were coiled around the winged staff on the wall above the control panel lit up. The room was ready. Very well, said Gerbert, on one condition, that this remains between us and no one ever learns about it, especially he. You understand? Yes. Think about it. After the operation, all the remains go overboard, and I will erase all the data in the holophile. But you and I will know. We will know because we cannot erase our own memory. Will you be able to forget? No. To be silent? Yes. To everyone? Yes. To the end? Davis hesitated. But they all know, after all. You said yourself at the council that we would choose either— I had to. The Radian knew the score. But after the data are destroyed, we will lie and tell everyone that this man was objectively preferable in a way discovered by us only here and now. Davis nodded. I agree. We'll write the protocol, sign it together— Falsify two of the items. You'll sign? Yes, with you. Gerbert opened the wall compartment. In it hung silvery suits with white boots and face masks of glass. He took out his and began to put it on. Davis did likewise. In the central rotunda of the room, a door parted, revealing the bright interior of an elevator. The door closed, the elevator went down, and the empty room grew darker, but above the point lights of the control panel glowed the snakes of Aesculapius. Chapter 3 The Survivor He returned to consciousness blind and without a body. His first thoughts were not formed of words. His feelings were confused, inexpressible. He receded, disappeared somewhere, and returned. It was only when he found his internal speech that he could put questions to himself. What was I afraid of? What kind of darkness is this? What does this mean? 
and when he made this step, he was able to think, What am I? What is happening to me? He tried to move to locate his arms, legs, torso, knowing now that he had a body, or at least that he should have one. But nothing responded, nothing moved. He could not tell if his eyes were open. He felt no lids, no blinking. He exerted all his strength to lift the lids, and perhaps succeeded. But he saw nothing except the same darkness as before. These attempts, requiring tremendous effort, again led him to the question, What am I? I am a man. This obvious answer was a revelation to him. Then, immediately, he knew its obviousness and smiled at himself, because what kind of brilliant discovery was that? Words returned slowly, from where he did not know, and at first were scattered and without pattern, as if he were pulling them up like fish out of unknown depths. Am. I am. Where? I do not know. I cannot feel my body. Why is that? Now he began to feel his face, the cheeks, possibly the nose, he was even able to move the nostrils, though that took an enormous exertion of will. He stared, moving the eyeballs in all directions, and concluded, because his ability to reason had returned, either I am blind or it is completely dark. The darkness brought to mind night, and night a great space full of pure, cold air, and air suggested breath. Am I breathing? he asked himself, and listened carefully to his darkness, which was so like nothingness, and yet so unlike it. It seemed to him that he was breathing, but not in the usual way. The belly, the ribs were motionless, held in incomprehensible suspension. The air entered by itself and gently left. There was no other way he could breathe. He had a face now, lungs, nostrils, a mouth, eyes, though unseeing. He decided to make a fist, remembering perfectly what hands were and how to close them tight. Still he felt nothing, and fear returned, this time rational from logic. This is either paralysis, or I have lost my arms and possibly my legs. The conclusion seemed false— he had lungs, that was certain, and yet no body. Into his darkness and fear intruded tones, measured, distant, dull. Blood? His heart? It was beating. Then he heard, like the first tidings from the outside, the sounds of speech. His hearing opened suddenly, though it was muffled, there were two people speaking. He distinguished two voices, but he did not understand what they were saying. The language was known to him. The words, however, were indistinct, like objects seen through misted glass or a fog. As he focused his attention more, his hearing sharpened, and, strangely, it was through his hearing that he emerged from himself, finding himself in a space that had a bottom, top, and sides. This meant gravity, he realized. Then he started to concentrate completely on the hearing. The voices were masculine, one higher and softer, the other low, a baritone, very close. Perhaps he could speak himself, if he tried— but he wanted to listen first, not only out of curiosity and hope, but also because it was a pleasurable thing to hear so well and to comprehend more and more human speech. I'd keep him in the helium. This was the nearer voice, suggesting a large, heavy-set man. There was so much strength in it. I wouldn't, said the farther, younger voice. Why not? It does no harm. Look at his brain. No, not the calcaravis, the right temporal, the vernicus center. You see? He's listening to us. The amplitude is small. I doubt that he understands. 
Both frontal lobes now. It's really up to norm. I see. Yesterday there was practically no alpha. He was hibernating. That's normal. But whether he understands or not, there's still too much nitrogen. I'm adding helium. A long silence and soft steps. Wait, look. That was the baritone. He's awake. Well, then. The rest he did not hear. They whispered. He regained his clarity of thought. Who was speaking? Doctors. Did I have an accident? Where? Who am I? He thought more and more rapidly while they whispered back and forth, raising their voices in their excitement. Good. The frontals are perfect. But the thalamus, I don't know. Switch it on lower down. Use Escalapius here. No, better than Medicom. Right. Adjust the picture. How's the medulla? Almost at zero. Curious. Curious, rather, that it's not on zero. Let's see the respiratory center. Hmm. Activated? No. For what? He'll start breathing on his own. It's surer that way. However, above the optic chiasma here, something pinged. He can't see, said the younger voice with surprise. The nine is functional. We'll find out now if he can see anything. In the following stillness came metallic clangs. At the same time, the dark gave way to a grayish, feeble glow. Aha! said the baritone in triumph. It was only on the synapses. The pupils have been reacting for a week now. Anyway, he added more quietly, he won't be able to... a whisper. Agnosia? No. It would be a good thing if... Look at the higher components. The memory is restoring itself? I don't know. I can't say yes or no. And the blood picture? Normal. The heart? Forty-five. Pressure? One-ten. Disconnected? Better not. Wait. A small impulse to the medulla. He felt something twitch in him. The tonus returns. You see? I can't watch the myograms and the brain at the same time. He's moving? His arms... uncoordinated. And now? Observe the face. Is he blinking? He opened his eyes. Does he see? Not yet. What's the stimulus threshold for the pupils? Four lux. I'll up it to six. Does he see? No. He only feels the light. It's a thalamic reaction. The medicom will fix the electrodes and give the current. Ah, excellent. In the darkness he saw something pale pink and shining over him. At the same time, he heard the voice say breathlessly, You've been saved. You'll be all right. Don't try to talk. If you understand me, close your eyes twice. Twice. He did this. Excellent. I'll speak to you. If you don't understand, blink once. He tried hard to make out what the pale and pink was, but couldn't. He's trying to see you came the farther voice. How could the voice know that? You'll see me and everything else, said the baritone slowly. You must be patient. You understand? He said yes with his eyelids. He wanted to speak, but something in him croaked. That was all. No, no, the same voice scolded. It's too early for conversation. You can't talk. You have a tube in your trachea. It is supplying you with air. You cannot breathe on your own. We are breathing for you. You understand? Good. And now you will sleep. When you wake and are rested, we'll have a talk. You'll learn everything. But now... Victor, put him to sleep slowly, slowly... Pleasant dreams. He stopped seeing, as if a light had gone out not above him, but inside him. 
He didn't want to sleep. He wanted to jump up on his feet. But the darkness that was himself had already vanished. He had many dreams, odd dreams, beautiful dreams, and dreams that could be neither remembered nor related. Sometimes he was a multitude of feeling things at once. He would go far away and then return. He saw people, recognized their faces, but could not recall who they were. Sometimes all that remained to him was his sight, boundless, full of invisible sun. It seemed to him that eons passed in these dreams and in the voids between them. Suddenly he awoke. With consciousness, he also regained his body. He was lying on his back, bundled in a fluffy, soft material. He tensed the muscles of his back. He felt a tingling in his thighs. Above him was a flat, pale green ceiling. Nearby gleamed pipes of some kind and glassware, but he was unable to turn his head. Something held his head in place, a bolster that was soft but reached up to his temples, resiliently firm. His eyes he could move freely. On the other side of a transparent wall rose apparatuses of some sort, and at the very edge of his field of vision little lights danced on and off. He soon noticed that the lights had some connection to him, because when he inhaled more deeply and his rib cage lifted, they lit up with the same rhythm. Outside his field of vision... Something glowed pink in a steady, slow tempo, and the period of that pinkness also kept pace with him, with his heart. He had no doubt now that he was in a hospital. An accident, then. What kind and where? He knit his brow, waited for an explanation to emerge from his memory, but in vain. He lay still, shut his eyes, and concentrated his will on the question. No answer came. His ability to move his legs, arms, fingers as he liked, except for the enfolding material, no longer satisfied him. He tried clearing his throat, touched the inside surface of his teeth with his tongue, and finally spoke. I... I... He recognized his own voice. But whose it was, his own voice... He did not know, and did not understand how this could be. He tried freeing himself from the restraining padding and tensed his muscles several times. Then a lethargy fell over him with strange suddenness, and again he went out like an extinguished candle. He did not count the passing days. Life on the ship was divided in the simple, conventional way, according to earth rhythm. During the day, all the decks, corridors, and tunnel passageways between the sections of the hull were brightly lit. At ten o'clock, dusk began as a dimming of the gold-tinged white that emanated from the ceilings and walls. For about an hour, there was a blue, semi-darkness, until the illumination ceased, and all that showed the solitary wanderer the way was a thin, fluorescent line that ran down the center of the ceilings. He liked this time the best. He could tour the Eurydice during the day, too. All the quarters were accessible to him, and he was assured that he would not be disturbing anyone. He could go where he liked, ask any question, but he preferred the night for his walks. Physically proficient, he exercised early each morning in the gym, then went to school. That was what he called it. He would take a seat in front of Nemon, to regain his memory through picture-and-word association games, and also to learn things completely new to him. With the machine, which was infinitely patient and incapable of showing any emotion, any surprise, any feeling of superiority, he was at ease. If he failed to grasp something, Nemon would resort to visual aids, simple diagrams, and skillfully apply teaching programs borrowing from the stores of other machines on the ship. The holophile contained in its archives tens of thousands of films, though they were not films, and photographs, 
though unlike the photographs of the past, since each image, when summoned, became a surrounding scene, and each word was made flesh, a flesh granted that was transitory. If he wished, he could visit the inner chambers of the pyramids, the Gothic cathedrals, the castles on the Loire, the moons of Mars, cities, forests. But he did this only because he knew that such visions constituted an important part of his therapy. The doctors tried to treat him like one of the members of the crew, never like a patient. He even had the impression that they avoided him, as if to emphasize that he was in no way different from anyone else. His visual memory returned, along with his life experience, his professional skills as a navigator, and expert in striders. True, ships had changed no less than planetary machines. Regarding them, he was a little like a seaman from the days of the sailing ships finding himself on a great ocean liner. But it was not difficult to fill in these gaps. The outdated information he replaced with new. More and more keenly, however, he felt his worst loss, a loss possibly irreversible. He could not dredge up in himself any names, first names, last names, including his own. What was more curious, his memory seemed divided in two. Things that he had once experienced returned to him faded, though full of detail, just as a child's possessions found in a closet of the family home after many years evoked not only images of the past, but also an emotional aura. One time, in the physicist's lab, the smell of an evaporating liquid from a distillation, acrid in his nostrils, instantly summoned up more than a picture, a chance landing field, brightly lit, though at night, when he, standing beneath the still red-hot cones of the rockets, beneath his saved ship, breathed the same smell of nitric smoke and felt a happiness that he was not aware of then, but which now, remembering, he understood. He did not tell Dr. Gerbert about this, though he really should have, since the doctor had said to come immediately with any unexpected recollection, because it would lie in one of the buried places of his memory. It was necessary to deepen the recollection, not for psychotherapy, but in order to re-establish and reopen the paths in the brain that had been erased. In this way he could return more fully to himself. The advice was rational, professional, and he considered himself a rational person. Still, he kept this from the doctor. Being taciturn was definitely one of his traits. He had never liked to confide, particularly not private things. He told himself that if he ever remembered who he was, it would not be by smell, like a dog. A stupid thought, he realized. It never crossed his mind to set himself above the doctors, but he stuck to his decision. Gerbert soon became aware of the man's reticence. He gave him his word that the sessions with Nemon were not recorded, and that he could clear each session from the pedagogue's memory himself, if he wished. And the man did that. He kept no secrets from the machine. It helped him reclaim a multitude of memories but without the names of the people, and without his own. Finally, he asked the machine why. Nemon was silent for a long while. The memory training, as it was called, took place in a cabin that was strangely furnished. There were several pieces of antiquated furniture in it, veritable museum pieces, in an almost royal style, armchairs with gilding and curved legs, and every wall had an oil painting by a Dutch master. The paintings that he had remembered were his favorites. They appeared after he recalled them, as if to help him on. The oils were changed several times, but the canvas in the carved frames was no canvas, though imitating well the fiber and the daubs of paint. Nemon had explained to him how these excellent temporary replicas were made. The teaching machine itself was not visible, not that anyone was hiding it, 
but being a subsystem of Escalapius, disengaged for these sessions, in the cabin it wore no form that could clash with the student's frame of mind. So that the survivor would not have to address empty space, or a microphone, or a wall, he had before him, as he paced this study, a bust of Socrates from the pages of Greek mythology, or philosophy. The bust, shaggy-headed, seemed made of marble. Sometimes, however, it participated, mimicking life, in the discussions. For the student, this was unpleasant, in poor taste somehow. Unable to come up with an alternative, and not wanting to bother Gerbert for nothing, he accustomed himself to the face. But whenever he had something painful to reveal, pacing before his mentor, he would speak without looking. Now the fake Socrates seemed to hesitate, as if presented with a problem too difficult. My answer to you will be unsatisfying. It is not good for a man to be too cognizant of his physical and spiritual mechanisms. Complete knowledge reveals limits to human possibilities, and the less a man is by nature limited in his purposes, the less he can tolerate limits. That is in the first place. In the second place, Names are stored differently from other concepts embedded in speech. Why? Because names do not form any coherent system. They are, after all, purely a matter of convention. Every person has a name, but could have an altogether different name and be the same person. One's name is decided by accident, in the form of one's parents. First and last names thus lack logical and physical necessity. If you will permit a small philosophical digression, only things exist, and their relations. To be a man is to be a particular thing. It does not matter that it is a living thing. To be a brother or a son, that is a relation. Examining a newborn infant with every method, you will learn everything about it. You will reach its genetic code, but its name you will not reach. One discovers the world. To names, however, one may only become accustomed. This distinction is not felt in an ordinary life, but a person who has come into the world twice experiences it. It is not out of the question that you will remember your name. That could happen at any moment, or it could never happen. This is why I advised you to take a temporary name. There is no dishonesty or falsehood in that. You will be in the situation of your parents when they stood over your cradle. They, too, did not know, before they chose it, the name that they would give you. But once they chose it, after many years, they would have been unable to imagine that you had another, inborn, truer name, and that they had not given that one to you. You sound more like Pythia, he replied, trying to hide his agitation over the allusion to his death. He did not understand why he should react in this way. Facts were facts. If anything, he ought to feel the tremendous satisfaction of one risen from the dead. I don't care about my name. I know it begins with P, four to seven letters. Parvis or Pierx. I know that the others couldn't be saved. It would have been better if I hadn't been shown that list. They hoped that you would recognize yourself. I can't choose blindly. I told you that. I know and understand your motives. You are the type of person who pays little attention to himself. You are always that way. So you do not wish to choose? No. Or assume a name? No. What then do you intend to do? I don't know. Possibly there would have been more arguments enlisted to persuade him, but for the first time since he had come to this cabin, he exercised his right to erase the machine. All his conversations. And, as if that was insufficient, with the next touch of his finger, he consigned the bust of the Greek sage to nothingness. He felt a grim satisfaction then, a senseless though keen pleasure, as if he had murdered, without murdering, one before whom he had bared his soul too much, and who, 
or rather which, had so sensibly and authoritatively taken charge of his helplessness. A poor excuse for a reason, this, and he regretted his action, which parted him from the blameless machine. But since the thing had been right in saying that more than to be in the world, he wanted to have the world in him, he swallowed his anger, his shame, pointless, and put them out of his mind for good, turning to matters more important than his personal past. There was plenty to learn. The biggest and most recent effort to find extraterrestrial civilizations, named Cyclops, had come to nothing after almost twenty years. In the opinion of those who had listened to the stars, hoping to receive intelligent signals, it proved a miserable failure. The mystery of the silent universe had become a challenge to Earth science. The extreme optimism of a handful of astrophysicists at the end of the twentieth century, infecting thousands of other specialists as well as laymen, turned into its opposite. The billions invested in the radio telescopes that filtered the emissions from millions of stars and galaxies did indeed give results in the form of new discoveries, but no radio wave brought news of other intelligence. However, the telescopes, placed in orbiters in space, were hit several times by streams of radiation singular enough to rekindle extinguished hopes. If these were signals, their reception was of brief duration. They broke off and did not return. Perhaps the circumsolar region was being pierced by the needle messages addressed to other stars. Attempts to decipher the recordings of them in countless different ways failed. Even the signal nature of these concentrated impulses could not be determined with any certainty. Thus, tradition and caution obliged the experts to conclude that the phenomenon was the product of stellar material, an emission of very hard radiation by chance focused through so-called gravitational lenses into narrow pencils. The primary rule in observation said that whatever did not clearly show an artificial source had to be considered a natural phenomenon. Astrophysics, besides, had advanced to the point where it possessed sufficient hypotheses to explain every kind of observed emission without resorting to the existence of other beings as the senders. A paradox arose. The greater the number of theories astrophysics had at its disposal, the more difficult it became to prove the authenticity of an intentional signal. By the end of the twentieth century, the spokesman for Project Cyclops had drawn up a catalogue of criteria. To distinguish what nature could produce, with the wealth of its forces, from that which was beyond its power and therefore would appear as a cosmic miracle— an analogy on earth might be leaves falling from trees to form the letters of a meaningful sentence, or pebbles thrown on a river sandbar assuming the shape of circles, tangents, or Euclidean triangles. Thus the scientists put together a list of requirements, rules, that would have to be met by any sender of extraterrestrial signals. Almost half of this list was crossed off in the first years of the next century. It was not only the pulsars, not only the gravitational lenses, not only the microwave radiation from the nebulas, not only the giant masses at the galactic center that fooled the observers by their regularity, repetition, the peculiar order of their various impulses. In place of the discarded rules for broadcasters, new ones were soon put in and these were discarded, too, in short order. Hence the pessimistic conclusion that Earth was unique not only in the local arm of the Milky Way, but in a myriad other spiral galaxies. Subsequent increases in knowledge, in astrophysics particularly, brought this pessimism into question. The great number of cosmic properties of energy and matter which suggested the notion of an anthropic principle of the close connection between the universe as it was and life as it was, presented a compelling argument. In a cosmos that contained people, 
one had to expect the birth of life outside the earth as well. A succession of surmises followed to reconcile the fertility of the universe with its silence. Life arose on innumerable planets, but produced intelligent beings only through the rarest concatenation of unlikely accidents. No, it arose frequently enough, but generally developed along non-protein lines. Silicon displayed an abundance of compounds equal to that of carbon bonding, the atomic cornerstone of proteins. But an evolution begun in silicon was permanently non-convergent with intelligence, or else produced forms of intelligence that had no kinship whatever with human mentality. No. The spark of intelligence occurred in various shapes, but was of short duration. The development of life took billions of years only in its pre-sentient stage. Primate creatures, once formed, within 200,000 years automatically began a technological explosion. This explosion, and by the cosmic clock it was a true explosion, not only carried them at ever-increasing speed to higher and higher levels of control of the forces of nature, it also carried civilizations apart, in directions too different for them to understand one another through any commonality of thought. There was no such commonality. That was an anthropocentric fallacy that people had inherited from the ancient faiths and myths. There could, in fact, be many different intelligences, and it was precisely because there were so many that the sky was silent. Not at all, said other hypotheses. The solution to the mystery was much simpler. The evolution of life, if it produced intelligence, did so through a series of isolated events. This intelligence could be nipped in the bud by any stellar incursion in the vicinity of the parent planet. Intervention from space was always blind and random. Had not paleontology, with the help of galactography, the archaeology of the Milky Way, shown that the mammals owed their primacy to cataclysms that had left mountains of reptilian remains in the Mesozoic, and that it was a chain of happenstances, ice ages, pluvials, the formation of the steppes, the changes in Earth's magnetic poles, rates of mutation, that created the family tree of man? This notwithstanding, intelligence could mature under trillions of suns, it could take the path of the terrestrial variety, in which case that winning ticket in the stellar lottery after one or two thousand years might turn into catastrophe, for technology was a domain of fatal traps, and whoever entered there could easily come to a bad end. Intelligent beings were able to see this threat, but only when it was too late. Having cast off religious faiths, and recognizing that religion's modern, degenerated forms were ideologies that offered the fulfillment of material and only material needs, the civilizations tried to stop their own momentum. But that was now impossible. Impossible even if they were not torn by internal antagonisms. The survivor from Titan had ample time to put questions and digest answers. From reflections on themselves and the world, termed on Earth philosophy, the intelligent beings proceeded to activities that made it increasingly clear to them that whatever had called them into existence gave them only one sure thing, their mortality. Indeed, they owed their very existence to mortality, for without it, the billion-year alternations of emerging and dying species never would have taken place. They were spawned by the pit, by the deaths of the Archeozoic, the Paleozoic, the successive geological periods, and along with their intelligence, received the guarantee of their own demise. Soon, some twenty centuries after this diagnosis, they came to know the parental ways of nature— the treacherous and wasteful technology of self-realizing processes used by her to permit future forms of life to appear. This technology inspired admiration 
only as long as it remained inaccessible to its discoverers. But that did not last either. Robbing the plants, the animals, their own bodies of their secrets, they changed the biosphere and themselves, and this increase in dominion was insatiable. They went out into space, only to find how alien it was to them and how the mark of their animal origin had been stamped inexorably on their bodies. This alienness, too, they overcame. Then, before very long, they found that they were, within the newly constructed technosphere, the last relic of the ancient heritage of biology, and that they were able to abandon, along with the poverty of the past, the hunger, the epidemics, the countless infirmities of old age, their mortal bodies. At first the possibility loomed like a fantastic, distant, terrifying crossroads, these generalizations, full of pathos and savoring of an engineer's grim eschatology, the survivor read with distaste. He wanted to know the purpose of the expedition, inasmuch as he had become an involuntary participant in it. A more up-to-date volume, now the authoritative text on exobiology, brought him closer to its mission. The book contained a diagram by Ortega and Nielsen showing the development of psychozoics in the universe, their main road, and branchings. The commencement of the main road was the early technological age, which was short-lived, allowing no offshoots for the thousand years between the rise of mechanical tools and the advent of the informational. In the next millennium, Information science was crossed with biology to produce a swell of biotic acceleration. At this juncture, the diagnostic quality of the chart, becoming prognostic, weakened. The outline of the main road had been drawn by facts and theories, but its divergences were the resultants now of theories only, albeit theories supported by others that were reliable to a high degree. The turning point in the main road was the moment when the engineering ability of the intelligent beings matched the life-creating potential of nature. It was not possible to predict the further career of any individual civilization. This followed from the very nature of the crossroads. A certain percentage of the civilizations would stay on the main road by putting the lid on an attainable but unrealized auto-evolution. An extreme case of such bioconservatism would be the creation of legislation, statutes, treaties, prohibitions, sanctions, to which all instrumentalities infringing on nature would be subject. Technologies would arise to save the environment, committed to adapting the technosphere without trauma to the biosphere. This task could be, but would not have to be, accomplished in which latter case a civilization in a series of costly crises would fluctuate demographically. It could decline and regenerate itself many times, paying for this self-destructive inertia with billions of lives. The establishing of interstellar contact would not rank high on its list of priorities. The conservatives on the main road would be silent. That was obvious. For the biotically non-conservative, there were many solutions. Decisions to auto-evolve, once made, were generally irreversible. Hence the great divergence among the older psychozoics. Ortega, Nielsen, and Tomek introduced the concept of a window of contact. This was the interval of time in which intelligent beings had already reached a high level of applied science but had not yet undertaken to change the natural intelligence given them, what would correspond to the human brain. The window of contact was, cosmically, a moment. From the resinous torch to the oil lamp, 16,000 years passed. From that lamp to the laser, it was a hundred years the information needed to make the torch to laser step was on the order of the information needed to go from the discovery of the genetic code to the code's implementation in a post-atomic industry. Increases in knowledge were, 
in the window of contact phase, exponential, and, toward the phase's end, hyperbolic. The interval of any meaningful contact was minimally a thousand Earth years, optimally from 1800 to 2500 years. Outside the window, for civilizations either immature or too mature, silence reigned. The immature lacked the power to communicate, while those too mature closed themselves off, or else formed groups that communicated with one another by means faster than light. On the subject of faster than light communication, there was disagreement. No kind of matter or energy could be made to exceed the speed of light. But that barrier, some said, could be circumvented. Let a pulsar with a magnetic field fixed by a neutron star rotate at a speed approaching C. The beam of the emission would go in circles around the pulsar's axis and at a sufficient distance sweep across a sector of space at a speed greater than C. If in the subsequent sectors of the beam's rotation there were observers, those observers could synchronize their watches beyond the limit discovered by Einstein. They would only need to know the distances of the sides of the triangle, pulsar, observer A, observer B, and the speed of the rotation of the lighthouse pulsar. This is as much as the one resurrected on the Eurydice learned in the year of her constant acceleration about cosmic civilizations. He came to a barrier that he could not pass. The machine instructor did not chide the human pupil who was unable to grasp the mysteries of sidereal energetics and its relation to engineering and gravitational ballistics. These recent discoveries made possible the present expedition to the stars of the Harpy, which had been hidden from the astronomers of previous centuries by a cloud called the Coal Sack. The Eurydice was to pass the Coal Sack, enter the temporal harbor of a collapsar christened Hades, dispatch one of her segments to the planet named Kinta el Harpyi, wait for the return of that scout ship, and perform, for her own return, an incomprehensible maneuver called Passage Through a Retrochronal Toroid, thanks to which she would reappear in the neighborhood of the sun barely eight years after takeoff. Without that passage, she would return two thousand years later, which would be no return at all. The scout ship of the Eurydice was to travel on its own an entire parsec with its crew in a state of embryonization. The vitrefaction of people had been abandoned, as it gave only a 98% certainty of reviving the frozen. The pilot of ancient rockets felt, at these lectures, like a child being initiated into the operation of a synchrophasotron. He also realized that he had become a hermit, that he should no longer play Robinson Crusoe at the side of an electronic Friday. He rode to the observatory in the forward section of the Eurydice to see the stars. A great hall gleamed with strange equipment. In vain he looked for the cannon-like cylinder of a reflector or of any other type of telescope, or simply a shuttered dome for viewing the heavens directly. The high hall seemed unoccupied, though lit all around with storied rows of lights. Along these ran narrow galleries that were joined by columns of machines. Returning to his cabin after this unsuccessful excursion, he noticed on the table an old dog-eared book with a card from Gerbert. Gerbert was loaning it to him, something to read in bed. The physician was known to have brought on board with him a number of science fiction books, which he preferred to the dazzling holovision shows. The sight of the book moved the recipient. For so long, once again, he had been among the stars, yet had not seen them for so long. Worse, he was not able to make friends with the people who had bestowed upon him this new voyage along with this new life. The cabin, as he had requested, was furnished half in the style of a sea vessel and half in the style of an old merchant rocket, the living quarters of a helmsman or a navigator, 
in no way resembling a passenger's cabin, because this was not a place for a brief stay like a hotel. It was home. He even had a bunk bed. Usually he laid his clothes on the top bunk when he undressed. Over the pillow of the bottom bunk, he switched on a little lamp, covered his feet with the blanket, and, thinking that once again he was giving in to the sins of sloth and passivity, but perhaps now for the last time, opened the book in the place marked by Gerbert. For a moment he read without comprehension. Such was the strong effect the ordinary black print had on him. The typeface of the letters, the yellowed, fragile pages, the real stitches of the binding— the bulge of the cover along the spine, all seemed incredibly familiar to him, unique, a thing lost and then found, though heaven knows he had never been an avid reader. But now he felt a solemnity in reading, as if the dead author had made a promise to him once, and although many obstacles had to be overcome, the promise was kept. He had an odd habit. He would open a volume at random and begin reading there. The writers would not have been too pleased. Why did he do this? Perhaps he wanted to break into the fictional world, not through its prepared entrance, but all at once, in the middle. Tell you? The professor folded his hands on his chest. By ship to Port Boma, he began, sinking into the chair. He closed his eyes. Paddle boat to Bangala. That's where the jungle begins. Then six weeks on horseback. No more is possible. Even mules will drop. Sleeping sickness. There was one old shaman there, Nefo Tuabe. He pronounced the word with a French accent on the last syllable. I had come to catch butterflies, but he showed me the way. He stopped for a moment opened his eyes. You know what the jungle is? But how could you? Life, green and mad, everything quivering, watching, moving. In the underbrush, a crowd of ravenous mouths, insane flowers like explosions of color, hidden insects in sticky webs, thousands, thousands of unclassified species. Not like here in Europe. No need to go looking for them. In the night the whole tent was covered by moths as big as a hand, insistent, blind, falling into the fire by the hundreds. Shadows passed across the canvas. The natives trembled. The wind carried thunder from different quarters. Lions, jackals. But that was nothing. Then came the weakness and the fever. We left the horses, continued on foot. I took serum, quinine, German chamomile, everything— Finally, one day, there is no reckoning of time there, a man gets to feel that the division of the week, the whole calendar, is a silly artificial thing. One day, it was impossible to go on. The jungle ended. There was another native village at a river. The river isn't on the map. Three times a year it disappears into quicksand. Part of the bed is underground. A few huts made of sun-baked clay and silt— that's where Nefo to Abbe lived. Didn't know English. How could he? I had two translators. One put my words into the dialect of the coast, the other put that into Bushman. Over that whole belt of jungle from the sixth parallel rules an ancient royal family. Descendants of the Egyptians, I would guess. Taller, much more intelligent than the blacks of Central Africa— Nefo to Abbe even drew a map for me, showing the borders of the kingdom. I had saved his son from the sleeping sickness. It was for that. Not opening his eyes, the professor reached into an inner pocket. From a notebook he took out a piece of paper scribbled with red ink. The lines were tangled and twisted. Hard to read. The jungle stops here, as if cut with a knife. It's the border of the kingdom. I asked what lay beyond. He didn't want to talk about that in the night. I had to come back during the day. Only then, in that stinking hole of a hut without windows, you can't imagine the stench, did he tell me that there were ants beyond. White, blind ants that built great cities. 
Their realm extended for many kilometers. Red ants fought the white. They came in a great living river through the jungle. Elephants would leave the vicinity then in herds, making curved tunnels through the underbrush. Tigers fled, even the snakes. Of the birds, only the vultures remained. The ants traveled variously, sometimes for a month, day and night, in a rust-red moving current. Whatever stood in their path, they destroyed. They reached the edge of the jungle, came upon the mounds of the whites, and the battle began. Nefo Tuabe, in his lifetime, had seen it once. The red ants, overcoming the sentries of the whites, entered their cities and never returned. What happens to them, no one knows. But next year new legions come plowing through the jungle. It was this way in the time of his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather. It was always this way. The soil in the place of the white ants is fertile. Long ago, the natives tried to cultivate it, tried to burn down the mounds of the termites. They lost that battle. The crops were destroyed. They built huts and enclosures of wood. The termites reached these through underground passageways, penetrated the structures, ate them out from inside, so that a touch of the hand made them crumble. The natives resorted to clay. Then, instead of workers, soldiers appeared. These, he pointed to a jar. In the center, fastened with surgical clips to glass plates, were specimens of giant termites, several warriors, enormous and deformed creatures. A third of the thorax was covered by horny armor, with a helmet ending in open scissors. The broad armor weighed down the delicate legs and abdomen. Nothing new to you, I suspect. We know that there are regions in which termites rule. In South America, they have two kinds of soldier, defenders and something like an internal police. The mounds reach eight meters in height. Built of sand and excrement, they're harder than Portland cement. Proof against any steel. Eyeless, white, soft insects that have lived for some twenty million years away from the light. Studied by Packard, Schmelz, many others, but not one of them ever dreamed. You understand? I saved his son. And in exchange, oh, he was wise. Knew how to repay a white man, royally. Completely gray negro. Skin like ashes, the face a mask, smoke cured. He said to me, The mounds go on for miles. The whole plain is covered with them. Like a forest, a dead forest, one after another, giant petrified trunks. It is difficult to pass between them. Everywhere the ground is hard. It booms underfoot like a drum and is strewn with braids of thick string. Those are the tubes through which the termites run. Made of the same cement as the mounds, they go very far, down into the earth and up again, and they branch, intersect, and lead inside the mounds, and every fifty or sixty centimeters they widen, so that the termites, running in different directions, can pass each other. And in the center of the city, among a million stone-like termitaria that seethe with blind, violent life, there stands a different mound, smaller, black, and bent like a hook. He showed me how with his brown thumb. The heart of the ant nation lies there. More he did not want to say. And you believed him? whispered the listener. The dark eyes of the professor burned. I returned to Boma bought fifty kilograms of dynamite in pound sticks, the kind used in mines, picks, shovels, spades, a complete outfit, tanks of sulfur, metal hoses, gas masks, netting, the best I could obtain, and cans of airplane gasoline and an arsenal of insecticides, more than you can imagine. Then I hired twelve bearers and went into the jungle. Are you acquainted with Collinger's experiment? It's considered nonsense. He was not. True, a myrmecologist, only an amateur. 
cut through an entire termite mound from top to bottom and inserted a steel plate so that the two halves could not communicate with each other in any way. The mound was young. The termites had only begun building it. After six weeks, he removed the plate. It turned out that the new tunnels had been constructed in such a way that their mouths, on either side of the barrier, exactly corresponded, not a millimeter off, vertically or horizontally. Just as men build a tunnel, beginning the work simultaneously on both sides of the mountain and meeting in the middle, how did the termites communicate through the steel? And then Gruss's experiment, also not verified, he maintained that if you killed the termite queen, workers that were several hundred meters from the mound immediately showed agitation and returned to the nest. Again he paused. He stared at the red embers in the fireplace and the flickering blue flames that appeared and disappeared over them. I had a map, yes. First the guide ran off, then the translator. They left their things and disappeared. Early one morning I awoke in my mosquito net. Silence, bulging eyes, terrified faces, whispering behind my back. I ended up tying the lot of them to me, wrapped the cord around my hand, took their knives so they couldn't cut themselves loose. From lack of sleep or from the sun, my eyes became inflamed. In the morning I could hardly open the lids, they were so badly stuck. Summer was on us. My shirt was stiff with sweat, as if starched, and if you touched the helmet on the outside you immediately got blisters. The rifle barrel burned like a red-hot poker. We hacked our way for thirty-nine days. I didn't want to go through old Nafo Tuabe's village, as he had asked me not to. So we came to the edge of the jungle without warning. Suddenly that hellish, stifling thicket of leaves, vines, and screaming parrots and monkeys ended. As far as the eye could see, a plain, yellow as the skin of an old lion. On it, among clumps of cacti, stood cones, the mounds. Built blindly from within, hence formless in conception, we spent the night here. At dawn, I awoke with a fierce headache. The day before, I had carelessly removed my helmet for a moment. The sun was high. The heat was such that the air burned the lungs. The shapes of objects shimmered as if the sand were on fire. I was alone. The natives had fled, chewing through their cord. The only one remaining had fled, chewing through their cord. The only one remaining was a thirteen-year-old, Uagadu. I began to walk. Together we carried the baggage a distance of fifty feet, then went back and brought the rest of the things. We had to repeat this five times under the sun, which burned infernally. Despite my white shirt, I developed sores on my back, which did not heal. I had to sleep on my stomach, but this is unimportant. All day we penetrated the city of the termites. I don't think there is anything in the world more eerie. Imagine, on all sides, in front of you, in back of you, stony mounds two stories high, in places so close one could barely squeeze between them, an endless forest of rough gray columns, and from the center of each column, when one stopped, came a faint, incessant, steady rustling, at moments changing into individual taps. The walls trembled constantly to the touch, day and night. Several times it happened that we crushed one of the tunnels, which looked like ash-gray cords scattered over the ground in bundles. We saw endless rows of white insects marching. Then there would appear, suddenly, the horned helmets of the soldiers, who cut the air blindly with their pincers and ejected a sticky, burning fluid. For two days we wandered, for there was no possible way to get bearings. 
two, three, four times each day I would clamber up a mound higher than the others to look for the mound of which Nefotua Bay spoke. But all I saw was a forest of stone. The jungle behind us became a green strip, then a blue line on the horizon, then finally disappeared. Our water supply dwindled, but the mounds went on and on. Through my telescope I saw them merge in the far distance like a field of corn. The lad amazed me. Without complaint he did everything that I did, but not knowing why or wherefore. We proceeded thus for four days. I was drunk with the sun. The sunglasses didn't help. There was a terrible glare in the sky. One could not look up before dusk, and the sand blazed like mercury, and all around palisades of mounds, unending. No trace of any living creature. Even the vultures did not venture here. There was only an occasional solitary cactus. Finally, in the evening, having rationed out the water for that day, I climbed to the top of a very large mound. I think the thing went back to the days of Caesar. Without hope now, I looked around, when suddenly I saw a black spot in the telescope. My first thought was that the glass was dirty. But no, it was that mound. The next day I got up when the sun was still below the horizon. I could barely waken my boy. We began to carry our things in the direction that I had marked on the compass. I had also made a sketch. Meanwhile the mounds, though a little lower, grew nearer to one another. Finally they formed such a stockade that I could not force my way through. The black boy still could, so I passed the packages to him between two columns of cement. Then I would squeeze through higher up. This lasted five hours, in which time we covered perhaps three hundred feet. I saw that we were accomplishing nothing, but I was in a fever. Not a fever, exactly, though I had a constant temperature of more than a hundred degrees— the climate must affect the brain. I took five sticks of dynamite and blew up the mound that stood in our way. We hid behind other mounds after I lit the fuse. The explosion was muffled. Its force went downward. The ground shook. But the other mounds remained standing. Of the one blown up, there were only large, crusty fragments— alive with writhing white bodies. Until now we had not harmed one another, but now the battle began. It was impossible to cross the crater made by the explosion. Tens of thousands of termites poured from the pit and spread in a mass like a wave. They felt their way over every inch of ground. I lit the sulfur put the tank on my back. You know what the device looks like, what gardeners use to spray shrubbery, or a flamethrower. The acrid smoke burst from a nozzle I held in my hand. I put on a gas mask, gave one to the boy, gave him also boots, specially made for the purpose, wrapped in metal netting. In this way, we were able to cross. I discharged a stream of smoke which drove off the termites. The ones that didn't retreat perished. In one place I had to use the gasoline, poured it out and lit it, creating a wall of fire between us and the torrent of termites. Some three hundred feet remained to the black termitarium. Sleep was out of the question. We sat by the continually belching tank, our flashlights on. What a night. Ever spend six hours in a gas mask? No? Try imagining what it is like to keep your face buried in hot rubber. When I wanted to breathe more freely, easing the mask away, I would choke on the smoke. And so the night passed. My boy shivered and shivered. I feared it might be a fever. The new day came, finally. 
We now had only one can of water left. It could last us, at best, if we drank sparingly, three days. It was necessary to return as quickly as possible. The professor stopped, opened his eyes, and gazed at the fireplace. The embers had turned completely gray. The lamp filled the room with a soft green light, as if filtered through a sheet of water. We reached the Black Mound. He raised his hand. Like a bent finger. Like this. Smooth surface, as if polished. The thing was surrounded by low mounds that were, curiously, not vertical, but inclined toward it. Larvae of stone making a grotesque obeisance. I gathered all my supplies at one point on this circle, it measured some forty feet around, and set to work. I didn't want to destroy the black mound with the dynamite. The moment we entered this area, the termites ceased appearing. At last it was possible to remove the mask from my face. What a relief! For a few minutes there was not a man on earth happier than I. The indescribable pleasure of breathing freely. And that mound, black, strangely bent, unlike anything I had ever known. Like a madman I danced and sang, not caring about the drops of sweat that rained from my brow. Poor Ouagadou watched, frightened. Perhaps he thought that I was worshipping before a black idol. But I sobered quickly. There was little reason for rejoicing. The water was running out. The dried food barely sufficed for two days. True, there were the termites. The natives considered them a delicacy. But I could not bring myself to. Hunger, however... He broke off. His eyes glittered. To make a long story short, I knocked down that mound. Old Nefo to Abe had spoken the truth. He leaned forward. His features sharpened. The words came in a rush. There was first a layer of fibers, of a material of unusual smoothness and strength, Inside, a central chamber surrounded by a thick coat of termites. Were they termites at all? I had never seen termites like these, enormous, flat like a hand, covered with silver hairs, and having funnel-shaped heads that ended in something resembling antennae. These antennae were all touching a gray object no bigger than my fist. The insects were extremely old, motionless, as if made of wood. They did not even attempt to defend themselves. The abdomens pulsed. But when I swept them from the central object, that round, strange thing, they perished instantly, came apart beneath my fingers like rotten rags. I hadn't the time or the strength to study all this. I took the object from the chamber, locked it in a metal box, and immediately headed back with my uagadu. I won't go into how I reached the coast, we encountered the red ants. I blessed the moment that I decided to drag back with me the single can of gasoline, if not for the fire. But enough of that. It's a separate story. I'll say only this. At the first stopping place I examined carefully the thing that I had taken from the black mound. When I cleaned off the deposits on it, it was revealed to be a perfect sphere of a heavy substance that was transparent, like glass, but having a much higher index of refraction. And then, there in the jungle, a certain phenomenon manifested itself. At first I paid no heed to it, thinking that I was imagining things. But when I reached the civilized areas on the coast, and afterward, I became convinced that it was not my imagination. He sank back into his chair, and almost completely in shadow, his head dark against the brighter background, said, I was plagued by bugs. Butterflies, moths, arachnids, hymenoptera, whatever you like. 
Day and night they followed me in a buzzing cloud. Or rather, not me, but my baggage, the metal case on box that contained the sphere. During the sea voyage, things were a bit better. Applying insecticides intensively, I rid myself of the pests. New ones didn't appear. There were none on the open sea. But the moment I landed in France, it began all over again. The ants were the worst. Wherever I stopped for more than an hour, ants showed up. Red ants, black ants, carpenter ants, pharaoh ants, large and small— they gathered at the box, engulfed it in a quivering mass, cut, ate through, destroyed all the coverings with which I had packed it, suffocated themselves, perished, ejected acid in an attempt to corrode the steel sides. He broke off. The house we're in now, its isolated situation, all the precautions I take, because I am constantly beset by ants. He got up. I conducted experiments. Using a diamond drill, I broke from the sphere a piece no larger than a poppy seed. It exerts the same power of attraction as the entire sphere. I also found that if I surrounded the sphere with a thick jacket of lead, the effect ceased. Rays of some kind, said the listener in a hoarse voice. As one hypnotized, he stared at the barely visible face of the old scientist. Possibly. I don't know. And you have the sphere? Yes. Would you care to see it? The listener jumped to his feet. The professor opened the door for him returned to the desk for the key, and hurried after his guest down the dim corridor. They entered a narrow cubicle without windows or furniture. In a corner stood a large, old-fashioned safe. Under the weak light of the naked bulb on the ceiling, the steel plates had a bluish cast. The professor inserted the key with a sure hand and turned it. With the grating sound of bolts withdrawing, the heavy door opened. He stepped aside. The safe was empty. Chapter 4 SETI The cabins of the physicists were located on the fourth deck. He could find his way around now on the Eurydice. He had studied the layout of the ship, so different from the ones he had flown— he did not know the names or purposes of many of the machines in the sternmost section, which was unoccupied and cut off from the rest of the hull by triple bulkheads. The grub leviathan was crisscrossed with connecting tunnels, like a secret network through an elongated cylindrical city. In his muscles was the memory of moving down narrow corridors, either oval in cross-section or circular like a well, where you floated weightless, here and there pushing lightly to change direction on the turns. But in freighters you could reach the hold more simply, via the ventilation shaft. All you had to do was turn on the air compressor and be carried in the roar of a strong wind, your legs dangling uselessly like vestigial organs. He found himself missing weightlessness, which he had cursed so many times when making repairs because Newton's laws kept reminding one of their existence. If he used a hammer without gripping something well with the other hand, he would end up doing cartwheels that were entertaining only to spectators. The elevators, actually wheelless oval cars with windows so curved that one saw one's own reflection in them distorted and reduced, moved without a sound, giving the numbers of the sections past and blinking at the right stop. The corridor had a rough yet deep carpeting. Around a corner disappeared a vacuum cleaner, looking like a turtle with wands, while he walked past a row of doors that bulged slightly, 
as the wall did, and that had high thresholds with brass fittings, no doubt to satisfy the whim of some interior decorator. It was hard to think of any other reason. He stood before Logger's cabin, suddenly unsure of himself. He was still unable to become one of the crew. Their friendliness at meals, the way one group and then another invited him to their table, seemed forced to him, as if they were trying to pretend that he was really one of them, and that his lack of an assignment was only temporary. True, he had talked with Logger, and Logger had assured him that he could drop in whenever he wished. But this, instead of giving him confidence, somehow put him on his guard. Logger was not just anyone. He was the number one physicist, and not merely on the Eurydice. He had never thought that he could be assailed with doubts about how to act with someone. Social grace was as out of place here as a parlor game in the vaults of the Great Pyramid. The door had no handle. A touch with the tips of the fingers, and it opened, so quickly that he almost drew back, like a savage before an automobile. A spacious room. He was struck by its disorder— among heaps of tapes, photographic plates, papers, and atlases stood a large desk, its top curved around in a half ring with a swivel chair in the center. Behind it, on the wall, was a rectangle of black with moving dots of light. On either side of this flickering control panel hung large photographs, lit up transparencies, of spiral nebulas and farther on were vertical, pillar-like cylinders, partly opened, full of pigeonholes for computer disks. In the left corner stood a huge rhomboid machine with a chair attached at the base. The thing went up through the ceiling, and from a slot under a binocular eyepiece emerged a tape in small jumps bearing some kind of graph. The tape collected in coils on the floor which was covered by an old Persian rug with a worn hieroglyphic pattern. It was the rug that amazed him. A cylinder column vanished, revealing an entrance to an adjoining room. Logger was standing there in linen trousers and a sweater with a head of overgrown hair and gave him a smile that was both understanding and innocent. The face was fleshy as of a child aged before its time, no more resembling the face of a creator of high abstractions than did Einstein's in the days when Einstein still worked in a government office. Hello, said the visitor. Enter, colleague, enter. It's good you came. At one blow you can delve into physics and metaphysics, he added in explanation. Father Arago is with me. The visitor followed Logger into the other cabin, which was smaller, with a covered bunk and several chairs around a table, at which the Dominican was examining a diagram through a magnifying glass, or perhaps it was the computerized map of a planet having lines of latitude across it. Arago pulled out a chair near him. The three sat down. "'This is Mark. You know him, father?' asked Logger, and before he could reply, went on. I can guess your problem, Mark. It's hard to have a man-to-man -man talk with a machine. The machine is not to blame, observed the Dominican, irony in his voice. It says what was put into it. That is what you put into it, the physicist corrected him with the smile of an opponent. The theories don't agree— not that they ever did. We are talking, Mark, about the fate of civilizations above the window, he explained to the visitor. But since you came in the middle of our argument, let me summarize the beginning for you. You're aware that the old notions about Etty have changed. Even if there are a million civilizations in the galaxy, their duration is so dispersed in time that it is impossible first to communicate with the host of a planet and then drop in on him. Civilizations are harder to catch than a mayfly that lives for one day. 
We look for pupas, therefore, and not the adults. Do you know what the window of contact is? Yes. All right, then. Having sifted through two hundred million stars, we came up with eleven million candidates. The majority have lifeless planets, or planets below the window, or planets above the window. Imagine, he clapped him on the knee, that you have fallen in love with the portrait of a sixteen-year-old girl. You set out to woo her. Unfortunately, the journey will take fifty years. You'll find an old woman, or a grave. If you decide to declare your love by mail, you'll be an old man yourself before you receive the first reply. And that, in a nutshell, is the basic idea of Setai. You can't hold a conversation at intervals of many centuries. So we're traveling to a pupa? asked Mark. For a while now, people called him that. But suddenly the thought occurred to him, he didn't know why, that the idea might have come from the monk, who, like himself, both was and was not a member of the crew. We don't know what we're traveling to, remarked Arago. Logger seemed pleased by these words. Quite. Life-producing planets are recognized by the composition of their atmospheres. The catalogue of these in our galaxy runs into the thousands. We've screened them all and have about thirty that offer hope. Of intelligence? Intelligence in diapers is invisible, and when it matures, out the window it flies. We have to pounce on it earlier. How do we know that our destination is worth the trouble? It's Kinta, the fifth planet of Zeta Harpii. We have a lot of data. Indubio pro reo, said the Dominican. And who, father, in your opinion, is the defendant? Logger asked, but again did not let him answer, continuing. The first cosmic symptom of intelligence is radio. Well before radio astronomy. Actually, not that much before. About a hundred years. A planet with transmitters can be detected when their combined power goes into the gigawatts. Kinta emits, in the high and ultra-high ranges, less than its sun, but a phenomenal amount for a lifeless planet. For a planet with electronics, a moderate amount, since it lies below the level of solar noise. But something is there in radio below the threshold. We have evidence— Circumstantial, the apostolic delegate corrected him again. True, and only one piece, agreed Logger. But more important, there have been observed on Kinta point bursts of electromagnetism, one of which was recorded, the whole emission, by a spectroscope from orbiters near Mars. Those two orbiters cost Earth a bundle. Our expedition— Atomic bombs? asked the man who was resigned to the name of Mark. No, rather the preliminaries to planetary engineering, because these were clean thermonuclears. Had things on Kinta taken the course they did on Earth, it would have started with the uranides. What's more, the bursts appeared only within the polar circle, that is, on their Arctica or Antarctica. One could melt a continental glacier in this way, but that is not the point on which we differ. He glanced at the Dominican. The question is whether or not our arrival will cause harm there. Father Arago believes it might. I am of the same opinion. Then what is the disagreement? I believe that the game is worth the candle. The exploration of a world without causing harm is impossible. Mark began to understand the gist of the debate. He forgot his own situation. The old fire returned to him. You, that is, father, are traveling with us against your convictions? He addressed the monk. Of course, said Arago. 
The church was among the opponents to the expedition. So-called contact could turn out to be the gift of a Trojan horse. Timeo Danaus et Dona Ferentes, a Pandora's box. You have become affected, father, by the mythological patronage of the project, laughed Lager. Eurydice, Hermes, Jupiter, Hades, Cerberus. We plundered the Greeks. The ship actually ought to have been named the Argo, with us as the Psychonauts. But we'll try to cause as little harm as possible. That's why the plan of the operation is so complex. Contra spem spero, sighed the monk. Or rather, he added, I wish to be in error. Logger seemed not to hear, taken with another thought. When we reach Kinta, at least three hundred years will have passed there for our one year of ship's time, which means that we will be catching them in the upper region of the window, if only not later. A difference of seconds in our maneuvers could hasten or delay us tremendously. As for harm, the Reverend Father knows that a technological civilization has inertia, though it is not stationary. In other words, it's not that easy to throw it off its course. Whatever happens, we will not be in the role of gods descending from heaven. We did not seek out primitive cultures, and there are no astroethnologists in Setae. Arago, silent, regarded the physicist with narrowed eyes. The listener to this conversation ventured a question. But does it make sense? Does what make sense? Logger was surprised. To treat the ones who are unobservable as if they did not exist. It may be practical, but... You could call it opportunism, too, if you wanted, replied Logger coldly. We chose a task that was possible to perform. The window of contact has an empirical frame, but there is ethical justification for it as well. We won't be anointing the heads of cave dwellers with oil distilled by the twenty-second century. But enough of this pluralis majestaticus. I stood by the project, and I'm here because for me, contact means an exchange of knowledge. An exchange, not a patronage, not a dispensing of melioristic advice. And what if evil reigns there? asked Arago. Does there exist a universal evil, a constant of evil? countered Logger. I fear there does. Then we would have to say non possumus and chuck the project. I am only doing my duty. With these words, the monk rose, nodded to them, and departed. Logger, sprawled in his chair, made a face, moved his lips as if there was a bad taste in his mouth, then sighed. I respect the man, because he can rile me. He tacks wings onto everything, or horns. But enough. That's not the reason I wanted to see you. We'll be sending a scout ship to Kinta. A single hull, able to land. The Hermes. It will fly nine or ten men. The captain and four have been decided on. The rest will be chosen, by specialty, in a ballot. Would you like to be on the ballot? At first, Mark did not understand. To set foot there. He burned. Disbelief. Joy. Logger, seeing how the man lit up, hastened to add, Getting on the ballot doesn't necessarily mean you're going. Scientific achievement isn't a guarantee either. The greatest theoretician could easily go to pieces. We need hard people, the kind that nothing will break. Jaber is a brilliant psychonicist, psychologist, an expert on minds, but courage isn't tested in the laboratory. Do you know who you are? He paled. No. Then I'll tell you. 
On the Burnham Glacier, a number of people in walking machines died. Geyser eruptions took them by surprise. These were professional operators carrying out instructions given them, and they had no idea that they were going to their death. Two men went in search of them voluntarily. You are one of those two. How can you know this? Dr. Gerbert told me that Dr. Gerbert and his assistant are ship physicians. They know their medicine, but are weak when it comes to computers. They decided to preserve medical confidentiality, since it proved impossible to establish the identity of the man resurrected. Psychic trauma, they argued. There's no eavesdropping on the Eurydice, but there is a center with non-erasable memory. The commander has access to it, the head informationist, and I. You won't tell the doctors, I hope? No, I didn't think you would. It would be doing them wrong. But won't they guess if I doubt it? The doctors have to monitor constantly the state of health of our entire crew, and the voting is secret. The council votes. Out of five votes, you should get three. That's my guess. And I'm telling you this now because you have a hell of a lot of work ahead of you. I know that on the simulators you showed an astrogational ability, but in obsolete categories, first class for those times not for today. You have a year to learn your interstellar ABCs. If you can handle that, you'll see the Kintons. And now go. I have a pile of things to catch up on. They rose. Mark was taller than the famous physicist and younger. He won't be going, he thought. Logger walked him to the door. But Mark did not notice this, did not see the darting lights on the black screen, did not remember if he said goodbye or even if he said anything, or how he got back to his cabin. He did not know what to do with himself. Going to the closet, he opened the wrong door by mistake, saw his face in the mirror, and murmured, You'll see the Kintons. So he began his studies. The result of the statistical calculations was, all in all, clear. Life arose and endured on planets for billions of years, but throughout that time it was mute. Civilizations sprang from it, not to perish, but to transform themselves into something extra-natural. Because the birth rate of technologies in an ordinary spiral galaxy was a constant, they came into being, matured, and disappeared with the same frequency. New ones were continually emerging, and they escaped from the interval of mutual understanding, the window of contact, before it was possible to exchange signals with them. The muteness of those existing primitively was obvious. But endless hypotheses were devoted to the silence of the highly developed. There was a whole library on the subject, which he avoided for the time being. In one book he read, At this moment, for this century, astronomically the same thing, it can be concluded that Earth is the only civilization already technological and still biological throughout the length, breadth, and depth of the Milky Way which seemed to lay to rest the plans of Setai. A hundred and fifty years went by before it turned out that this was not the case. The conquering of the space separating star from star so that some living intelligences could meet others and return was not accomplishable by simple flight. Even if the astronauts traveled at speeds approaching light, they would neither meet those to whom they were going, nor see again those who remained behind on Earth. At both destination and origin, many centuries would pass in the few years of ship time. This categorical declaration of science prompted the Church to reflect theologically as follows. 
He who created the world made the meeting of creatures from different stars an idle dream. He raised between them a barrier, completely empty and invisible, yet impossible to break, an abyss that he could cross, not man. Human history, however, invariably went in directions that were not predicted. The abyss of space turned out indeed to be a barrier that could not be broken, but it could be sidestepped through a series of special maneuvers. The median time of the galaxy was one value. The galaxy itself was a clock that indicated the hour of its age. But in places of the greatest intensity of gravitation, galactic time underwent violent changes. There were boundaries at which it stopped altogether. These were the Schwarzschild spheres, the black surfaces of collapsed stars. Event horizons. An object approaching such a horizon would begin to stretch in the eyes of a distant observer. It would disappear before touching the surface of the black hole, because time, dilated by gravitation, displaced light toward the infrared and then to longer and longer wavelengths, until finally not one reflected photon returned to the eye of the watcher. The black hole trapped within its horizon every particle and every scrap of light forever. In any case, a traveler approaching a black hole would be pulled apart, along with his ship, by the growing gravitation. Tidal forces there would lengthen any material object to a thread, and from the accretion disk formed around the black sphere, that thread would go into a nosedive from which there was no return. Flybys past the Collapsar star were impossible, along any trajectory. The tidal forces would kill the travelers and rip their ship to pieces. The ship could be the densest cosmic dwarf, a neutron star, a globe of atomic nuclei packed together into a solid, a solid compared with which the hardest steel would be as attenuated as a gas. It would make no difference. Even such a globe, the Collapsar would pull out into a spindle shape and would tear and swallow it in an instant, leaving behind only the death-throw flares of X-rays escaping into space. Collapsars that arose from stars a few times heavier than the sun were thus like sudden guillotines to wayfarers. If, however, the mass of a black hole was a hundred or a thousand times that of the sun, the gravitation at its horizon could be as weak as Earth's. No immediate danger would threaten the ship that ventured there, and the crew, moving toward such a horizon, could completely fail to notice it. But they would never be able to emerge from beneath that unseen shell. A ship drawn into a giant collapsar would be annihilated, plummeting to the center in a matter of days or hours, depending on the massiveness of the trap. The astrophysics at the close of the twentieth century drew such theoretical models of gravitational graveyards, but, as usually happened in the history of knowledge, the models proved insufficient. The reality was more complex. First, quantum mechanics had to be taken into account. Every black hole gave off radiation. The larger the black hole, the weaker the radiation. Giant black holes, usually found at the centers of galaxies, would also eventually die, though their quantum evaporation might take a hundred billion years. They would be the final relics of the former stellar splendor of the universe. Further diversification of black holes was discovered by subsequent calculation and simulation. A star, when it collapsed, its weakened centrifugal radiation no longer able to counteract its gravity, did not immediately assume the shape of a sphere. It oscillated, like a drop alternately flattened to a disk and then pulled into a cigar shape. This vibration was very brief, the frequency depending on the mass. The collapsar behaved like a gong, that struck itself. 
but a gong at rest could be made to vibrate by a blow. A black sphere, similarly, could be set to oscillating again by sidereal engineering. One had to know the method and possess sufficient power on the order of ten to the forty-fourth ergs, which would be beamed in such a way as to put the sphere in resonance. For what purpose? To create what the astrophysicists acquainted with the giant casually called a temporal onion. Just as the center of an onion was surrounded by layers of tissue, visible in cross-section like the rings of a tree, so a collapsar in resonance was surrounded by gravitationally curved time, or rather by a complex stratification of space-time. To a distant observer, a black hole appeared to vibrate like a tuning fork for several seconds. But for one who found himself in its vicinity, on a contour line of altered time, the readings of the galactic clock lost all meaning. Thus, if a ship came upon a black hole that warped the continuum multivalently along a gradient, the ship could enter a Brady chronality and remain for years in that zone of retarded time, before leaving the temporal port. To the eyes of the outside observer, the ship would vanish upon reaching the black hole and, after its invisible stop on the Brady chronality, emerge in nearby space. For the entire galaxy, for everyone watching the resonating collapsar from a distance, it would seem to oscillate in seconds between disc and cigar, exactly as it had oscillated in its violent birth when it was a star collapsed by gravity after the nuclear furnace went out. Whereas to the ship on the Brady chronality, time could come almost to a halt. But this was not all. The collapsar, vibrating, behaved not like a perfectly elastic ball, but rather like a non-uniformly distorting balloon on a bounce, due to the magnification of relativistic effects. Thus, with the Brady chronalities, retrochronalities could appear, currents or rivers of time flowing backward. For distant observers, neither one nor the other existed. To make use of these retardations or reversals of time, therefore, one had to enter them physically. The project planned to use the solitary collapsar above the constellation Harpy as a port for the Eurydice. The mission of the expedition was not to establish contact with just any civilization that lay within the interval of possible communication, but to catch a civilization that, like a skyward butterfly pursued by an entomologist, was on its way out the window, already fluttering at the upper edge. Indispensable for this operation was a parking place in time, at a distance from the inhabited planet, which would allow the human psychonauts to visit it before the civilization departed from Ortega and Nielsen's main road of development. To this end, the expedition was divided into three stages. In the first, the Eurydice would proceed to the collapsar in the constellation Harpy, chosen as a place for concealment, and temporal maneuvers. The collapsar was named, appropriately, Hades, because the Eurydice would be preceded by an unmanned colossus, a missile to be used only once, the Orpheus. It was a gravity gun, a gracer, gravity amplification by collimated excitation of resonance. At a signal from the Eurydice, it would set the black hole oscillating according to the latter's own natural frequency and amplitude. Although gigantic on the scale of Earth objects, the Orpheus was the tiniest speck compared with the mass of the collapsar it was to set in motion. But it could accomplish this through the phenomenon of gravitational resonance. Giving up its vibratory ghost to Hades, it would thereby induce in the collapsar a single contraction and dilation, whereupon that black hell, opening its abysses, would permit the Eurydice to enter and ride the vortex of Brady-Cronal currents. 
But first it was necessary to verify, from the ship, that the five light-year distant Kinta was in the prime of its technological era, and to determine, from that diagnosis, the right moment to visit it. Having fixed the moment, the Eurydice would then make a temporal harbor for herself in Hades, which would now be in vibration from the gracer emission of the Orpheus. As the Orpheus had enough power for only one discharge of coherent gravity, annihilating itself in that discharge, the operation could not be repeated. If it did not succeed the first time, because of a navigational error in the temporal storm, an incorrect diagnosis of the rate of development of the Kinton civilization, or any other factor not taken into account, the expedition would be a fiasco. Which meant, in the best case, returning to Earth empty-handed. The plan was further complicated by the decision to make use, within the hell of Hades, of retrochronalities, of time flowing in reverse of the time of the entire galaxy, so that the expedition could return to the vicinity of the sun less than twenty years after takeoff, even though a thousand parsecs separated the harpy from Earth. The exact date of return, of course, was indeterminate. A fraction of a second in the navigation through Brady and retrochronalities made a difference of years far from the presses and grinding mills of gravitation. His mind could not accept these statements. They were fraught with paradox. The main paradox was as follows. The Eurydice was to remain above the Collapsar in non-time, or in a time different from the ordinary. The reconnoiterers would fly to Kinta and return. This would take more than 70,000 hours, or roughly eight years. From the blow of the gracer, the collapsar was supposed to oscillate between a flattened disk and an elongated spindle for only a moment or two, to all distant observers. When the reconnoiterers returned, therefore, they would not find the ship in its collapsar harbor. The black hole would long before this have resumed the shape of a non-vibrating sphere. And yet the Hermes, leaving Kinta, was to find the mother ship in the temporal port, even though the port, having come into existence only to disappear immediately, would surely not be there when the Hermes got back. How could one thing be reconciled with the other? There are physicists, Logger explained, who claim to understand this the same way they understand what stones and cupboards are. What they understand, in fact, is only that a theory agrees with the experimental results, with measurements. Physics, my friend, is a narrow path drawn across a gulf that the human imagination cannot grasp. It is a set of answers to certain questions that we put to the world, and the world supplies the answers on the condition that we will not then ask it other questions, questions shouted out by common sense. And common sense? It is that which is understood by an intelligence using senses no different from those of a baboon. Such an intelligence wishes to know the world in terms that apply to its terrestrial biological niche. But the world, outside that niche, that incubator of sapient apes, has properties that one cannot take in hand, see, sniff, gnaw, listen to, and, in this way, appropriate. For the Eurydice in her collapsar port, the flight of the Hermes will take a couple of weeks. For the crew of the Hermes, the flight will take one and a half years, more or less. That's three months to Kinta, a year on Kinta, and three months back. For observers located neither on the Hermes nor on the Eurydice, the Hermes will complete its mission in nine years, while the Eurydice will disappear from sight for the same amount of time. According to the time measured on board the mother ship, she will pass from Friday to Saturday, return to Friday, and then the Collapsar will spit her out into space. Time will flow more slowly on the Hermes than on Earth because of its near-light speed. 
On the Eurydice, time, gravitationally dilated, will flow even more slowly and then reverse. She will descend from a Brady chronality to a retro chronality and from there jump to a galactochronal line. Emerging, she'll rendezvous with the Hermes in an unfolded space-time continuum. If the Eurydice miscalculates by seconds, navigating the variochronalities, she will not rendezvous with the Hermes. There is no contradiction in this, so to speak, on the world's part. The contradictions arise from the disparity between a mind born in the negligible gravity of Earth and phenomena pertaining to gravities trillions of times greater. It is that simple. The world is ordered according to universal rules, called laws of nature, but the same rule may manifest itself differently at different intensities. Take, for example, a man falling into a black hole. For him, space takes on the aspect of time, because he is no longer able to retreat in it, just as you cannot step backward in terrestrial time, that is, into the past. It's impossible to imagine what such a fall would be like, assuming, of course, that one didn't perish immediately beneath the event horizon. I still believe that the world is arranged in our favor, since we can nevertheless gain mastery over things that run counter to our senses. Consider, a child masters a language without understanding the principles of its grammar, its syntax, or the internal contradictions of speech that are hidden from the speakers. You've got me philosophizing now. A man craves ultimate truths. Every mortal mind, I think, is that way. But what is ultimate truth? It's the end of the road, where there is no more mystery, no more hope, and no more questions to ask, since all the answers have been given. But there is no such place. The universe is a labyrinth made of labyrinths. Each leads to another. And wherever we cannot go ourselves, we reach with mathematics. Out of mathematics, we build wagons to carry us into the non-human realms of the world. It is also possible to construct out of mathematics worlds outside the universe, regardless of whether or not they exist. And then, of course, one can always abandon mathematics and its worlds to venture with one's faith into the world to come. People of the ilk of Father Arago occupy themselves with this. The difference between us and them is the difference between the possibility that certain things will come to pass and the hope that certain things will come to pass. My field deals with what is possible accessible. His with what is only hoped for, which becomes accessible face to face only after death. What did you learn when you died? What did you see? Nothing. Therein lies the differentia specifica between science and faith. As far as I know, the fact that those resurrected saw nothing has not shaken the dogmas of religion. The latest eschatology of Christianity holds that a person resurrected forgets his sojourn in the hereafter, that by an act of divine censorship, they don't put it that way, of course, man is forbidden to hop back and forth between this world and the next. Credenti non fit in iuria. If it is worth living by such a stretchable faith as Arago does, how much easier is it to accept the paradoxes that allow you to pay a visit to the Kintons? Trust in physics the way Arago trusts in his religion. Though physics, unlike religion, is fallible. The choice is yours. Consider. And now go. I have work to do. It was midnight when he got back to his cabin. He thought, in turn, about Lager and the monk. The physicist was where he belonged. But the other? 
What did the monk hope for or count on? Missionary work? Had modern theology indeed built an annex to accommodate the extraterrestrial recipients of God's bounty, and was Arago to be its spokesman? Why did he say in the conversation that evil might reign there? Only now did it dawn on him, the fear in which the man must be living. Not fear for himself, fear for his religion. The monk could consider redemption a gift intended only for humanity, while participating in an expedition to non-human beings, to a place, in other words, where his gospel did not reach. He could think that. And, believing in God's omnipresence, he therefore would believe in the omnipresence of individual evil, because the demon who tempted Christ predated the Annunciation and Immaculate Conception. Then, did the monk carry his dogmas with him, the dogmas by which he lived, to put them in jeopardy? He shook his head and sighed. Logger he could ask any question. But the monk? No. The gospel made no mention of what Lazarus had to relate after his resurrection, and so he himself could in no way assist Father Arago, though he had risen from the dead. Religion, in self-defense, gave such resurrections a different, secular, this-worldly name, and therefore was not shaken. Not that he was any expert on religion— but he understood the painful isolation of the monk, for he himself had been isolated, a helpless, passive castaway taken on board by chance, though no longer. He began to undress for bed, listening to the silence of the Eurydice. She flew near the speed of light. Soon she would be reversing the drive— the clocks in all the quarters would start the countdown, giving the crew time to lie on their bunks, on their backs, and strap themselves in. The spheres of the hull would make a 180-degree turn inside their armored segments. Everything would spin, a moment of confusion, vertigo, then steady, once more still and peaceful. Rather than lash the stern, the flame of the drive would then hurtle along the bow, forward. Communication with Earth would improve somewhat because of this. News could reach the Eurydice, news many years old, of those whom the crew had left behind on Earth. He would receive no such laser letter, having no one left on Earth. Instead of a past, however, he had a future— a future for which it was worth living. The prehistory of the expedition was full of conflict. The project had had a multitude of opponents. Its chance of success, calculated variously, could not be great. A catalog of the accidents that in one way or another could cause the destruction of the expedition numbered in the thousands— Perhaps it was for this reason that the project had been carried out. Its seeming impossibility, its dangers, constituted a challenge magnificent enough for people to come forward and undertake. Before the Eurydice blasted off with growing acceleration, the cost of the enterprise had grown at an even higher exponential rate, as was pointed out by the opponents and critics. But the investments already made possessed their own momentum and drew other investments after them. The financial side of the project occasioned a rumbling no less than titans upon the takeoff of the Eurydice. The traveler, in his reading, skipped these preliminary crises involving the building of the ships and the repercussions on Earth, such as the manufacturing defects that led to political corruption scandals— what did this matter to him, who was on board and on his way? On the other hand, he studied the history of astronautics, records of transolar flights and unmanned probes to Alpha Centauri, and accounts filled with the names of the workers of Grail and Romden, in the hope that he might recognize among them people he had once known well, 
and possibly be able to follow the thread of that recognition back to the enigma of himself. There were moments, before sleep or on waking, when he felt close to remembering, particularly since in more than one dream he knew who he was. But all he retained, waking, was the empty certainty of that identity. A year passed. The Eurydice, breaking, lost its near light speed relative to the Collapsar, which now loomed like a real hole, an absence of stars, in the sky. Training, learning, reading, he abandoned his efforts to remember. And yet, though he was now chosen to be one of the co-pilots of the Hermes, in his dreams at night, about which he told no one, he was still the man who had entered Burnham Wood. Chapter 5 Beta Harpii The Eurydice lost speed, cutting her drive for a few days along a trajectory called an involute toward Beta Harpii, which was invisible, being the Collapsar. She had already crossed, at a considerable distance, some buckled isograbs, whose gravitational tides were endurable so far by the crew and by the ship. The course, optimal, chosen by computer, was safe, but safe did not mean problem-free. The isograbs, lines connecting points of space of the same curvature, writhed on the screens like snakes in black flame. Those who were stationed in the parking room, the control room that ran the ship only under wild variation of gravitational fields, watched the flickering displays before them, drank beer from cans, and made small talk to pass the time. The fact was that the men were a tradition, a relic from the era of classical astrogation. No one now would even dream of switching the controls to manual. No man possessed reflexes quick enough. The Collapsar belonged to a category discovered late and with great difficulty. It was solitary. Easiest to locate were those that belonged to binary systems, having companion stars that were alive, for example, that shined, and from which they stripped the upper layers of atmosphere. The material was drawn in a contracting spiral toward the black hole, to fall into it to the accompaniment of bursts of the hardest X-rays, the gases torn from the companion surrounded the Collapsar in an accretion disk, a giant plane highly unhealthy for all objects, including rockets. No ship could navigate such a region. Before it would be sucked into the event horizon, the radiation would destroy both human brain and computer. The solitary Collapsar in the constellation Harpy was discovered thanks to the perturbations it produced in the Alpha, Gamma, and Delta stars, appropriately named Hades, with a mass 400 times that of the Sun, it betrayed its increasing presence by the lack of the stars which it occulted and by the apparent crowding of stars around its perimeter, as it was a gravitational lens for their light. The surface of annihilation rotated at the equator at two-thirds the speed of light, and the centrifugal and Coriolis forces made it bulge so that Hades was not a perfect sphere. But even if the event horizon were spherical, gravitational storms came and went over it, compressing and stretching the isographs. The possible causes of these storms, or cyclones, were provided by eight theories, each one different. The most imaginative theory, not necessarily the closest to the truth, maintained that Hades was connected, in hyperspace, to another universe, which gave evidence of itself by producing shock waves in the terrible pit of the Collapsar, the center, the singularity, the place without dimension, without time, where the curvature of the continuum acquired a value infinitely great. The theory of the other side of the Hades nucleus, whose infinite space-time compression somehow presented no problem for the transfinite engineers of the alien universe, was really a mathematical fantasy spun by astronomers intoxicated with teratopology, the latest and highly fashionable grandchild of Cantor's ancient theory. 
They were even going to christen the Collapsar Cantor, but its discoverer preferred using mythology. Neither SETI headquarters on Earth nor the command of the Eurydice was particularly concerned about what took place beneath the event horizon for practical, obvious reasons. The horizon was an uncrossable boundary, and regardless of what it covered, it very definitely represented death. Flying in high vacuum above Hades, the Eurydice responded with appropriate maneuvers to each change in gravitation. Firing from her rockets, streams of heavy elements synthesized from hydrogen and deuterium by the Olimos cycle. Shedding billions of tons, she cleverly maintained stability, while Hades, bound by the laws of conservation, supplied the vessel with a sizable portion of the energy released by all that it swallowed and buried forever in its interior. This was roughly like a balloon holding altitude at the price of ballast thrown overboard. But only roughly. No pilot would have been able to negotiate such a course. The segmented hull of the ship, made of rings connected by swivel joints, resembled from a distance a mile-long earthworm that writhed like a white comma above the immensity of the black hole. It would have made an interesting sight, no doubt, but there was no observer, and could be none, since the valiant companion of the Eurydice, the Orpheus, which was to open the gates of hell for her, was unmanned. In constant laser communication with the giant nymph, it awaited the signal that would turn it into a resonance bomb, a single pulse gracer. A similar, though thousand times smaller, gracer had been tested in the solar system and in the process deprived Saturn of its second largest moon. When even the laser contact began to worsen, the Orpheus received the final program and, obediently falling silent, commenced the countdown in its machine centers. It drew closer to the Collapsar than the Eurydice. Light and every kind of related electromagnetic wave smeared and bent, driven through the infrared to the radio and ultra-radio bands. As Hades twisted the surrounding space and time above its horizon of destruction, the Eurydice made the final critical observations of Kinta, the fifth planet of the sixth sun of the Harpy, the real destination of the expedition. Ejected previously into space far from the Collapsar, cameras took pictures of the previously into space far from the Collapsar, cameras took pictures of the planet, using no little aperture two astronomical units. The image, or rather the three-dimensional model, of Kinta took focus on the holovision. A hazy, blue-speckled, cloud-covered sphere hung in the auditorium between the many-leveled galleries. No one, true, watched it there. The holoscope had supposedly been installed in the auditorium because it was donated to the expedition by a Japanese firm for purposes of advertising the product to planetariums on Earth. But though the spectacle was dramatic, it was of no real use to the astrophysicists. They had accepted it because the whole apparatus took up little room in the walls of the forward observatory room, while the planet scope, placed under a transparent dome, filled, ornamentally, the empty center. Visitors came to view the images of nebulas or planets inside it. There was no other way to look at the cosmic scenery, the hull of the Eurydice being windowless. The survivor from Titan now had a last name, Tempe. Tempe was the valley in which Orpheus first met Eurydice. The name was given him by Tur Harab during a confidential meeting of the scout ship's full crew. Actually, it may not have been Tur Harab who named him. On that occasion, Mark received the position of second co-pilot of the Hermes, and the commander, announcing the assignments, pretended not to notice anything. Logger denied authorship, or rather dodged the question with the joke that they had all fallen under the influence of Greek mythology. As long as the constant gravity on board allowed, as the ship lost speed, Mark visited Logger frequently and listened to his debates with Gold and Nakamura, the astrophysicists. These debates usually turned on the mystery of the civilizations above the window, 
the ones that had departed from the main road in Ortega and Nielsen's diagram. Since nothing was known about their fate, they offered no small challenge to the imagination. The opinions held by the majority of those fascinated by the mystery could be divided roughly into two schools, according to the reason for the silence, whether it was sociological or cosmological. Gold, though a physicist, held to a sociological explanation, an extreme one called sociolysis. The first thing a society did upon entering an era of technological acceleration was to disturb the living environment. Later it might wish to rescue that environment, but conservation measures would prove insufficient, and the biosphere would be replaced, of necessity, inevitably, by artifacts. There would arise an environment completely transformed, though not artificial in the human sense of the word. Artificial, to humans, was what they produced themselves. Natural was what remained untouched, or was only harnessed, like water turning a turbine, or like cultivated earth subjected to agricultural procedures. Above the window, this distinction ceased to exist. If everything became artificial, then nothing was artificial. Production, intelligence, science were transplanted into the surrounding world. Electronics, or its unknown counterparts and manifestations, took the place of institutions, legislative bodies, government, schools, hospitals. The ethnic identity of national collectives disappeared, borders disappeared, along with the police and the courts and the prisons. Then one might have a second stone age, universal illiteracy and idleness, Employment would not be required for survival. Anyone who wanted could have employment, of course, because everyone could do absolutely whatever he liked. This did not have to mean stagnation. The environment was an obedient guardian, and to the extent that it was able, it could change itself according to wishes or demands. Could it change so that progress would take place? We had no answer for that, since we ourselves assigned to the concept of progress different meanings, depending on the historical moment. Could one call scientific progress a situation in which intellectual, creative, cognitive, and constructional activities were so specialized that in each profession one dug deeper in an ever-narrower plot of ground? If machines counted faster and better than a living being— why should the living being count? If photosynthesis systems produced food that was more nutritious and varied than what farmers, bakers, chefs, and confectioners could supply, then why till the soil, or grind flour, or bake bread? A civilization in such sociolysis did not broadcast in every direction of the heavens its recipe for the perfect life. And why should it? when it no longer even existed as a union formed by an unsatisfied hunger of stomachs and minds. The result would not be a society, but an enormous collection of individuals, and it would be hard indeed to find one individual who would choose as his life's work the signaling, on a cosmic scale, of how he was getting along. The artificial environment would unquestionably be designed by its engineers so that it could not ever acquire the attributes of a planetary personality. Such an artificial environment would be no one, like a meadow, forest, or steppe, with the difference that it would grow and blossom not on its own, not for itself, but for someone, for beings. Would they become stupid from this? turning into dull-witted gluttons that whiled away their hours with toys provided by the planetary guardian? Not necessarily. It depended on the point of view. What was delusion or idleness for one man might be, for another, a life's passion. We had no standard to measure and evaluate, particularly in the case of other beings on another world in another period of a history different from our own. But Nakamura and Lager favored the cosmological hypothesis. He who explored space would perish in space. Not that he would lose his life. 
the aphorism had a completely different meaning. Astronomy, astrophysics, space travel, these were but the small, modest beginnings. We ourselves had taken the next step, learning the rudiments of sidereal engineering. And it was not a matter of expansion, the so-called shockwave of intelligence of yore, where intelligence, taking possession of its own and then its neighboring planets, was supposed to spread in a stellar emigration throughout the galaxy. For what purpose? To increase the population density of space? No, it was not a matter of crescite et multipla camini, but concerned things that we could not understand, let alone characterize. Could a chimpanzee understand the labors of a cosmologist? Was the universe nothing but a very large pie, and a civilization, a child, trying to consume the pie as quickly as possible? The notion of invasions by aliens was a projection of the aggressive traits of the predatory, barely civilized ape-man. If he himself willingly did unto others as he would rather not be done by, then he pictured the advanced civilization on much the same principle. Flotillas of galactic battleships were supposed to fall on unsuspecting little planets to lay hands on the local dollars, diamonds, chocolates, and, of course, beautiful women, for whom aliens had about as much use as we did for female crocodiles. How, then, did those above the window occupy themselves with activities beyond our conception? Yet, at the same time, we could not accept that they were beyond our conception. Here we were about to make a hole in Hades, in the temporal onion, in order to hide in it. But we were not playing hide-and-seek. We wished to catch a civilization before it flew out the window. The probability of future expeditions with the same goal was minuscule. Our descendants would, perhaps, even pay tribute to us, the kind of tribute we paid to the Argonauts who went in search of the Golden Fleece. Yusupov, who also dropped in on Lager, described this view of civilizations beyond the interval of contact as knowledge by unknowledge. But eventually he had to drop out of the discussions, because the proximity of the goal required his almost constant presence at the control center. Mark Tempe, who knew that he had another name, but said nothing, out of consideration for the doctors, studied the roster of the crew of the Hermes before bed. Of the ten, he knew only Gerbert well, and from the get-togethers at Loggers, the short, dark-eyed Nakamura. About the captain under whom he would be serving, he knew next to nothing. The man's name was Steergard. He was Terharab's second in command and his additional specialty was sociodynamic game theory. Every participant of the reconnaissance mission had to have a field that duplicated someone else's, so that in case of accident or illness, the functioning of the team would not be impaired. The gravistician Polasser was in charge of the drive on the Hermes. Mark knew him only as an excellent swimmer and diver in the pool on the Eurydice, where he had admired the man's muscular body performing triple twists off the highboard. That was not the place to acquaint oneself with sidereal engineering, so Mark tried tackling the subject on his own. In vain. The introduction to it required a familiarity with the sophisticated offshoot of the theory of relativity. The first pilot was Harrick, large, heavy, irascible. He also knew information theory and shared with the astrometrician Albright the care of the Hermes computer. Or, as that computer once put it, the two humans were entrusted to its care. This was a computer of the last generation, last because no other could have greater calculating power, Limits were imposed by such properties of matter as Planck's constant and the speed of light. Greater calculating ability could be achieved only by the so-called imaginary computers, designed by theorists engaged in pure mathematics and not dependent on the real world. The constructor's dilemma arose from the necessity of satisfying mutually exclusive conditions to pack the most neurons 
into the smallest volume. The travel time of the signals could not be longer than the reaction time of the components. Otherwise, the time taken by the signals would limit the speed of calculation. The newest relays responded in one hundred billionth of a second. They were the size of atoms, so that an actual computer had a diameter of barely three centimeters. A computer any larger would be slower. The Hermes computer did indeed take up half the control room, but that was for its peripherals, decoders, hierarchic assemblers, and so-called hypothesis generators, which, with the linguistic modules, did not operate in real time. But decisions in critical situations, in extremis, were made by the lightning swift core, which was no bigger than a pigeon's egg. It was named Deus. Digital and Gramic Universal System. Not everyone believed that the acronym was accidental. The Hermes was equipped with two deuses. The Eurydice had eighteen. In addition to Stiergard, Nakamura, Gerber, Polasser, and Harrick, all of whom had been chosen for the reconnaissance mission prior to takeoff, Arago was to participate in it as a reserve physician. An unexpected result of the secret balloting, and there was Tempe in the post of second pilot, the logician Romant, and two men selected out of a dozen exobiologists and other experts from the presidium of SETI on Earth, Kirsting and El Salam. In the last weeks of the voyage, the ten took quarters in the fifth section of the Eurydice, which contained an exact mock-up of the interior of the Hermes, so that they could become familiar both with each other and with the task ahead of them. Every day they played out on the simulators different variants of the approach to Kinta, as well as the tactics of establishing contact with its inhabitants. Another of the men from SETI, Chu. Running these simulations, saw to it that the future crew of the Hermes got to know one another well, throwing them into the most fiendish emergencies, where accidents coincided with other accidents, or with a flood of incomprehensible signals imitating the voice of the alien planet. No one knew how or why it happened, but during this time, the apostolic delegate began to be called not Father but Doctor Arago. Mark had the impression that the priest himself preferred this. Then the simulations were cut short. Ter Harab summoned the reconnaissance group to brief them on the latest observations of the Zeta system. Of the eight planets of that tranquil Class K star, the four inner ones, small with masses on the order of Mercury or Mars, showed a good deal of volcanic activity and hardly any atmosphere. In the distance, Zeta was orbited by three gas giants like Jupiter, ringed with powerful, stormy atmospheres of super dense hydrogen. Septima, twice as heavy as Jupiter, threw off into space more energy than it received from its sun. Little would have been required to kindle it into a star. Only Kinta, having a one and a half year period of revolution around Zeta, shone blue like Earth. Breaks in the white clouds revealed the outlines of oceans and continents. Observation at a distance of nearly five light years presented considerable difficulties. The resolution of the optical instruments on the Eurydice was not adequate to the task, nor were the images beamed from the orbiters that were sent out sharp enough. Kinta was in its second quarter from the Eurydice's vantage. Half the disk was illuminated. Over it, the spectral lines of water and hydroxyl in large concentrations had just been discovered, as if right at the equator, Kinta was encircled by a belt of remarkably compressed water vapor. Yet the belt lay above, outside the atmosphere. The possibility of an ice ring was suggested, whose inner edge touched the top layer of the atmosphere, which meant that before long it would break up. The astrophysicists estimated its mass to be between three and four trillion tons. If the water came from the ocean, the ocean would have lost about twenty thousand cubic kilometers, not more than one percent of its volume. As it was impossible to find any natural cause for this phenomenon, engineering became highly probable. 
undertaken for the purpose of lowering the level of the seas, thereby uncovering the continental shelves and creating additional dry land for settlement. On the other hand, the whole operation seemed poorly executed. The frozen fraction of the ocean not put into an orbit high enough would have to fall back down after a mere several hundred years. Given the scale of the project, this seemed strange, incomprehensible. Things even more mysterious, events, could be observed on Kinta. The electromagnetic noise, emitted unequally from many places on the planet, intensified considerably, as if hundreds of Maxwellian transmitters had been turned on at once. At the same time, the radiation in the infrared increased, with small flashes at the centers. These could be mirrors focusing sunlight for power plants, but then it turned out that the thermal component of that emission was not great. The spectra of the flashes were not copies of the spectrum of zeta, as they would have been in the case of reflection, nor did they resemble the spectra of nuclear explosions. Meanwhile, the radio noise continued to grow, short wave and medium wave, in many bands. The meter-length emission had the look of being modulated. This produced great excitement, particularly when someone garbled the news to the effect that the radiation was directed like radar, or, in other words, that the planet had already noticed the eridice. The astrophysicists ignored this rumor. No kind of radar could have detected the ship near the collapsar. The mood at zero hour was jubilant. Beyond all doubt, Kinta was inhabited by a civilization so advanced technologically that it had entered the cosmos not merely in small craft, but with a power able to lift oceans into space. Preparations for takeoff of the scout ship took place in an altered orbit, in the relatively calm aphelion of Hades. The piping of the piezoelectric indicators, showing the constant change in stresses in the ribs and girders of the hull, died away. At the same time, on the screens of the takeoff control center, blank until now, there appeared, at an angle, a glowing spiral arm of the galaxy, and with good will and a little imagination, one could pick out, among the whitish, motionless swirls of stars and the dark dust clouds, Zeta Harpii. Its planets were not optically visible. The technicians readied the Hermes for unmooring. In the storage bays at the stern, cranes swiveled. The flanges of the pipes in which the Eurydice filled the hypergolic fuel tanks of the scout ship shuddered under the pressure of the pumps. The head staff checked the systems. Drive, navigation, air control, the dynatrons, once through dais and once without, employing parallel lines. One by one, the numbered units announced that their programs were ready. Radio rangefinders and antennas protruded and moved like the horns of a giant snail. The deep base of the turbines that pumped oxygen to the tunnels in the hold of the Hermes sent subtle vibrations through its dock-shaped bed. During all this Ant-like bustle, the billion-ton Eurydice slowly turned her stern in the direction of Zeta Harpii like a cannon about to fire. The crew of the Hermes parted with the commander and their best friends. There were too many people on board the mothership for everyone to shake hands. Then Terhorab, with those who were able to leave their stations, escorted the crew of the Hermes and stood in the cylindrical passage between the sections, while, after the closing of the large dock gate, the small personnel hatches were shut, and, as on a launching chute, the Hermes began to move gradually, white as snow, pushed inch by inch by hydraulic jacks, since the 180,000-ton mass, though weightless, preserved every bit of its inertia. The technicians of the Eurydice, with the biologists Davis and Varadian, were already putting the crew of the Hermes to sleep, a sleep that would last many years, but without ice or hibernation. Instead, they were subjected to embryonization, a process in which people returned to a life before birth, a fetal existence, or at least strikingly similar, no breath, underwater. 
Man's first small steps into space had shown how very terrestrial a creature he was, how poorly adapted to the powerful forces required by the crossing of great distances as rapidly as possible. Violent acceleration crushed the body, especially the lungs, which were filled with air. The force flattened the rib cage and stopped the circulation of the blood. If the laws of nature could not be bent, then one had to change the astronauts to conform to them. Embryonization accomplished this. First, the blood was replaced with an oxygen-carrying fluid that also possessed other properties of blood, from coagulability to the immunological functions. This fluid, white as milk, was onax. After the body's temperature was lowered to that of hibernating animals, closed vessels were surgically reopened, vessels through which the fetus at one time had exchanged blood with the placenta in the mother's womb. Though the heart continued to work, respiration ceased in the lungs, which collapsed and filled with onax. When there was no air remaining in either the rib cage or the intestines, the unconscious man was immersed in a liquid as incompressible as water. The astronaut then was locked inside an embryonator, a container in the shape of a two-meter torpedo that kept the body above freezing and supplied it with nutritive substances and oxygen. Onax was pumped into the organism by artificial vessels through the navel. A man thus prepared could withstand tremendous pressures without harm. Like bathypelagic fish which were not crushed at depths of miles beneath the ocean because the outside pressure equaled the pressure within their tissues. The liquid in the embryonator was kept, therefore, at hundreds of atmospheres per square centimeter of body surface. Each such container on the ship was held in swinging suspension by pincers. The astronauts lay in their armored cocoons like giant pupas, in such a way that acceleration and deceleration hit them always chest first. The bodies, now more than 85% water and onax, already airless, were as compression-resistant as water. Thanks to this, there was no problem in maintaining a constant acceleration of 20 Gs, at which a body weighed two tons, and moving the ribs to breathe would have been a task beyond even an athlete. But the embryonized did not breathe, and the limit of their durability for stellar flight was fixed only by the delicate molecular structure of the cells. When ten hearts in full embryonizative compression were beating only a few times a minute, Deus assumed charge of the unconscious, and the people of the Eurydice returned on board. The operators then disconnected the computers of the mothership from the Hermes. Except for the dead cables, nothing now joined the two craft. The Eurydice ejected the scout ship from her wide-open stern, which was ringed with the giant plates of an expanding photon mirror. Her steel claws, extending, tore away the useless cables like threads and thrust the hull of the Hermes into the void. Then the Hermes' side engines glowed with pale ionic flame. But the impulse was too weak to move it from its place. Such an enormous mass could not acquire speed suddenly. The Eurydice drew in her catapults and closed the stern, and everyone observing the takeoff from her control room breathed a sigh of relief. Deus, correct to the fraction of a second, took over. The hypergolic boosters of the Hermes, silent until now, fired. To build impetus, the batteries fired in sequence. At the same time, the ionic engines blazed full force. Their blue, transparent flame mixed with the blinding glare of the boosters. The hull, wrapped in shimmering heat, moved smoothly, evenly into the eternal night. In the darkened control room, the reflection from the screens made the faces of those who stood by the commander deathly pale. The Hermes, sending toward them a lengthening tail of steady flame, grew more distant as its speed increased. When the telemeters indicated the necessary distance, and when at the edge of the field of vision an empty cylinder tumbled end over end in freefall, 
Up to the last minute, it had connected the Hermes and the Eurydice, and now, shot by the starting salvos, it flew off into the darkness, the mirror of the billion-ton ship locked in place. Through the central opening, the blunt cone of an emitter slowly emerged. It flashed once, twice, three times, until a column of light stabbed space and hit the Hermes. In both control rooms of the Eurydice, there was a triumphant cheer, and, it must be confessed, an exclamation of surprise, too, that the thing had gone off so well. The Hermes soon vanished from the visual monitors. The screen showed only dwindling, glowing circles, as if an invisible giant had lit a cigarette among the stars and blown rings of white smoke. Finally, these rings fused into a trembling point that was the mirror of the scout ship reflecting the Eurydice's driving laser. Terhorab returned to his cabin before the scene was over. He had seventy-nine difficult hours ahead of him, of sidereal manipulations with the gracer of the Orpheus to create a temporal port in the gravitational resonances, and then to enter it or rather to become submerged in it, since this meant being cut off completely from the outside world. The ignition order sent to the Orpheus took two days to reach it, and it was in that time that the several strange phenomena took place on Kinta. Up until the moment that their instruments were totally blinded, the astrophysicists tuned into the entire galactic emission from the region of the Harpy. The spectra of the Alpha, Delta, and Zeta stars in no way changed, which was an important test of the quality of the reception of Kinta. The radiation reaching the Eurydice from the planet was filtered, and the different exposures were compared, superimposed, and sharpened by computer cascade amplifiers. At the highest visual magnification, the Zeta system was a spot that a matchhead held at arm's length would cover. The attention of the planetologists was focused, naturally, on Kinta. Its spectro and holograms created not so much an image of the planet as a computer guess. Because the source of information was diverging photons spread out erratically over the whole spectrum of radiation, there was, at the observatory on the Eurydice, just as at the observatories on Earth long ago with the first telescopes, no agreement on the critical question of what was actually seen and what only seemed to be seen. The mind of man, like any system processing information, could not draw a sharp line between certainty and conjecture. Observation was hindered by Kinta's sun, Zeta, by the gas plume of its largest globe, Septima, and by the strong emission of the stellar background. So far it was found that in many physical respects, Kinta did resemble Earth. The atmosphere contained 29% oxygen. There was plenty of water vapor and about 60% nitrogen. The white polar caps, having a high albedo, could be seen even from the vicinity of Earth's sun. The ring of ice must have arisen during the flight of the Eurydice, or at least reached the proportions that made it visible. Now, viewed from the cosmic neighborhood, the artificial nature of Kinta's radio intensity was beyond question. Discharges from atmospheric storms could not possibly have been a factor. In radio intensity in the short wave range, Kinta equaled the corresponding emission of its own sun. The same thing had happened with Earth after the global spread of television. The results of the observations made shortly before the plunge into the gravitational harbor were a shock. Terhorab immediately summoned the experts. The Council's only line of action was to diagnose as quickly as possible what was taking place on the planet and to send that message after the scout ship. The message, coded in the alphabet of high-energy quanta, would overtake the Hermes and its unconscious crew. Deus would receive the message and convey it to the people upon their reanimation at the edge of the Zeta system. The stellar message was to be encoded so that only Deus could read it. Caution was indicated. The changes on Kinta were alarming. 1. 
several series of brief flashes above the thermosphere and ionosphere of the planet had been recorded, also between it and its moon, about 200,000 kilometers from Kinta. The flashes lasted 30 to 40 nanoseconds. Spectrally, they matched the solar emission with the radiation cut off in the infrared and ultraviolet. 2. After each of these series of flashes, which took many hours, there appeared on the face of the planet in the intertropical zone dark streaks on both sides of the ice ring. 3. At the same time, the emission of approximately meter-length waves increased, exceeding all previously observed maxima while the emission of the southern hemisphere weakened. 4. Immediately before the Council met, a bolometer, aimed at the center of the planet's face, registered a sharp drop in temperature on the order of 180 degrees Kelvin, with a slow return to equilibrium. The cold spot had an area equal to Australia. At first, the cloud cover vanished above the spot, surrounding it on all sides with a very bright embankment of clouds, before the clouds returned, the bolometer located the cold source at a single point in the exact center of the spot. Thus, the sudden cooling had expanded from a source of unknown nature in a circular front. 5. On Kinta's large moon there appeared, in the dark hemisphere not facing the sun, a point flash that flickered, moved independently of the motion of the moon's surface as if, just above the crust, through an arc of one ten-thousandth of a second, a flame traveled, made of atomic plasma at a temperature of a million degrees Kelvin. 6. As the Council began deliberating, the cold spot disappeared beneath the clouds, and then the cloud cover obscured the surface of Kinta to an extent unprecedented, 92% of the planet's face. The opinions of the specialists, as one might have guessed, were divided. The first hypothesis that leapt to mind, of nuclear explosions, whether as tests or as warfare, could be discarded without further discussion. The flashes had nothing in common spectrally, either with explosions of the uranides or with thermonuclear reactions. The exception was the plasmatic spark on the moon, but its thermonuclear spectrum was continuous. One thought of an open hydrogen-helium reactor in a magnetic vice. To the nucleonics people, the purpose of such a reactor was a mystery. The flashes in space nearer the planet could come from specially tuned lasers hitting metallic objects, nickel and magnetite meteors, possibly, or from the collision of bodies of high iron, nickel, and titanium content if they collided head-on and at speeds on the order of 80 to 100 kilometers per second. But neither could one rule out as a source converter mirrors, which absorbed a portion of the sun's waves, exploding because of malfunctions. The council got into a heated debate. The experts disagreed with one another. There was talk of climate control with the aid of very large photoconverters and of photoelectric cells, which, however, had no connection with the focus of cold at the equator. But the most astounding thing was the result of the Fourier analysis done on the entire radio spectrum of Kinta. All trace of modulation disappeared, while at the same time the power of the transmitters increased. A radio location map of the planet showed hundreds of transmitters of white noise, which merged into shapeless blotches. Kinta was emitting noise on all wavelengths. The noise was either the scrambling of broadcast signals, or a kind of coded communication concealed by the semblance of chaos, or else it was chaos indeed, created intentionally. Tur Horab demanded an immediate answer to the question of what should be beamed to the Hermes within the next few hours, since all contact with it would be severed after that. More to the point, for what should the reconnoiterers prepare themselves, and how should they proceed once they were in the Zeta system? The reconnaissance program had been worked out long before, 
but it was obviously impossible for them to have taken into account the phenomena just observed. At first, no one was anxious to take the floor. Finally, the astrometician to him, as a spokesman for the advisory group SETI, said with undisguised reluctance that no helpful advice could be sent to the Hermes. They should list the facts, provide a hypothetical explanation, and rely on the independent judgment of the crew. Ter Horab wanted to hear some hypotheses. It did not matter if they were mutually contradictory. Whatever the changes on Kinta are, they are not signals directed at us, said to him. On that we are all agreed. Some believe that Kinta has noticed our presence and is preparing itself in its own way to receive the Hermes. This is not an idea based on rational data. It is simply, in my opinion, an expression of anxiety, or, to put it plainly, fear. A very old and primitive fear, which at one time gave rise to nightmares of cosmic invasion. I consider such an explanation of the phenomena to be nonsense. Terhorab preferred specifics. The people of the reconnaissance mission could decide for themselves whether they should be afraid or not. It was the mechanism of the new phenomena that interested him. Our astrophysicists have specific hypotheses. They can present them, replied to him, unruffled by the sarcasm of the commander's words, since it was not directed at him. Who? asked Terhorab. To him indicated Nystet and Fecto. The jumps in temperature and albedo could have been caused by a meteor swarm entering Kenta's system and colliding with artificial satellites. That could have produced the flashes, said Nystet. How do you explain the similarity of the surface flashes to the spectrum of Zeta? Some of the satellites of Kenta could be hunks of ice broken off from the outer edge of the ring— they would reflect the sunlight in our direction only at certain angles of incidence and reflection, randomly. They would be irregular solids with different orbital moments. And what about the cold spot? asked the commander. Who knows the possible ways it could have come about? That's unclear, though we could come up with some natural mechanism. An ad hoc hypothesis, to him remarked. I talked this over with the chemists, said Logger. An endothermic reaction could have taken place there. I'm not comfortable with such an oddity, I admit, but there are compounds that absorb heat when they react. The accompanying circumstances, however, point to something more dramatic. To what? asked Terhoreb. An unnatural cause, though not necessarily one that has intention. For example... An accident in some enormous refrigeration devices, in cryogenic equipment, like a fire in an industrial complex, but with a negative sign. But this doesn't seem very likely to me either. I have no facts on which to base such an assertion, none of us have, but the very proximity and time of all these changes suggests that they are somehow connected. The value of your hypothesis also has a negative sign, said one of the physicists. I don't think so. The reduction of many unknowns to a common unknown denominator represents a gain, not a loss, in information, replied Logger easily. Please go on, the commander said to him. Logger stood. I'll say what I can. An infant, smiling, smiles according to assumptions that it has brought with it into the world. These assumptions, of a statistical nature, are multitudinous that the pinkish blobs its little eyes perceive are people's faces, that people usually react positively to the smile of a baby, and so on. What is your point? That everything is based on certain assumptions, though the assumptions, as a rule, are made silently. Our discussion deals with events that appear very improbable as a series of unrelated things— the flashes, the chaotic emission, the changes in Kinta's albedo, the plasma on the moon. What caused them, you ask? The activity of a civilization. Does this clarify anything? On the contrary, it mystifies, because we began with the tacit assumption that we would be able to understand the actions of the Kintons. Mars, as I recall, was once considered old, and Venus young in comparison with Earth. 
the great-grandfathers of our astronomers automatically assumed that Earth was the same as Mars and Venus, except younger than the first and older than the second. Hence, the canals of Mars, the wild jungles of Venus, etc., which eventually all had to be chucked out as fairy tales. I don't think anything can behave as unintelligently as intelligence. There may be a mind on Kinta, or minds, inaccessible to us because of a difference in purposes. War? The voice came from the back of the hall. Logger, still standing, continued. War is not an absolutely closed set of conflicts with destruction as the resultant. Commander, don't count on being enlightened. Since we know neither the initial states nor the parameters, nothing can turn the unknowns into knowns. All we can tell the Hermes is to proceed with caution. You would prefer more specific advice? I can only offer two possibilities. The actions of those intelligences are unintelligent, or else unintelligible, not fitting in the categories of our thought. But this is only an opinion, nothing more. Chapter 6 Kinta Before the plunge, the radio locators tracked the Hermes for the last time, showing how it described a great hyperbola across the firmament, rising higher and higher above the arm of the galactic spiral, in order that in deep vacuum it could travel near the speed of light. Then the radio echoes began to arrive at increasing intervals, a sign that the Hermes was experiencing relativistic effects and that its onboard time was diverging from the time of the Eurydice. All contact between the scout ship and the mothership terminated when the signals from the automatic transmitter grew in wavelength, spread to bands of many kilometers, and weakened. The last signal was noted by the most sensitive indicator, in the seventieth hour after the start, just as Hades, hit by the suiciding Orpheus, groaned in gravitational resonance and opened wide its temporal chasms. Whatever might happen to the scout ship and the men locked within it would have to remain unknown for many years of their time. For those who slept the sleep of embryonization, a sleep like death, devoid of dreams or any awareness, through dreams, of the passage of time, the flight had no duration. Over the white sarcophagi in the tunnel-like embryonator, through the armored glass of the periscope, shone Alpha Harpii, a blue giant that had been deflected from the other stars of the constellation by one of its own asymmetric eruptions, as it was young and not yet stabilized after the nuclear ignition of its interior. When the Eurydice vanished, Deus took over the controls. The Hermes, having climbed above the ecliptic, plummeted like a stone toward Hades, initially retreating from the star of its destination in order to reach it more easily at the gravitational cost of the Collapsar. Circling the Collapsar, it received from its field a hefty push. Then, at a speed approaching light, the Hermes extended from its sides the intakes of the flow stream reactors. Space was so empty that the collected atoms were insufficient for ignition. Deus, therefore, excited the hydrogen with injections of tritium until the synthesis finally started. The throats of the engines, black until now, filled with light that pulsed faster and more intensely. Fiery columns of helium spouted into the darkness. The Eurydice's laser had given the scout ship less help at the takeoff than expected, since one of the hypergolic boosters misfired, which moved the stern mirror off course, and then the Eurydice disappeared, as if swallowed by the void. But Deus quickly made up for the loss, with power borrowed from Hades. At ninety-nine percent of the speed of light, the space in the engine intakes grew denser. There was more than enough hydrogen. The constant acceleration increased the mass of the scout ship. Deus held to twenty Gs without the least deviation. 
The structure, designed to withstand four times such thrust, suffered no damage. But no living organism larger than a flea could have borne its own weight on that flight. Each man weighed over two tons. Under that crush he could not have moved his ribs if he had had to breathe, and his heart would have burst trying to pump a fluid far heavier than liquid lead. But they did not breathe, and their hearts now did not beat, though they lived. The crew lay in the same liquid medium that had replaced their blood. Pumps that would have functioned at a hundred times the gravity, though the embryonized could not have endured that, pushed onax through their vessels, and the hearts contracted once or twice a minute, not working, but instead passively moved by the influx of the life-giving artificial blood. At the right moment, Deus executed a change of course. Heading now straight for the corrotating swirl of stars of the galaxy, the Hermes threw out in front of its prow a protective shield. The shield preceded the ship by several miles. Seemingly stationary at that distance, it served as a radiation screen. Otherwise, as the speed mounted, cosmic rays would have destroyed too many neurons in the human brains. The blue alpha now shone astern. Inside the long tunnel hold of the Hermes, however, it was not completely dark. The insulation around the reactors allowed microscopic leakage of quanta, and the walls glowed with Chernikov radiation. This pale twilight seemed quiescent, perfectly still, unchanging. Only twice, through the thick window in the barrier that separated the embryonator from the upper deck, were there sharp, sudden flashes. The first time, a control monitor of the protective shield, blank until then, blazed a cold white and immediately went out. Deus, awakened in a terrasecond, gave the necessary order. Current turned levers, the prow of the ship opened and spat flame. A new shield, ejected forward, replaced the one destroyed by a handful of cosmic dust. The dust, from the speed of impact, had turned the shielding disk into an incandescent cloud of split atoms. The Hermes flew through this solar firework, which then stretched far in its wake and pressed on. The auto required a few seconds to stop the unwanted lateral motion of the new shield, whose port and starboard orange lights blinked more and more slowly, as if a sleepy black cat were winking meaningfully at Deus. Then everything was again still on the ship, until the next striking of grains from a meteorite or comet tail, when the operation of renewing the protective shield was repeated exactly. Finally, the flickering electrons in the cesium clocks gave the awaited signal. Deus did not need to look at any indicators— the indicators were its senses, and it read their state directly with its brain, which, because of its three-centimeter size, the jokers of the Eurydice had called the bird brain. Deus kept careful track of the luminal readouts to maintain the course during the reduction of the drive. The engines, cut and turned around, began to break the ship. This maneuver, too, was carried out perfectly. The guiding stars did not so much as budge in the sights, so there was no need for any programmed correction of the trajectory. The idea was that the reduction of a near-light velocity to a parabolic velocity with respect to zeta, that is, down to some 80 kilometers per second per microparsec before reaching Juno, the outermost planet of the system, would require a simple reversal of the drive, until it went out by itself from lack of hydrogen. Then the hypergolics could be used for braking. But Deus had received the warning from the Eurydice in time, and before beginning the reanimation procedures, it reprogrammed the approach. The technological, artificial, nature of both the light from hydrogen-helium exhaust cones and the flame of self-igniting fuels was easily identified. And Deus's first rule now was that of extremely limited trust in our brothers in intelligence. 
It had never studied the Bible, had never analyzed the incident of Cain and Abel, yet it shut off the flowstream engines in the shadow of Juno and used the planet's gravity to reduce speed and change course. The second gas globe of Zeta served it to drop down to a parabolic velocity. Only then did it activate the reanimators. At the same time, it sent remote-control robots outside to place on the nozzles of the stern and prow a camouflaging device, an electromagnetic mixer. From now on, the flame of the drive would be blurred, its radiation spectrally dispersed. The most delicate stage of the braking occurred at the threshold of the system behind Juno. Deus planned and performed it deftly, as befitted a computer of the ultimate generation. It simply had the Hermes cut through the upper layers of the gas giant's atmosphere. A cushion of blazing plasma was created before the ship. Losing speed in it, Deus wrung everything it could out of the Hermes air control system to keep the temperature in the embryonator from rising more than two degrees. In an instant, the plasma cushion destroyed the protective shield, which, in any case, was to have been discarded. The shield was replaced by one of another type, for protecting against dust and comet fragments in planetary orbits. The Hermes was blinded in the fiery passage, but cooled while still in Juno's cone of shadow. Deus made sure that the flaming clouds caused by the braking maneuver, practically prominences, subsided on the heavy planet in accordance with Newton's laws. Thus, not only the presence, but the trail of the Hermes was effaced. The ship, engines extinguished, drifted in a far aphelion, while in the embryonator all the lights went on and the heads of the medicoms hung over the containers, ready to begin. According to the program, Gerbert was to be the first to awaken, to intervene as a doctor should intervention be necessary. But here the sequence of the procedure was broken. The biological factor, despite everything, remained the weakest link in the chain of these complex operations. The embryonator was housed in the middle deck and, compared with the ship, was a microscopic shell surrounded by many layers of armor and by anti-radiation insulation. It had two escape hatches that led to living quarters. The center of the Hermes, called the village, was connected by shafts to the two-level control room. Between the forward bulkheads ran decks with a row of laboratories equipped to function in weightlessness as well as under gravity. The power stores were situated at the stern, in annihilative containers, in the sidereal engine room not accessible to personnel, and in chambers that had a special purpose. Between the outer and inner hulls of the stern were concealed landing gear units, for the ship was able to set down on planets, standing on extended, jointed girder legs. But first the strength of the ground would have to be tested, because on each one of the craft's enormous paws would rest 30,000 tons of weight. In the ship's midsection, on the starboard side, reconnaissance probes were stored, with their accessories and attachments. On the port side were service robots and search robots capable of long, independent reconnoitering by flight or on foot, and these included striders. When Deus turned on the reanimation systems, the Hermes was weightless, a favorable condition for the operation. Roused first, Gerbert regained a normal pulse and body temperature, but did not awaken. Deus examined him carefully and hesitated, faced with a decision. It was compelled to act independently. More precisely, it did not hesitate, but compared various probability distributions of success. The result of this anamnesis was binomial. Deus could either reanimate the captain, steer guard, or take the physician from the embryonator and transport him to the operating room. It did as a man who, in the face of unknowns, flips a coin. 
When one does not know which course is better, the best tactic is to make a purely random choice. The random generator indicated the captain, and Deus obeyed it. Two hours later, Steergard, still half-conscious, sat up in the open embryonator, tearing through the transparent membrane that clung to his naked body. He looked around but did not see the one who should have been standing over him. The speaker was saying something. He realized that the voice was mechanical, that something had happened to Gerbert, though he had difficulty understanding the words that were repeated over and over. When he tried to get up, he hit his head against the not fully raised lid of the embryonator, which dazed him for a moment. The first sound of human speech in the Zeta system was an obscenity. Beads of sticky white fluid flew from Steergard's hair onto his face and chest. He straightened too quickly and, somersaulting with bent knees, flew down the tunnel, past all the containers of people, to the hatch in the wall. His shoulders pressed against soft padding in the corner between the hatch frame and the ceiling. Wiping from his eyes the milky fluid, which stuck to his fingers, he took in the whole cylindrical interior of the embryonator. In the gap between the rows of sarcophagi with their raised lids, the door to the showers was now open. He listened to the machine voice. Gerbert, like the others, was alive, but had not awakened when his umbilical cord was disconnected. It could not be anything serious. The electroencephalograms and electrocardiograms were perfectly normal. Where are we? he asked. Behind Juno. The flight went smoothly. Should I move Dr. Gerbert to the operating room? Steergard considered. No, I'll look at him myself. What's the condition of the ship? Fully functioning. Did you receive any radio messages from the Eurydice? Yes. What level of importance? First, should I give the text? What does it concern? A change of plans. Should I give the text? How long is the message? 3,660 words. Should I give the text? Summarize it. I cannot summarize unknowns. How many unknowns? That, too, is an unknown. During this exchange, Steergard kicked off from the ceiling. Flying toward the green and red light above Gerbert's cryotainer, he was able to get a glimpse of himself in the mirror in the passageway to the showers. A muscular torso glistening with onax, which still trickled in beads from the stump of the tied umbilical cord, as if of an enormous newborn. What happened? he asked. Wedging his bare feet under the doctor's container, he put a hand on his chest. The heart beat steadily. On the slightly parted lips of the sleeper was viscous white onax. Give what's definite, he said. Meanwhile, he pressed his thumbs behind the man's jaw, looked into the mouth, felt the warmth of the breath, put a finger between the teeth, and carefully touched the palate. Gerbert started and opened his eyes. They were full of tears, as bright and clear as water. Steergard noted with quiet satisfaction the effectiveness of so primitive a method of reviving. Gerbert had not awakened because the clamp on the umbilical cord was not completely shut. Steergard pinched the catheter, which snapped away, squirting white fluid. The cord closed itself off. With both hands, he pressed the man's chest, feeling the skin stick to his palms. Gerbert stared at him, wide-eyed, as if astounded. Everything's okay, said Steergard. The one he was massaging did not seem to hear. Deus! Yes? What happened? The Eurydice or Kinta? There were changes on Kinta. Give the general picture. A picture of unclear things is unclear. Tell what you know. Before the plunge, high-frequency jumps in the albedo took place. Radio emission went to 300 gigawatts of white noise. On the moon, a white point moved, recognized as plasma in a magnetic vice. Recommendations? 
Caution. Camouflage. Specifically, what are we to do? To use our best judgment. The distance to Kinta? One billion three hundred million miles on a straight line. The camouflage? I have done it. Mixers? Yes. Have you changed the program? Only for the approach. The ship is in the shadow of Juno. And the ship is all right? Fully functioning. Should I reanimate the crew? No. Have you observed, Kinta? No. I lost cosmic velocity in the thermosphere of Juno and... Fine. Now be silent and wait. I will be silent and wait. An odd beginning, thought Steergard, still kneading the doctor's chest. The doctor sighed and moved. Do you see me? The naked captain asked him. Don't speak. Blink. Gerbert blinked, then smiled. Steergard was covered with sweat, but continued to massage him. Diatocokinesia? he suggested. The man lying prone closed his eyes and with an unsteady hand touched the tip of his nose. Then they looked at each other and grinned. The doctor bent his knees. You want to get up? Don't rush. Saying nothing, Gerbert gripped the sides of his bed and lifted himself. But instead of sitting up, he rose into the air. Careful, zero-G, Steergard reminded him. Easy. Now fully conscious, Gerbert looked around the embryonator. How are the others? he asked, brushing aside the hair stuck to his forehead. The reanimation is underway. Should I help, Dr. Gerbert? asked Deus. It's not necessary, said the doctor. One by one, he himself was checking the dials above the sarcophagi. He touched chests, thumbed eyelids open, tested the conjunctival reflexes. There was a rush of water and exhaust fans from the bathroom. Steergard was taking a shower. By the time the doctor got to the last one, Nakamura, the captain, already in shorts and a black Trico T-shirt, had returned from his cabin. How are the men? he asked. All healthy. Romont has a trace of arrhythmia. Stay with them. I'll read the mail. News? News five years old. Good or bad? Enigmatic. Terhoreb advised a change of program. They saw something on Kinta before the plunge. Also on the moon. What does it mean? Steergard stood at the door as the doctor helped Romont to his feet. Three men were already washing themselves. The others floated around, met, looked in the mirror, all trying to talk at once. Let me know when they come around. We have time. With these words, the captain pushed off from the hatch, flew between naked bodies as if among white fish underwater, and disappeared into a passage to the control room. After considering the situation, Steergard took the ship up above the ecliptic plane, emerging from the cone of shadow at the lowest drive to make the first observations of Kinta. It shone as a crescent near the sun, completely covered with clouds. Its noise had increased to 400 gigawatts. The Fourier analyzers showed no kind of modulation. The Hermes was now wrapped in a veil that absorbed non-thermal radiation so that it could not be located by radar. Steergard preferred to err on the side of caution. A technological civilization meant astronomy, and astronomy meant sensitive bolometers, whereby even an asteroid, warmer than space, could call attention to itself. To the water vapor now used for maneuvering, he added some sulfides, the kind abundant in seismic gases. Volcanically active asteroids were a rarity, true, especially with a mass as small as that of the scout ship, but the circumspect captain sent out probes, then aimed them back at himself to make sure that the use of the vapor jets necessary for future flight corrections would go unnoticed even when the vessel eventually descended to Kinta. His intention was to steal up on the side of the moon in order to examine it in detail. 
By now, everyone was gathered in the zero-gravity control room. It resembled the inside of a large globe with a conical recess closed in by a wall of monitors. The seats were covered with a fastening material. If you gripped the arms and pressed your body down into the chair, the fabric would hold you firmly. If you wanted to get up, you pushed away in one strong motion. It was simpler and better than straps. They sat, all ten of them, as in a small projection room, and forty screens showed the planet, each in a different range of the spectrum. The largest, central monitor could synthesize the monochromatic images, superimposing them as instructed. Through the breaks in the clouds, furled by trade winds and cyclones, deeply notched, blurred coastlines appeared. The light, filtered in stages, allowed them to see now the cloud surface and now the surface of the globe concealed beneath it. Meanwhile, they listened to the lecturing monotone of Deus, which repeated the last radiogram from the Eurydice. Lobianco had raised the possibility of seismically caused damage to the technological infrastructure of the Kintons. Field and a few others held to this hypothesis, which they termed environmental. The inhabitants of the planet had thrown part of the ocean waters into space in order to increase the land area. The pressure exerted by the ocean on the ocean floor decreased, and as a result, the equilibrium in the lithosphere was disturbed. The upward force from within produced great cracks in the crust, which was thinnest beneath the ocean. Therefore, the hurling of water into space was discontinued. In short, the enterprise backfired catastrophically. But others believed that this hypothesis was false, as it failed to take into account additional incomprehensible phenomena. Moreover, beings able to work on the planetary scale would surely have foreseen the seismic consequences. According to calculations that used Earth as a model, cataclysmic movements of the lithosphere could not be produced by the removal of less than one quarter of the ocean's volume. The reduction of pressure from the ejection of even six trillion tons of water would not cause global devastation. Another hypothesis suggested a disaster of the chain reaction type as the undesired effect of gravitological experiments gone out of control. Other notions included the deliberate destruction of an outmoded technological base, a kind of demolition, the unintentional disruption of the climate during the hurling of water into space, and civilizational chaos of unknown causes. None of the hypotheses was able to encompass all the observed phenomena to form a coherent whole. Thus, the radiogram sent by Tur Horab immediately before the Eurydice's entrance into Hades authorized the reconnoiterers to act independently and to dispense with any or all of the established variants of the program, if they saw fit. If they saw fit. Chapter 7 Hunting At the aphelion of Zeta, far from its larger planets, Steergard put the ship into an elliptical orbit so the astrophysicists could make their observations of Kinta. As usual in such systems, there were drifting remnants of old comets, comets stripped of their gas tails and broken into frozen boulders by repeated passages past the sun. Among these scattered rocks and patches of dust, Deus noticed, 4,000 kilometers away, an object unlike a meteor. Touched by the radio locator, it gave a metallic reflection. It could not be a hunk of magnetite with a high iron content. The shape was too regular. It resembled a moth with a short, thick abdomen and blunt stubs of wings. Four degrees warmer than icy rock, it did not rotate as a meteor or the fragment of a comet core should have, but traveled straight, with no sign of propulsion. Deus examined it in all the spectral bands until it discovered the reason for the thing's stability. 
a faint outflow of argon, an attenuated stream, and therefore barely visible. It could be a space probe or a small ship. Let's catch that moth, Steergard decided. So the Hermes was set on a trajectory of pursuit. At less than a mile from the prey, it discharged a missile that had prehensile arms. The snare opened its jaws wide, exactly over the back of the peculiar moth, and grasped the thing's sides as in a vice. The thing, inert, seemed to fly passively in the grip, but after a moment its temperature rose, and the stream of gas at its rear intensified. The monitor, till now showing the close correlation between the hunt program and its progress, flashed question marks. Turn on the absorption field? asked Deus. No, said Steergard. He watched the bolometer. The trapped object heated to three hundred, four hundred, five hundred degrees Kelvin, yet its drive increased only slightly. The temperature curve peaked, then fell. The captured thing cooled. What's the drive? asked the captain. Everyone in the control room was silent, looking from the visual monitor to the side screens, which were for emissions outside the visible range. Only the bolometer glowed. Radioactivity zero? Zero, Deus assured the captain. The jet is weakening. What now? Nothing. We wait. They flew thus for a long time. Why not take it on board? El Salam suggested finally. We could X-ray the thing first. No point. It's dead. The drive is out and cold. Dea, show it up close. Through the electronic eyes in the pincers, they saw a black carapace, pockmarked and corroded. Take it on board? asked Deus. Not yet. Tap it a couple of times. Not too hard. From between the long-armed pincers emerged an oval-ended rod. Methodically, it struck the held hull, raising a fine spray of ash flakes. It might have a non-percussive detonator, remarked Pulasser. I think I would X-ray it. All right, Steergard agreed, unexpectedly. Deus, run an SG on it. Two spindle-shaped probes shot from the prow caught up with the squat moth and aligned themselves on either side of it. The upper monitors in the control room came to life, showing tangled strips, bands, shadows, and simultaneously atomic symbols appeared along the edges of the screens. Carbon, hydrogen, silicon, manganese, chromium. The columns of letters lengthened until Romant said, This is no good. It should be taken on board. Risky, muttered Nakamura. Better to take it apart by remotes. Deus, asked the captain. It is possible. It will require five to ten hours. Should I begin? No. Send a teletome. Let it cut open the hull in the thinnest place and give us a picture of the interior. Bore and brooch? Fine. The probes surrounding the prey were joined by another. A diamond drill met with a hull no less hard. Only a laser, Deus decided. A problem. Use the minimum pulse so as not to melt anything inside. That I cannot guarantee, replied Deus. Should I laser? Delicately. The drill retracted and disappeared. On the pitted surface, a white point glowed, and when the smoke cleared, a telephoto head entered the melted hole. Its monitors showed blackened tubing that went into a bulging plate, and the whole image trembled slightly. Then Deus spoke. Caution. According to the SG, at the center of the object are excitons and virtual particles warping configurational Fermi space. How do you interpret that? asked Steergard. The pressure at the center is over 400,000 atmospheres, or else this is a Hollenbach quantum effect. A kind of bomb? No, 
Probably the power source. The propellant was argon. There is none left. Can we take it on board? We can. The net energy of the whole is equal to zero. Except for the physicists, no one had any idea what this meant. Shall we? The captain asked Nakamura. The Japanese smiled. Who am I to argue with Deus? He turned to El Salam. And what do you think? El Salam nodded. So the trophy of the chase was drawn into a vacuum chamber in the prow and surrounded for safety with absorption fields. No sooner had they completed this operation than Deus announced another discovery. It spotted an object considerably smaller than the first, covered with a substance that absorbed radar waves. What gave it away was the spin resonance of the material. The thing was a squat cigar, with a mass of some five tons. Again the orbiters went out, and after heating the insulation, tore it from the gleaming metal of the spindle. Attempts to make the object react were fruitless. It was a corpse. A melted hole gaped on its side. The condition of the rim indicated that the hole was not very old. This prize, too, was put on board the ship. The hunting had gone well. Problems arose only in the examination and dissection of the double find. The first wreck, its two hundred ton body resembling an enormous turtle, betrayed by its rough shell pitted from countless collisions with micrometeorites and dust, an age of probably a hundred years. Its orbits of Phelion went beyond the outermost globes of Zeta. The anatomy of the solidly armored turtle surprised the dissectors. The report was in two parts. In the first, Nakamura, Rahman, and El Salam agreed in their description of the devices found inside the alien artifact. In the second part, however, their opinions as to the purpose of those devices differed widely. Palasar, who also participated in the examination, questioned the speculations of both physicists. The report, he said, was worth about as much as an account of an Egyptian pyramid by pygmies. Agreement on the building material told nothing about the structure's purpose. The old satellite possessed a peculiar power source. It contained piezoelectric batteries that were charged by a converter of a type the physicists had never seen before. The electric cells compressed in a multi-cascade bank of purely mechanical pressure amplifiers, produced current while returning to position in pulses through a system of coils with phase impedance. But the cells could also give sudden and full discharges if the sensors in the hull short-circuited the reactance coils. In that case, the whole current, coursing through the two-spool drum, would explode it in a magnetic burst. Between the accumulators and the housing were empty bags or pockets filled with cinders. Into these ran glass-like tubes, the inside surface a dull mirror. Perhaps they were eroded fiber optics. Nakamura's guess was that this wreck had at one time become overheated, which burned out some of its units and destroyed the sensors. But Romant thought that the destruction was caused not by heat, but rather catalytically, as if microparasites, non-living, of course, had chewed through the satellite circuitry in the front section, and this long ago. The inside surface of the hull was covered with several layers of cells, somewhat like a honeycomb except much smaller. Only by chromatography was it possible to identify, in their ashes, silico-amino acids, amino acids based on silicon with double hydrogen bonds. It was here that the dissectors disagreed. Palasser thought these remains were of interior insulation for the hull. Kirsting, on the other hand, said they were from a system halfway between living tissue and non-living, the product of a technobiology of unknown origin and function. There were long, heated arguments. The people of the Hermes had before them evidence of the level of Kinton technology 
a hundred years ago. Roughly speaking, the theoretical basis for this engineering could be compared to earth science at the end of the twentieth century. At the same time, intuition, more than anything concrete, suggested that the basic direction of development of the alien physics had even then begun to deviate from the terrestrial. There could be neither synthetic virusology nor technobiotics without, first, a grasp of quantum mechanics— but quantum mechanics immediately led to the fission and fusion of atomic nuclei. In that period, the best energy source for satellites or interstellar probes was the atomic micropile. And yet there was no trace of radioactivity in this old satellite. Could the Kentons have skipped the stage of explosive chain reactions in nucleonics and gone right to the next stage of the conversion of gravity into the quanta of strong interactions? But the piezoelectric battery contradicted that. The second satellite was worse yet. It had a battery of negative energy, the result of motion at near-light velocity through the gravitational fields of large planets. Its pulse drive had been smashed by whatever had aimed and hit it, perhaps a gigajoule shot of coherent light. It, too, showed no radioactivity. The internal struts were made from monomolecular carbon in bundles of fibers. No small accomplishment in solid-state engineering. In the uncrushed section behind the power chamber, they found cracked tubes with superconducting compounds that, unfortunately, ended right where the most interesting thing had been, as Pilassar lamented. What could it have been? The physicists got into speculations that they would not have dared touch in more mundane circumstances. Perhaps the wreck contained a generator of unstable, super-heavy nuclei, of anomalons. But for what purpose? If it was a robot laboratory for research, that would make sense. But was it? And why did the melted metal behind the place of the hit resemble a kind of archaic induction coil, and the superconducting niobium alloy showed, in the unbroken lengths, cavities, parts eaten away by endothermic catalysis, as though some sort of erosion viruses had fed on the current, or, rather, on the superconductor itself. Even more curious were the small centers of destruction found in both satellites, these localized ravagings could not have been caused by any violent action from without. Most often the compounds of the wires had been bitten through or gnawed at, producing tiny bead-like hollows. Ramont, called in as a chemist, concluded that this was the work of highly active macromolecules. He was able to isolate a number of them. They had the shape of asynchronous crystals and preserved their selective aggressiveness. Some attacked only superconductors. He showed his colleagues, under the electron microscope, how the non-living parasites ate their way into the filaments of a superconducting niobium compound, multiplying as more and more material was devoured. He did not think that these viroids, as he called them, could have arisen spontaneously in the heart of the satellite, he assumed that the apparatus had been infected with the viroids during its original assembly. For what reason? An experiment? But in that case, why send the satellites out into space? Then there was the notion of premeditated sabotage during the construction of the devices. According to such an idea, a conflict lay behind these phenomena, a clash of opposing intentions. Some among the crew thought this conception smacked of anthropocentric chauvinism. Could not the problem have indeed been an ailment of the apparatus on the molecular level? Something on the order of a cancer in non-living mechanisms that had a subtle and complex microstructure. The logician chemist ruled out this possibility for the first older satellite, the turtle, which they had called the moth during the chase. For the second, however, he could not rule it out with the same certainty. 
Although they did not understand the purpose for which both space vehicles had been constructed, the progress in engineering that had taken place over the time between the building of the first and the second was striking. Notwithstanding, the erosion viruses had found vulnerable places to feed in both satellites. Once on the trail of this idea, Romont could not and did not want to abandon it. The microelectronic examination of the samples taken from both captured devices proceeded rapidly, since the analyzer running it was under Deus's control. Without that high-speed assistance, even a year would not have sufficed for the necrohistology. The results indicated that certain components of both satellites had acquired a kind of resistance to the catalytic corrosion, and in a way so narrowly defined, so specific, that one could speak of an immunological reaction by analogy to living organisms and microbes. In their imagination formed the image of a micro-military struggle, a war conducted without soldiers, cannons, bombs, and where the secret weapon, extremely precise, was a semi-crystalline pseudoenzyme. As sometimes happened in a stubbornly pursued investigation, the total sense of the discoveries made, instead of simplifying, actually became more and more complicated as the work progressed. The physicists, Romont and Kirsting, now practically never left the ship's main laboratory. On non-living culture dishes, dozens of varieties of defense and attack compounds multiplied. At the same time, the line between what constituted an integral part of the alien machinery and what had invaded it to destroy it grew fuzzy. Kirsting observed that in general no such line existed in any strictly objective sense. Suppose that there arrived on Earth an extremely wise supercomputer, which knew nothing about the phenomena of life because its electronic forebears had long ago forgotten that they had been built by biological beings. It saw and studied a man who had, one, a cold, and two, colon bacilli in his intestines. Was the presence of viruses in the nose of the man his integral, natural property, or not? Suppose the man, in the course of being examined, fell and acquired a lump on the head. The lump was a hematoma beneath the skin. The vessels suffered damage. But the lump could also be considered a kind of shock absorber created to protect the cranium from the next blow. Was such an interpretation impossible? It seemed comical to us, but this was not a joke. It concerned the whole scientific approach to the non-human. Steergard, listening to the experts' arguments, merely nodded and gave them an additional five days for research. It was a heavenly dispensation. For the last half-century, the technobiotics of Earth had taken a completely different path. Necroevolution had been deemed unprofitable. There had been no conjecture even about any sort of eventual machine speciation, but no one could say for sure that such a thing had not taken place on Kinta. All the captain asked was, finally, was the hypothesis of conflict between Kinton builders a premise on which future decisions of the reconnaissance had to be based? But presenting the analyses that they had made, the experts did not want to speak of anything so definite as a premise. There was nothing certain in their hypothesizing. There were no facts. They knew enough now to appreciate how shaky were the initial assumptions upon which their knowledge rested. An additional misfortune was the absence, in the younger wreck too, of communication systems even slightly similar to what could be derived from the theory of finite automata and information theory. Had the viroids devoured such pseudo-nerve networks totally? Even so, traces should have remained, vestiges. Possibly they did remain, but the people were not able to recognize them. From a transistor radio or pocket calculator dropped under a steamroller, could one deduce Maxwell's theory or Shannon's? 
The final council took place in an atmosphere of unusual tension. Steergard gave up trying to elicit positive statements. He asked only if there was any evidence at all that the Kintons had mastered sidereal engineering. He considered this the most important question. If anyone guessed why the captain insisted on the point, he said nothing. So the Hermes drifted in darkness, and the men lost their way in a thicket of unknowns. The pilots, Harrick and Tempe, listened to the proceedings in silence. Nor did the doctors speak. Arago had put aside his monk's garb, and in the conversation, it somehow happened that they were sitting, the four of them, in the upper level above the control room, not once referred to his earlier words, and what if evil reigns there? When Gerbert observed that expectations always fell short of the reality, Arago disagreed. Consider, he argued, the many obstacles we had overcome, obstacles that our ancestors, even in the twentieth century, had believed insurmountable. Consider how smoothly the voyage had gone. We had crossed light years without casualties, the Eurydice had entered Hades unerringly, and we ourselves had penetrated the heart of the constellation Harpy, and only days or hours now separated us from the inhabited planet. You're giving us good therapy, father, said Gerbert, laughing. He was the only one who still addressed the Dominican that way. He had difficulty dropping the father. It's the truth, nothing more. I can't tell you what will become of us. Such ignorance is our natural state. I know what you're thinking, father, Gerbert said on impulse, that the Creator didn't wish there to be such expeditions, such meetings, such intercourse between civilizations, and therefore separated them with vast space. Yet here we have not only made a pie out of the apple of Eden— but are now sawing down the very tree of knowledge. If you want to know my thoughts, I am at your service. I believe that the Creator limited us in nothing, in nothing. Meanwhile, it is unknown what will grow from the grafts on the tree of knowledge. The pilots did not hear the rest of the theological discussion, because the captain summoned them. He had set course for Kenta. After presenting the navigational trajectory, he added, There's an attitude on board I hadn't expected. Imaginations are running a little wild. As you know, there's constant talk about enigmatic conflicts, micro-weapons, nano-ballistics, war. This is, I think, the ballast of preconceptions. If we start trembling from the dissection of a couple of wrecked satellites— we soon won't be able to function. Every move we make will seem insanely reckless. I said this to the scientists, and I'm telling you, too. And now, full speed ahead. To Septima, you can use Deus to hold the course. Then I want you at the wheel. Set up the ships between you any way you like. The ship's drive went on, and gravity, though weak, returned. Harrick went with Tempe to get the old science fiction book taken from the Eurydice. When they parted at the cabin door, Harrick, much taller, leaned over as if to divulge a secret and said, Tur Horeb knew who he was putting on the Hermes. Did you ever see better men? Maybe once. Not better. Men like himself. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook, so please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Fiasco Written by Stanislav Lem And narrated by Oliver Wyman
Chapter 8 The Moon The planet was encircled by a ring of ice chunks in an enormous but unstable sheet. The calculations made by Field and Lobianco immediately before the plunge of the Eurydice turned out to be correct. Having one large and three lesser divisions due to perturbation caused by Kinta's moon, the ring could last no more than a thousand years, since it increased its diameter while at the same time losing mass. The outer rim was widened by centrifugal forces. The inner, from atmospheric friction, turned into melting fragments and vapor so that a portion of the water thrown into space, by methods unknown, returned to the planet in a never-ending rain. It was hard to believe that the Kentons had intentionally provided themselves with a downpour worthy of the flood. The ring had initially contained three to four trillion tons of ice. Each year, it lost many billions. In this lay a series of mysteries. The ring interfered with the climate of the entire planet. Besides the heavy rains, its mighty shadow fell across, during the planet's revolution around the sun, now the northern, now the southern hemisphere. The ring obstructed, reflected away the light of the sun, not only lowering the average temperature, but also disturbing the circulation of trade winds in the atmosphere. The border regions on both sides of the shadow seethed with storms and cyclones. If the inhabitants lowered the level of the oceans, surely they possessed sufficient power to give the upward water, a waterfall in reverse, double the speed, thereby sending the masses of ice beyond the vicinity of the globe so that they would either melt and evaporate in the sun without a trace, or, in the form of ice meteors, vanish among the asteroids. With insufficient power, the planners would not have attempted the job in the first place, knowing that it would be bungled. Predicting the collapse was a simple, elementary task. It was not an error in planetary engineering, therefore, but something else that halted the work begun many years before. This conclusion seemed inescapable. The ring, a flat disk with a hole that had a diameter of 15,000 kilometers, inside which spun the girdled planet, was made up of hunks of ice in the middle belts, but of polarized crystals of ice on the outer edges. And that, too, must have been by design. In a word, the ring was controlled in motion and shape from the very beginning. It was guided into the plane of the equator, that being stationary. But on the inside, above the equator, it became chaotic and formless. Altogether it looked like a space structure half completed and abandoned. Why? From the oceans rose two large continents and one smaller, the smaller was about three times the area of Australia. Since it lay at the northern polar circle, the crew called it Australia. The infrascope discovered warmer areas on the continents, but non-seismic. Perhaps these were the thermal wastes of great power plants. They were not stations that used mined materials like oil or coal, nor did they use fuels of the nuclear type. The former would have betrayed themselves with air pollution, the latter with radioactive ash. Earth, in the early phase of atomic energy production, had had no small problem with the safe removal of such ash. But for engineers able to throw a part of the ocean up out of the gravitational sink, ejecting radio wastes would have been child's play. Yet the ice of the ring showed no trace of radioactivity. Either the Kintons had developed another form of nuclear energetics, or else they had a totally different energetics. But what kind? In the wake of the planet stretched a tail of gas, abundant in water vapor that came mainly from the ring. The Hermes, hanging in stationary orbit behind Sexta, a planet like Mars, but larger, with a dense atmosphere poisoned by continual volcanic exhalations and compounds of cyanide, sent out six probes to observe Kinta. These beamed back data continuously. 
From the data, Deus composed a detailed picture of the planet. The most curious thing was the radio noise. At least several hundred powerful transmitters operated on the large land masses with no apparent phase or frequency modulation. Their emission was chaotic white noise. The antennas could be precisely located. They were directional or isotropic, as if the Kentons had decided to jam all channels of electromagnetic communication from the shortest wavelengths to those of a kilometer. They could communicate only by lines, wires, cables. But what was the purpose of the noise which took gigawatts to produce? Even more curious, the curiosities of the planet multiplied with observation, were the artificial satellites. They numbered almost a million in high and low orbits, some of which were nearly circular and some elliptical, with aphelions reaching far beyond the moon. The probes of the Hermes also noted satellites in their own vicinity, and a few were eight to ten million kilometers out. The satellites differed considerably in size and mass. The largest were probably empty, unguided space balloons. Some had collapsed when their gas escaped. Every few days, one of these lifeless satellites collided with the ring of ice, creating an impressive sight, with lightning flashes every color of the rainbow, since the sun's rays were diffracted in the resultant cloud of ice crystals. Such a cloud dispersed slowly in space. On the other hand, the active satellites, active in that they moved in determined orbits that required constant course corrections and changed shape in an incomprehensible way, like enormous rolls of metal foil, never collided with Kenta's ring. The three-dimensional map of the satellites, holographically made, at first glance resembled a giant swarm of bees, hornets, and microscopic flies circling the planet. But this many-layered throng was not randomly distributed. One immediately saw basic patterns in it. The satellites in the near orbits frequently traveled in groups of two or three, and the others, particularly in the stationary region, where each body was synchronous with the surface of the globe, moved toward and away from the sun as in the figures of a dance. As the locational measurements came pouring in, Deus made a system of coordinates, a kind of composite of spherical graphs. Distinguishing the dead satellites from the live, or those drifting passively from those controlled or self-controlled, was an extremely difficult task. In the equation were many microscopic masses, all moving in the field of gravity of the large masses of Kinta and Kinta's moon and sun. Then the picture was sharpened, revealing a myriad of rocket and satellite remains. These frequently fell sunward. Some had the shape of toroids, doughnuts, from which jutted thread-like spikes. The largest, halfway between the planet and its moon, showed some activity. The spikes were dipolar antennas, and their emission, filtered out from the background noise of the planet, could be isolated as noise in the shortest ultra-radio wavelengths. A part of this noise dropped to hard Rentgen radiation, which did not reach the surface of Kinta because the atmosphere absorbed it. Each day, Deus added to the information acquired. Nakamura, Palasser, Roman, and Stiergard racked their brains over this riddle composed of riddles. But the pilots did not enter into the scientific debates. They had formed their own opinion. In a nutshell, that Kinta was a planet of engineers afflicted with some mania, or that, more bluntly, Seti had invested billions and lifted mountains in order to find a civilization gone berserk, but the pilots, too, sensed method in this madness. What came to mind was an image of radio warfare taken to the point of absurdity, where no one any longer transmitted anything because each side drowned out the other. The physicists tried to assist Deus with hypotheses alien to humanity. 
Perhaps the inhabitants of Kinta differed anatomically and physiologically from us in so fundamental a way that pictures and speech were replaced, for them, by other non-acoustic, non-visual senses or codes. Tactile? Olfactory? A perception connected with gravity? And perhaps the noise was a transmission of energy and not of information. Perhaps the information was sent in wave-carrying fluxes not detectable by astrophysics. Perhaps, instead of continuing to filter in every possible way this seemingly senseless electromagnetic roar, one should overhaul completely the whole analytical program. Deus replied with its customary dryness and patience, knowing much about human emotions, it experienced none itself. If the noise is a transmission of energy, there must exist receiving stations, which must let escape a certain minimum amount, a loss, for hundred percent efficiency is impossible. But on the planet there are no receiving devices to be seen that are proportional to the power broadcast. Part of the power, able to pass through the atmosphere, is aimed at many of the orbiters, but other transmitters and other orbiters jam this directed radiation and do so completely. It is as if a great crowd of people wishes to converse, but they all speak at once, raising their voices more and more. Even if each of the speakers has great wisdom, the resultant is a choral howl. Second, if certain bands are used for communication, they can appear as white noise if the channels of transmission are totally filled but the Kenton noise possesses a curious quality. It is not absolute chaos. Rather, it is the product of opposing emissions. Each transmitter holds exactly to a wavelength. Other transmitters either jam the first or dampen it by reversing the amplitude in phase. Deus illustrated for them this electromagnetic state of affairs by shifting the radio spectra to the visible zone. The white, tranquil face of the planet was replaced by a scene of multicolored vibrations. When Deus made the coherent emitters green, their transmitters white, and the counter-emitters purple, Kinta became a variegated ball of contending hues. Spreading purple engulfed the relays, reddening their white, and at the same time green flooded in. A blurring spider web of color ensued. At times, one color would peak, then immediately fade away. Meanwhile, data were coming in from the probes that had been sent to reconnoiter Kinta's moon. Of the five, two had disappeared, it was not known how, at the Paraselenium, a point not visible from the Hermes. Steergard reprimanded Harrick for this carelessness. Harrick had neglected to send a reserve behind the patrol, which would have made constant monitoring of it possible even on the other side of the moon. Three probes, however, had flown around the planet's satellite. Unable to break through the thicket of noise with a signal, they transmitted the pictures they had taken using a coated laser. At first the information was so crowded that a single impulse in a nanosecond contained a thousand bits— after less than a minute of this emission, Deus announced that from the Apocelenium three Kinton orbiters, unnoticed until now because they were so small, were approaching the probes. Deus discovered them from the heat their engines gave off in starting and by their acceleration, according to the Doppler effect. Nothing indicated that an order to intercept the patrol had been issued from the planet. There really would not have been time for that. The heated points now moved on a collision course. The captain ordered evasive action. The three-membered patrol then threw off its dummy exteriors, jettisoning before it a great quantity of metal foil and balloons, which had not fooled the interceptors. The patrol expelled a mist of sodium and shot oxygen into it, creating a fireball. The moment the Kenton rockets disappeared in it, the probes emerged from the burning cloud in a spiral and, instead of making for the ship, crashed into each other head-on and were thus atomized. 
Steergard pulled in all the observational probes from their orbiting positions, and Deus played back the results of the reconnaissance. On the opposite hemisphere of the moon, barren and plowed with craters, a small flame possessing the spectrum of nuclear plasma went back and forth, so rapidly that if the necessary concentrated magnetic field had not been holding it in rain, the thing would have flown off into space and been instantly extinguished. What was it that traveled back and forth there between two ancient craters at a velocity of sixty kilometers per second? What was this Ignis Fatus? Deus assured them that the planet had not discovered the Hermes' presence, and therefore was not tracking it. There was no indication of tracking. Using Sexta's atmosphere as a lens for the radioscopes, Deus had recorded the constant noise, the crackling that could be heard over it, which was caused by satellites striking the shield of ice. There was a difference of opinion about what to do next, the men did not want to announce their arrival to the Kintons. The camouflage must remain in place until they figured out at least one of the multitude of mysteries. They debated whether to send an unmanned lander to the far side of the moon or to take the ship itself there. About the odds of success for either alternative, Deus knew as much as the crew. Nothing. The auscultation performed by the patrol suggested that the moon was inhabited. It did have an atmosphere. Though one and a half times as massive as Earth's moon, it was unable to hold it. And the atmosphere's composition presented still another puzzle. Noble gases, argon, krypton, and xenon, with a trace of helium. Without an artificial source to replenish it, the atmosphere would have escaped in the course of a few hundred years. Even clearer evidence of engineering was the plasma flame. But the moon was silent. It also did not have a magnetic field. Steergard decided to land with the ship. If any beings were there, they would be underground, far below the rocky crust riddled with craters and calderas. The frozen seas of lava gleamed in a circle of streaks radiating like meridian lines from the largest crater. They would land, but first turn the Hermes into a comet. Out of valves in the hull that opened along the sides came a foam from tanks. Inflated by injections of gas, the foam surrounded the entire vessel with a large cocoon of irregular, hardened bubbles. The Hermes, like a pit in a fruit, lay in a spongy mass of globules. Even from up close it looked like an elongated chunk of rock covered with craters. The burst bubbles made the surface resemble the crust of an asteroid bombarded for centuries by dust clouds and meteors. The drive, indispensable, would be the tail of the comet, which, as it approached the perihelion, would always be directed away from the sun— an illusion created by the drive deflectors. A precise spectral analysis would have revealed, of course, a pulse and composition of gases not found in any comet, but nothing could be done about that. The Hermes moved with hyperbolic velocity from Sexta to the orbit of Kinta. Such high-speed comets did exist, though they were rare, coming from outside the solar system. After two weeks of flight, it braked behind the moon and sent out manipulators with television eyes. The illusion of an old, battered rock was perfect. Only under a hard blow would the fake stone give elastically, like a balloon. The landing itself could not be disguised. As the ship entered the moon's atmosphere, stern first, her fire burned away the covering over the nozzles. The rest was done by atmospheric friction. The red-hot camouflage was torn away, and the naked metal colossus, bearing down on the flames beneath it, settled on six outspread legs, testing the strength of the ground first with a series of fired shells. For a while, pieces of the burned covering rained around the ship. When this stopped, the men examined their surroundings from horizon to horizon. 
They were separated from the plasma pendulum by the bulging ridge of a large crater. At the prevailing pressure of 400 hectopascals, one could use copters for reconnaissance by air. Overt reconnaissance. Thus began a game with rules as yet unknown, though the stake was known. The copters, sent in a group of eight over a thousand-mile circle, went unmolested. From their pictures, a map was made encompassing an area of 8,000 square kilometers around the point of touchdown. It was the map of a typical airless globe with a random distribution of craters half filled with volcanic tuff, except in the northeast, where magnetostats were perpetuating a moving sphere of fire. The sphere sped above the rocky ground, which had been melted along its path into a hot, shallow canyon. The copters re-entered this region and took measurements and spectral analyses both in the air and upon landing. One of them intentionally approached the sphere. Before it was consumed, it recorded the sphere's exact temperature and radiant power on the order of a trillion joules. The sphere was fed and guided by an alternating magnetic field that reached ten to the tenth power Gauss. Steergard, taking soundings of the substratum of the canyon, had Deus make a diagram of the network discovered there, which had junctions and numerous vertical shafts that went deep into the lithosphere. He did not appear surprised by this. The purpose of the giant installation was unclear. There was no doubt, however, that the work had been abandoned while in full swing. All the entrances leading to galleries and shafts had been closed off, or rather, buried with explosive charges, the heavy machinery having first been thrown deep into the tunnels and wells. The plasma microsun was fed by thermoelectric transformers through a system of magnetoconduits that drew energy from the depths of the asthenosphere, about fifty kilometers beneath the outer mantle of the lunar crust. Although he did send heavy, all-terrain striders into that area to gather additional data and waited impatiently for their return, he gave orders for a prompt takeoff. The physicists, fascinated with the sublunar energy complex, would have been glad to stay longer and perhaps even to open up the stopped tunnels. Steergard refused. The captured satellites were incomprehensible. The construction begun in this desolate place with such vigor was incomprehensible. And even more incomprehensible, if incomprehensibility had degrees, was the abandonment of that work as if in the panic of an evacuation. He did not say this to them. The thought that occurred to him, he kept to himself. Any detailed study of an alien technology was futile. Its fragments, like pieces of a broken mirror, would not yield a coherent picture. They were the indistinct result only of the thing that had shattered it. The answer lay not in the tools of the civilization, but in the civilization itself. Thinking this, he felt the full weight of the task entrusted to him. Over the intercom, Arago asked if he could see him. Yes, but make it quick. We take off in less than an hour, he said, not delighted about the visit. Arago appeared immediately. I hope I'm not in your way. You are, Reverend Father, in my way. Steergard did not rise, pointing to a chair. However, in view of the nature of our mission, I'm at your service. I have no special authorization, and am no ambassador extraordinary. I was assigned my place, as you were yours, the Dominican quietly replied, with one difference. On my decisions, nothing hinges. On yours, everything hinges. I know that. The inhabitants of this planet are like a living organism. One may study it as much as one likes, but one cannot ask it the sense of its existence. A jellyfish wouldn't answer, but a man? Steergard looked at him intently now, as if expecting something important. 
A man, yes, but not mankind. Jellyfish are not answerable, but each one of us is for what we do. I see what you're driving at. The Reverend Father wants to know what course of action I've decided to take. Yes. We are coming out in the open. Asking to talk? Yes. And if they cannot meet this request? Steerguard rose, disturbed. Arago had penetrated to what he was concealing. Standing so close to the monk that he practically touched his knees, he asked softly, What else can we do? Arago got up, straightened, reached for the man's right hand, and clasped it. It's in good hands, he said, and left. Chapter 9 An Annunciation The captain put the ship, again enveloped in its mask, into stationary orbit around the moon, above the hemisphere not visible from Kinta, and one by one called in his comrades to ask them how they assessed the situation and what they would do in his place. The difference in the conjectures was tremendous. Nakamura espoused the cosmic hypothesis. The level of Kenton technology bespoke the existence of a fully developed astronomy for many years. Zeta and its planets were traveling through an interarm expansion of the galactic spiral, and in some five thousand years would come perilously close to Hades. It was not possible to determine the critical passage exactly because of the insoluble problem of the mutual interaction of many masses. But any non-catastrophic passage past the Collapsar had low probability. Thus the threatened civilization was attempting to save itself. Various projects had been undertaken. For example, resettling on the moon, turning it into a navigable planet, and moving to the system of Eta Harpii, which was a mere four light years away, and, more to the point, was heading in the opposite direction from the Collapsar. During the initial phase of the implementation of this project, the resources of energy and knowledge might turn out to be insufficient. It is also possible that one part of the civilization, one block of nations, was in favor of the project while another opposed it. It was well known that experts in different fields rarely reached full agreement in the face of a particularly complex and difficult problem. Another project might be emigration or astronautical flight. This idea would precipitate a crisis. The population of Kenta would surely number in the billions, and there would not be shipyards enough to build a fleet able to carry out an exodus of everyone from the planetary cradle. To use a terrestrial analogy, the individual countries would differ considerably in industrial potential. Those in the vanguard would build a space fleet for themselves and at the same time abandon the lunar operations. Perhaps the ones who labored in the shipyards, believing that the rescue vessels were not destined for them, resorted to acts of sabotage. Perhaps this gave rise to repression, rioting, anarchy, and a radio war of propaganda. And so this project, too, would be halted in its preliminary stage, and the multitude of satellites wandering the system would constitute its aborted remains. Although Nakamura's assessment of the situation was extremely hypothetical, it was not without value. Therefore, he urged, it was necessary to establish communication with Kinta quickly. Sidereal engineering, shown to its inhabitants, might save them. Palasser, acquainted with the Japanese's idea, felt that the facts had been twisted and stretched to support the thesis of planetary emigration. Sidereal engineering did not manifest itself like a bolt from the blue— the power tapped from the asthenospheric installation on the moon was three orders of magnitude removed from the power that made possible gravitology and its industrial application. Moreover, there was nothing to indicate that the Kintons would consider the Eta system hospitable to them. 
In a few million years, Eta would be entering the stage of the final consumption of its hydrogen, thereby becoming a red giant. And finally, Nakamura had shuffled the data concerning the motion of the entire harpy and of the Hades within the interval of gravitational indeterminacy to make the critical passage of Zeta through the vicinity of the Collapsar probable in as little as fifty centuries. If one took into account the perturbations caused by the spiral arm of the galaxy, the passage would be delayed to more than twenty thousand years. The knowledge that things would be awful in two hundred fifty centuries could cause panic only in demented beings. A science in its infancy, such as Earth's in the nineteenth century, might consider progress to be near its end. A more mature science, while not knowing the discoveries of the future, would know that these would increase at an exponential rate, and that in the next couple of years considerably more knowledge would be obtained than had been gained in the previous millennia. Even though we did not know what was taking place on Kinta, we should establish contact with the planet. It was risky, yes, but necessary. Kirsting believed that anything was possible, and advanced technology did not rule out religious faiths. The pyramids of the Egyptians and of the Aztecs revealed their purpose to visitors from other worlds no more than did Gothic cathedrals. What was discovered on the moon might be the work of some religion, sun worship of an artificial sun, an altar of nuclear plasma, an idol. A symbol of power or mastery over matter, but you could also have schisms, apostasies, heresies, crusades, crusades not by sword but by radio, electromagnetic offensives to convert the heathen or the heathen's informational sacred machines, Deus est in machina. Not that this was provable or even probable. The symbols of a faith, like the creations of any ideology, did not betray their meaning to a stranger from another land. But physics did not obviate metaphysics. Trying to find a commonality of intention in the peoples of different terrestrial cultures and epochs, one knew at least that material welfare was nowhere considered to be the all in all. The answer to existence. Such a belief would be the exception. Technology did not have to part company with the holy; it always possessed a goal beyond itself. And when the holy disappeared, something had to fill that vacancy in the culture. Kirsting took the marriage of engineering and religion to such mystical heights that Stierg.